Hive Queen, Trinity of the Hive, Book Two, written by Grayson Sinclair, narrated by Neil Helligers. From where you're kneeling, it must seem like an 18-carat run of bad luck. Truth is, the game was rigged from the start. Benny. Chapter One. The Cracks Appear. Samson. The dead woman in front of me wore a light smirk as I tried and failed to rationalize her resurrection. She was dead, had been dead for centuries, yet here she was, standing in the darkened throne room of the man I considered my enemy. What the hell is going on? My mind ran through all the possible explanations and came up empty. She walked over to Magnus, her black dress swaying at her ankles. The cracks of her footsteps on the gray stone tile shattered my nerves and sent abject fear coursing through my veins. How are you still alive? I stammered. She refused an answer. Instead, she kept her chilling gaze on me as she climbed the obsidian steps, mischievousness sparking from her insectoid eyes, black and yellow like the stripes on a bee. She stood next to Magnus and draped her arm onto his shoulder. Magnus brushed her fingers affectionately and only then did she acknowledge me with an ice-cold smile poised on her pink Cupid's bow lips. Silence hung in the air as the moonlight cast colorful shadows across the floor from the stained glass windows above us. I just stared them down until Magnus spoke. Illyria, do you plan on enlightening the boy? Illyria, so that's her name. But before the words even left her lips, I knew her answer. Her eyes told me she had no intention of illuminating me. She smiled sweetly at me. Why would I do that? His utter confusion is so delicious. Magnus chuckled softly while I stared dumbstruck at the dead woman. Well, Durin, it's not exactly my story to tell. So if it's her wish to keep you in the dark, I shall respect it. Yeah, great. Sure, it's not that big of a deal, I said, my voice biting. Sarcasm was my go-to defense, as if I didn't make light of the situation, I'd likely run screaming from the room. Illyria was alive. Even though I watched her die in the Nemesini, she was standing before me, allied with Magnus, the man who'd brought an army to my home. Can someone explain what's going on? Please? He stayed silent a bemused grin lifting the corners of his tanned mouth as he watched my meltdown. His shamrock eyes lit the darkness. You weren't brought here to listen to a story you haven't earned the right to. You were brought here because I wanted to meet the man who has my daughter so enraptured. Illyria rose and crossed the room toward me. Her gait was playful and predatory. She was a tiger toying with her meal before she devoured it, and I was the meal. Despite her devious visage, she was an undeniably beautiful creature, though the resemblance to Eris was enough that it made my heart ache. Her golden hair was much longer than her daughter's and fell past her shoulder blades, though lighter in color and much finer. Her hair wasn't the only separating distinction. Eris would never have such cold and callous eyes. Hers were enchanting, while her mother's terrified me. I'd compared them to a bumblebee's stripes, but that was naive of me. The woman in front of me was no playful bee. She was a wasp, angry and mean, and wouldn't hesitate to fuck up my day. Illyria stopped a foot from me, gazing at me as if she were staring through my very soul. She stood a few inches short of me, which put her almost a foot taller than Eris. Caution, knight. This queen is dangerous. Before I could respond to the aspect, Illyria reached out and laid a finger on my chest, right over my heart. The pain was so sudden it caught my breath and floored me. I dropped to the floor as torment crawled through my veins and ice stabbed through my brain. The duality of magics flowing through me turned to magma in my veins. I fought for a single breath just so I could scream. Then she removed her hand from me, and the pain vanished as swiftly as it arrived. I gasped for air and rejoiced in the pure bliss of the act. My sweat-stained copper hair fell in my face as blood dripped from my torn lip. I'd accidentally bitten it, and salted iron ran over my tongue. 
the cool stone against my bare fingers grounded me in the moment. I worked to get myself under control and stumbled up from the floor, glaring murder at Illyria. What in the nine hells was that? She narrowed her eyes and furrowed her brow, humming to herself under her breath in a low, guttural tone. I was deathly afraid of her, but it wasn't just my personal fear. The aspect recoiled from her presence and retreated to the confines of my heart, leaving me alone in a den of wolves. Illyria spoke, smiling. Such a waste of a night. Abominations like you should never be allowed to exist, she said. Her voice held delight as she savored each word levied at me. What? I took a step forward, wanting, needing to understand what she'd said. Tell me what that means. I don't think so. Not yet. Illyria laughed and turned from me, walking back to Magnus. I didn't let her take another step before I took one of my own and clamped my hand on her shoulder. Her sleek black dress balled in my fist as I turned her around to face me. A flash of annoyance marred her face before being replaced by quiet amusement. Can I help you, Knight? Her voice sweet, a bastardization of Eris's. Answer me. Her eyes flashed at my outburst, filling with excitement. She moved closer to me, her breath heated as her tongue rolled out, giving me a quick look at her dual sets of elongated canines. Illyria licked her lips with anticipation, and she looked hungry. If you wanted to play, you should have just said so. She pinned my arms to my sides with enough force that I couldn't attempt to break free, even with my strength maxed. I could do nothing as she opened her mouth far too wide and latched onto my neck. Her teeth ripped a chunk from my flesh as she gorged on my blood. Her saliva mixed with my blood and numbed my skin as she fed. Her tongue lapped up every spilled drop that fled from my body. I fought against her and tried to pry myself free, but it was pointless. I wasn't going anywhere. I succumbed to the inevitable and let her drink her fill. Magnus watched the scene with fierce interest, leaning forward in his throne with his chin propped under his arms. My voice broke and wheezed as I attempted to speak, so I asked him with my eyes to intervene, but he just continued staring. My vision grew hazy, and fog filled my thoughts as the blood loss took hold. My skin tingled, and by the time she'd finished, I was barely conscious. Illyria released me, and I slumped to the ground, the stone cold against my feverish cheek. I attempted to stand, but I was weak. Through sheer force of will and indignation, I rose to my feet. I clenched my teeth, splitting my torn lip even wider as I bared my teeth in rage. She has no right to my blood, to my memories. Magnus frowned at Illyria, a reproachful gaze, which she shrugged off. I knew that she would go unpunished for her vile intrusion, and fire roiled in my chest. Let's see how you like it. Show me what you refuse to tell. I initiated Dance of the Immortal, and the world slowed to a standstill. Magnus sat on his throne, staring at Illyria as she froze mid-step, her foot an inch from the floor. I raced for her, my teeth bared to sink into her ivory skin. The snap of fingers stopped me in my tracks. The hell? I couldn't move my body from the neck down. I turned back to the throne. Magnus was no longer staring at Illyria, he was looking dead at me. He smiled at me and rose from his throne, taking his time down the steps. Before he landed on the final step, he held his hand aloft, and from nowhere an ivory cane appeared in his hands as he stepped off the last Stygian step. I'd seen the cane before, it was the same one Liam wielded when we fought. Dance of the Immortal. A neat parlor trick, he said as he reached me. Magnus leaned against his cane, his eyes flicking up and down, taking me in. He held up his left arm and tapped a phantom wristwatch. Five, four, three, two, one. He counted down the seconds till Dance timed out, but as he reached one, Dance of the Immortal stayed active. He let his arm fall and tilted his head back to me. I understand your anger, Durin. I do. Illyria was out of line, and that's my fault. I let her have her way far too often. Still, you are a guest in my castle, and it was incredibly rude for her to behave that way. So I'm going to overlook your attempt to harm her 
though I strongly caution you not to try it again, if I were you. With a nod, the paralysis on my body vanished and I could move again, though the world was still awash with gray. How is this possible? Dent should have timed long ago. How are you doing this? He shrugged and turned, walking back to his throne, the dark mantling of his cloak slapping against his emerald tunic. As he sat back down, he snapped his fingers and dance shattered. My battle fatigue rose to nearly max, and exhaustion sunk into my muscles, robbing my already fading strength. I sank to my knee as sweat ran in rivulets down my forehead, dripping into my eyes. Valeria glanced back at me with delight in her eyes. I guess you were about to try something foolish. He was, though you deserve a bit of foolishness. Try to refrain from harming our guest going forward. Agnes glanced down at me, nearly collapsed from blood loss and fatigue. Ah, let me ease your discomfort. Another snap, and my exhaustion vanished in an instant. Strength returned to my limbs and my battle fatigue dropped to zero. I was back in perfect condition and I had no idea how it was possible. There, good as new, Magnus said with a wry grin. Now that our little drama has ended, I'd like to invite you to dinner. It's midnight. I'll see you in an hour then. Without another word, he stood and strolled out of the throne room, Illyria nipping at his heels. As the door to the throne room opened, the maid who led me here was waiting patiently outside the door her russet hair covering the side of her face. Illyria looked at me with a dark grin. If you need anything before dinner, just ask Jasmine. She's programmed to receive. Then she was gone, and I was left standing in the hallway of a strange place, and my only company was a maid. Yeah, that's about par for the course with my life lately. Follow me. Jasmine escorted me back through the maze of identical hallways to my room, and even I had to admit it was the nicest prison cell I'd ever been in. Expensive wooden furniture and a bed big enough to fit half a dozen full-grown men. Magnus hasn't said it, hasn't even come close to saying it, but I'm a prisoner here. I was held here against my will, by his mere presence, for I could do little else. I walked over to the bed and sat down, sinking deep into its luxurious softness. The dark comforter was like lying on a cloud, and I hated it. The bed was far too comfortable. I'll never be able to get any sleep on it. But it was only half because of the bed. Gods, I miss Eris. We didn't get to spend hardly any time together on the road, and now this seems like months since I've seen her. Out of habit, I checked our connection. She's sound asleep, dreaming deeply. It wasn't much, but the fact she was safe and sleeping comfortably was a huge relief. Muscles I didn't even know were tense uncoiled themselves, and relief eased my troubled mind. Now that my guard was lowered, I took note of my body, namely my stomach. It screamed in protest, probably thinking my throat had been cut. I tried to put my hunger out of mind and went to wash up. The only other door in the room led to a bathroom, and I just stared in amazement. If I thought the bathroom I'd built was large before, I'll need to reevaluate. To call it a bath was laughable, as it was the size of a swimming pool and sank deep into the floor. Whereas my bathroom was all stone, Magnus had a flair for the ostentatious, floor-to-ceiling wood, vibrant hues of chestnut through mahogany. The warm air hit me as I stepped through the door. Magnus knows how to impress, I'll give him that. The steam rising off the water in the bath was tantalizing, too much for me to resist. Even if I was clean, the hot water would help ease my apprehension. I stripped out of my extravagant clothes, tossed them aside, and walked down the steps to bask in the heat that licked my skin with the perfect amount of warmth. I'm surprised Magnus had the foresight to set the temperature ahead of time, but with Illyria around, he's probably well-versed in entomancer body heat. Shit. Eris isn't going to take the news of her mother being alive very well. From what she told me, Eris and her mother hadn't had the easiest relationship. Her family had caused so much pain in her life, but never again. She's a threat, and I don't care that she's Eris's mother. I'll kill Illyria if it means protecting Eris. Assuming I 
even Ken. I waded through the chest-high water to reach a shelf on the far wall. It was laden down with all manners of soaps and wash rags. I picked one at random and set about scrubbing myself clean. I ran soap through my hair and looked around for a brush to help detangle a few knots that had accrued. I searched in vain. My brush is with the rest of my supplies back at Gloom Harbor. I'm defenseless here. Well, almost. Even if I didn't have my gear, I still had my class abilities. I pulled up my character page. Character name, Durandal. Level 51. EXP 4100 out of 5100. Race, hybrid, hive. Class, hive knight. Reputation, wanted criminal. Bounty, 1300 gold. Stats. Strength, 100. 80 with penalty. Substats. Attack damage, 30. Constitution, 100. 80 with penalty. Substats. Health, 25. Health regen, 25. Durability, 15. Endurance, 75, 50 with penalty, substats, battle fatigue, 10, battle fatigue, regen, 10. Agility, 50, 30 with penalty, substats, attack speed, 15, movement speed, 10. Wisdom, 25, 5 with penalty, substats, mana, 20. Luck, 0, 10 with bonus, charisma, 0, 0. Proximity to Hive Queen, greater than 100 meters, penalty active, negative 20 to all main stats. No wonder I was so weak against Illyria. I forgot about the penalty when I'm not close by Eris. Damn, this puts me at a heavy disadvantage. Though none of my substats were affected. That's some good news. The soap suds in my hair slid down my face and stung my eyes. I dunked my head under the water and rinsed them from my strands. When I came back up from the water and brushed my sopping hair from my face, I wasn't alone in the bath any longer. Jasmine had slunk into the room without my notice, betraying either her level of talent or my ability to be completely oblivious to my surroundings. I was betting on the former. She stood at around my chin, which would put her at around an inch or two over five and a half feet. Her auburn hair stopped just below her chin, barely looking at her throat. She stared at me with large honey-brown eyes that darkened in the steam. And to top it all off, she was naked as the day she was born. Her body was slender, yet toned, her rich, tawny skin complex. Pale hues of brown beaded with sweat as steam drifted past. Her breasts were larger than average and ever so slightly uneven. Her dark nipples stiffened, despite the heat. I dropped my gaze quickly, only to see a neatly trimmed patch of brown hair just below her waist. She stood under my gaze with calm indifference, as if she didn't care that she was bearing herself to a complete stranger and lowered into the bath. Jasmine, what do you think you're doing? Her voice was soft and warm, yet robotic. I was ordered to tend to your every want and desire, as commanded by Mistress Illyria. Did she tell you to undress herself? Of course. I sighed. I should have figured she'd try something like this, testing the new boyfriend, as it were. I backed away from the young woman, as pretty as she was. She was nothing to me, and she didn't even register. Well, please dress yourself. Your services aren't required. Jasmine nodded to me and exited the bath, to my relief. My libido notwithstanding, I didn't have any desire to feed into whatever game Illyria was playing. I finished cleaning myself and dried off with the fluffiest towel I'd ever seen before tying it around my waist. I made my way over to the nightstand and withdrew several of the outfits, trying to find the one I wanted to wear. Not that my attire mattered much, but taking a few extra moments to dress properly wouldn't be the worst idea. Not when Magnus is playing gatekeeper. I chose an ivory tunic with a matching set of pants. The white soothed me. I tended to stay away from white clothing as I found myself in far too many fights for me to have any hope of keeping them clean. The white looked nice, and I reasoned I couldn't get into much trouble at dinner. As I dressed, they clung to my frame perfectly. I tied my still damp hair back and moved to open the door. Jasmine was waiting outside. Although having been in the bath with me not ten minutes ago, she was dressed immaculately in her maid uniform, not a hair out of place. She curtsied politely upon seeing me. Is there anything you require, my lord? Could you not call me lord, for starters? No, my lord. Of course she'd be difficult. I sighed, leaning against the doorframe. 
Jasmine blocked the door, preventing me from exiting without pushing past her, a prospect I considered for a brief moment before reconsidering. There was something about the young girl that unsettled me. I had a feeling there was more to her than appeared, and I might bite off more than I could chew by resorting to violence. Look how well your first attempt went. What is it with the people here? Is everyone in this damn castle a badass? Regardless of any of that, she may have just been a maid, but she was still a woman and had offered me no reason to be untoward to her. Is dinner ready yet? I asked, my stomach rumbling. Jasmine shook her head. Not just yet, my lord. However, I do believe Magnus is having a drink in the dining hall. If you'd like to join him, I can escort you. It beats standing in this doorway, twiddling my thumbs. I inclined my head to her. Be my guest. Without another word, she turned on her heels and proceeded to walk down the hallway. We walked in silence through the identical halls. I tried again to keep track, but they all looked the same. The same gray stone, even the same number of doors and torches along the walls. It was maddening. To break up the silence, I tried small talk, which I hated, but I still tried to make some attempt at conversation. How old are you, Jasmine? Eighteen. Have you been here long? All my life. Do you have any hobbies? No. Well, I tried. After that, I stopped attempting to befriend the strange girl. It seemed a pointless waste of breath, and these weren't the questions I really wanted answered. Magnus was the one I needed answers from. It took us around five minutes of walking through the twisting halls before we reached another unmarked door. How Jasmine was able to tell the doors apart from one another in a place this massive was beyond me. But if she had spent her entire life here, I guess she had ample time. She opened the door and with a bow, she bade me to enter. Thank you, Jasmine. Of course, my lord. Jasmine shut the door behind me, and I went alone to face Magnus. The dining hall was comparably muted to the rest of the extravagance in the castle. An equal mixture of dark stone and wood filled the room, stone floor and ceilings with wooden support beams along the walls that framed rows of archways. Wide open windows led in soft, cool light along with a gentle, warm breeze. From a glance as I passed by the windows, I spied the deep sand dunes of the Badlands in the distance. That puts this castle on the furthest edge of the Isle of Nexus, past the ruins of Machine City and into some truly dangerous territory. I was distracted from gazing out the window by the clink of glass on wood. I turned to find Magnus drinking alone at the head of a large banquet table. Two long rows of chairs sat unoccupied. Magnus had just finished a large drink and spoke to another one of his maid staff. It wasn't Jasmine, but it could have been her mother. She had the same skin tone and hair color, if longer, and pulled back out of her face. As I approached, Magnus stopped whatever he had been saying to the woman and acknowledged my presence. Ah, Duran, would you like a drink before dinner? Sure. He nodded. Magnolia, please uncork another bottle of wine if you don't mind, and whatever our esteemed guest would like. Of course, master. Another bottle of Surly? Please. Magnolia turned her attention from Magnus to me. Her darkened eyes were waiting. When I didn't immediately respond, she cleared her throat and spoke. And for you, my lord? Oh, uh, ale, I said. Any particular? Surprise me. Magnolia nodded and exited the dining hall, leaving us alone with each other. I just stood there in front of the table, not so sure of what to do with myself. Magnus took note of this and chuckled. Come now, Duran, I won't bite. Sit down and share a drink with me. It might surprise you to learn I don't get to do this very often. I find that hard to believe. As much power as you wield, I imagine there isn't much you couldn't do. I kept my thoughts to myself, but raised an eyebrow. A frown formed as I stared at him. He grinned wide at my expression. The tan skin of his face only brought out the sharp white of his teeth. I imagine you could get anyone you wanted to have a drink with you, I said. Magnus threw his head back and laughed. The much-needed sound broke the tension in the air. I chuckled myself. His laugh was infectious. I pulled out one of the heavy oak chairs and sat down next to him. He spoke through his laughter. <laughs> much as you might be right about that, it's rare that I have anyone other than my servants or Illyria to drink with me. Certainly not someone I could treat as an equal. I scoffed. Equals. Not hardly. He just laughed harder at my words, thumping his empty wine glass on the table in the process. 
<laughs> Dear boy, maybe not in terms of wealth or power, but those are trivial matters. You have tenacity and strength of spirit, things neither money nor power can purchase. I didn't get a chance to respond to his words as the door to the hall was thrust open. Illyria strode through, followed by Magnolia carrying our drinks. Ah, I figured I would find you here. And Durin is here too, lovely. Well, it was a nice evening while it lasted. I inclined my head to our new arrival, to which she just smiled at me, a wicked grin that showcased her prominent sets of canines. How was your bath? Illyria asked. Not as quiet as I'd liked, but I made do. What the hell is your game, Illyria? She frowned at my words. Did you not like my present? It was unnecessary. Magnolia came and poured Magnus another glass of wine, and a rich aroma spilled out of the bottle. She filled his glass to the brim, to which Magnus drank deeply. She then set down a large mug of ale in front of me. It was a perfect golden brown and had a good head to it. I took a long pull, savoring the richness on my tongue. The sweetness of the malt was accented perfectly by the hint of bitterness on the back of my tongue. It was a full-bodied drink, and it went down far too smoothly. Magnolia noted my appreciation for the booze with a hint of a smile. Would you like another, my lord? If it wouldn't be too much trouble, I told her. Magnus, who had been occupied with his wine, finished off his glass and joined the conversation. Illyria, what did you do to the poor boy? Illyria laughed at Magnus's reproachful tone. Nothing much. I just sent Jasmine to entertain our guest. Magnolia accidentally knocked over my empty glass as she attempted to pick it up. Sorry, my lord, she apologized. Don't worry about it. Magnus's humor fled as he gave Illyria a withering glare. Jasmine is far too young for such things. Morrigan's feathers, you should stop treating her like a child. She's older than I was when I was bonded, you know. And look how well that turned out. I turned to Magnolia. So that you know, I didn't lay a finger on her. My heart belongs to another. Magnolia unclenched her fingers from the mug and gave me an appreciative smile. It smoothed the lines in her forehead and under her eyes, making her look years younger. Illyria just rolled her eyes at my words. I'll never understand you humans and your desire to shackle yourself to a single person. It's unnatural, says the woman who murdered her own husband. I had my reasons. Because you enjoyed it, you sick monster. The memories of the Nemesini were vivid, and I had witnessed up close the delight and the bloodlust on Illyria's face as she brutalized her husband. He'd been a bastard, scum who treated his family like objects and bargaining chips. I'd have killed him in a heartbeat and slept soundly, but I wouldn't have enjoyed his death. I wouldn't have reveled in it as she had. I slammed my fist down on the table. Bullshit. I saw what you did to him. You took pleasure in killing him. You ripped him to pieces. Illyria's eyes widened. For the first time since I'd met her, she looked shocked. Something had surprised her. Her surprise twisted into a black grin. The yellow of her eyes lit up with dark delight. She relaxed her shoulders and glided towards me, and she moved to pull out the chair next to Magnus and me. Well, well, well. Someone has been a naughty boy. Your memories didn't show me that. If you've experienced that particular memory, that means you've tasted of my little heiress. Tisk, tisk. Shame and heat flushed through my face. I couldn't deny it. I had drunk of heiress, had tasted of her flesh and blood. The mere memory of it sent waves of revulsion through me. I'd scarred her even if I'd never meant to hurt her. The heat of my face was plain as day. Illyria laughed at my reaction. Oh, wipe that look off your face. I'm not judging you, it's quite all right. It's natural for entomancers to partake of our bonded. I wanted to say something, but she'd left me with nothing to say. She didn't seem to care about the fact I'd drunk her daughter's blood. She just wanted to watch me squirm. She hasn't even mentioned Eris except as a jab at me hasn't once asked after her daughter's well-being. She's one cold bitch. My retort to her was put on hold as Magnolia entered back into the dining hall, carrying a tray laden down with drinks. 
Magnolia wasn't alone, as several more men and women swept into the room. From the style of dress, I assumed it was the cook and their staff. They brought carts, heaped with platters of food. Almost every kind of food I could have imagined wheeled out. Plates piled high with chicken, fish, roasted pig, and steaks, along with steamed vegetables and potatoes, several soups and salads, as well as a tray of different loaves of bread and jars of butter. It was an extravagant feast, and the sound my stomach made was audible to the whole of the hall. They arranged the carts in front of us, and the staff served us a little bit of everything. I was eyeing the boar steak like a thief eyes a noble's purse, but I held back from snatching of the food like a savage. I could wait a few moments more and dine like a gentleman. Magnolia set down another ale in front of me. As she placed it on the table, she leaned down and, so quiet I almost missed it, whispered, Thank you. Then she stood up as if nothing had happened and continued to serve our table their drinks. Magnus gleefully accepted more wine. From the slight flush of his cheeks, I'd say he was tipsy. Magnolia set down the decanter, filled with the strange liquid next to Illyria, who was looking at the container with anticipation. My curiosity got the better of me, and I had to ask, What is that? Illyria licked her lips, her long tongue dancing across her teeth. She picked up the decanter and poured a generous measure of the drink into a wine glass next to her and brought the glass to her lips, taking a long drink, before looking at me and answering my question. It's blood wine. Would you like some? Too strong for my taste. I prefer hard liquor. Hmm, you don't know what you're missing. Or perhaps you've just developed a taste for my daughter's blood instead, is that it? Her words sent rage and disgust rolling through me. In the back of my mind, I knew she was just goading me, looking to get a rise out of me. But I couldn't take the callous disregard of Eris any longer. I bolted out of my chair to jab my finger at Illyria. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Agnes looked up from the bottom of his wine glass at the hostility in the room. He didn't look upset. Instead, he wore a grin on his face and spoke up as Magnolia poured him yet another glass of wine. Now look what you've done, Illyria. Did you have to provoke him like that? Illyria smiled wide. Of course I did. He's bonded to my daughter, after all. I must see what the little abomination is made of. Magnus nodded his head and returned to his drinking with a murmur. Well, I won't interfere with a family dispute. Just don't make me break up a fight. Before his words, I'd been ready to stab Illyria, and my hand gripped the handle of my steak knife so tight my knuckles stretched white over the skin. Calm yourself. This is what she wants, and besides that, I can't take both of them, maybe not even one of them, not to mention my lack of weapons. This isn't the time to lose control. I brought the calm and collected logic to soothe the coals of my rage. While not dousing them completely, my rage had subsided into mere embers rather than the raging inferno. I turned to Illyria. That's the second time you've called me that. I'll bite. Why am I an abomination? Illyria cocked her head to the side, a gesture so like Eris it hurt. She reached out with her hand and pointed at my chest. Do you not feel the magic within you? Of course. I couldn't not, even now. It writhed and swirled in the ruins of where my once human heart had been. The aspect never rested. It pulsed constant in my veins. You shouldn't exist. My careless daughter, through her ignorance, created you. A creature that the previous generations of Hive would have killed on sight. I don't understand. She sighed. Let me put it another way. Why do you think I killed my bondmate? Because you're a cold-hearted bitch. Magnus spit out his wine and devolved into a fit of raucous laughter. He giggled to himself and tried to drink more wine, which sloshed around in the glass from his shaking hand. <laughs> he, he, he has you on that one. Are you not supposed to be on my side? Oh, I am, darling, but even you have to admit, it's true. Illyria growled, knocked back the rest of her blood wine, and motioned to Magnolia to pour her another. Be as that may, that's not the point I was trying to make. All entomancers, and the other races to a lesser degree, have access to the hive magic. They are only scratching at the surface, and only a few can handle the process to connect to the hive on a deeper level, namely the hive monarch and their knights. Me? Yes, you. 
the first human hive knight in existence. Ah, I'm just a filthy human, not worthy of being with your daughter. I jabbed my fork at Illyria. So that's why you're calling me an abomination, because I'm not one of your precious hive. Her eyes flickered with surprised amusement, and she let out a quiet laugh as sharp as her cheekbones. Oh, little one, I couldn't care less about you being human. I never had conflict with your species. No, that's not what makes you an abomination. By the nine kings of hell, quit dancing around the question and spit it out already. I'd had enough of her antics. Answer the question. Illyria sighed, a deep, disappointed sigh, signaling I was ruining her game. Too bad. You're no fun at all, but fine. I'll tell you, she said, taking another drink of wine. The hive magic inside you isn't what makes you different. But when you freed my daughter from her prison, she was bound to you through black magic. That sliver of magic is what makes you an abomination, as the two were never supposed to coexist. Her words troubled me, but beyond that, I didn't know what to make of them. I took my time pondering the implications as I ate. The boar steak, my favorite food, cooked to absolute perfection, crumbled to ash in my mouth. I chewed through it anyway, if nothing else to give me time to think. I swallowed a few mouthfuls of the meat and washed it down with another gulp of ale, which, thank the gods, still tasted sweet. I remembered the pain I was forced to endure, the agony of my heart being ripped to shreds by the war of the two magics. And when Eris told me of the aspect, she had mentioned it was acting unusual, so her words made sense. But beyond that, I think I knew all along. Ever since I became the Hive Knight, the aspects had a hold on me, twisting me into something dark. Illyria smiled. But you've known, haven't you? You can feel the aspect inside your mind, driving you, pushing your anger and rage. How did you know that? Because I was once like you. I don't understand, I replied. You wouldn't know this, but the black magic that cursed my daughter to her prison and bound the two of you together is a much stronger version of the bonding magic the Hive used to bind our partners together. Though, because of the nature of the spell, you have it far worse than I did. Son of a bitch. I understood the meaning of her words now. All this roundabout speak was leading me to the only conclusion available. I drained the rest of my ale, though it too was losing its flavor. My stomach was in knots. Magnolia was there to hand me another mug of ale, but I held off. Eris told me once that the females were considered the property of the males, but what Illyria was saying was much worse than that. If they used a form of black magic to bind them, then the females were literally slaves. Eris and I were bound through the black magic, and then we bound ourselves together through the bonding ritual. Not to mention Euroboros's influence turning me into the Hive Knight. Yeah, after all that, and the aspect, I'd consider myself an abomination too. So that explains Illyria's behavior in the Nemesini. You killed your husband to remove the magic that bound you together. Illyria smiled and laughed, a true laugh that held none of her earlier bitterness. It was throatier, but her sing-song musical laugh was very much the same as Eris's. She kept up her laugh and looked at me in a new light. You're not as inept as I first thought. Magnus let out a disjointed bark that I took to be laughter. His eyes glazed over and he swayed in his chair, which looked ready to topple to the floor at any moment. See, Illyria, told you he was c c clever. At least I have the drunk's vote of confidence. At the sight of Magnus deep in his cups, Illyria scowled, which strangely fit her face better than if she were laughing. I could handle it better than her friendly laughter. Dear, I think you've had enough to drink this evening. Psh, no, you're, you're ridiculous. He turned to me and breathed heavily as he tried to speak, his wine-soaked breath pungent even from where I was sitting. Hey, Duran, you tell her I'm still good to go. Sorry, Magnus, but you're trashed. At this, Magnus stopped. He had been reaching for the next bottle of wine on the table, but hearing my words, he put down the bottle and seemed to consider what I'd said. He looked down at himself for a moment. Hmm, it seems you are both correct. I am quite, how did you put it? Oh, yes, trashed. I laughed a bit. 
and the heavy tension between Illyria and me seemed to abate for the time, as we both had to deal with a drunk Magnus. It's okay. Happens to the best of us. All you need is a little time to sober up. Magnus's eyes glinted. Something I said was funny to him. You're quite right about that. I just need to sober up, is all. He raised his hands and snapped his fingers. It cracked through the hall, echoing around before sinking into the heavy stone walls. What the actual hell? In the span of half a second, Magnus had rid himself of his drunken stupor. Before stood a sloppy drunk with glazed eyes and a bright red face. Now stood the man I had met in the throne room. His sandy hair swept out of his eyes, which stared at me, alert and with intent. How? I asked. He smiled wide at me, a knowing grin, but one that wouldn't let slip his secrets easily. It's bad form to ask a player about their class, and besides, that would be telling. He had me on that one, but still. Oh, come on. You're doing things that should be impossible. I don't think game etiquette really applies here. Illyria interrupted me. I'd save your breath. He wouldn't tell me either. I had to figure it out myself. Though, if you guessed right, he'll tell you. I sighed as a headache crept in. Dealing with these two will drive me up the wall. With how infuriating you both are, you guys are made for each other. But that, both Illyria and Magnus smiled at each other, a gesture so different than what I'd come to expect from them it put me off. It was a look of affection between two lovers, two people who cared dearly for one another. A look I knew well. Illyria's hardened features softened as she spoke. Well... We've had plenty of time to get used to each other. She reached across the table and took hold of Magnus's hand, to which he responded with an affectionate squeeze. That we have, love, that we have. A hundred years, and it's flown by so fast. Their clear adoration for each other only made my longing worse. It hurt to be away from Eris, and to see such love only drove it home. I was so lost in thought that what Magnus said hadn't really registered, and then it crashed into me as my brain caught up to what he had said. A hundred years? Has Magnus lost it? Hey, Magnus, you might want to check your math. We haven't been here thirty years yet, let alone a hundred, I said. Magnus shifted his gaze from Illyria to me, and his eyes went from lovelorn to filled with sorrow in an instant. They held an emotion I couldn't place, sadness and regret, perhaps. It, more than anything else Magnus had done, frightened me. Oh, dear boy, you don't know, do you? Know what? He sighed deeply. It sank my heart to hear, and the heartbeat between his sigh and his words stretched on forever. After a lifetime, he spoke again. We haven't been in the Euroboros project for twenty-nine years, Durin. We've been here for over a thousand. Chapter Two Alone Eris The early morning light hit my eyes and woke me. I groaned, not wanting to get up, but I was cold and hungry, and I really needed to pee. I blinked my eyes, but they were heavy and didn't want to cooperate with me. After I wiped the sleep from them, I rolled over. The stone ceiling above me wasn't the same as the one in Sam's room, which confused me for a moment before I remembered. I was in the guest bedroom. I sat up from the comfy pillows I'd been lying on and noticed Tegan and Kira huddled together against my side, their fine brown hair a chaotic mess. They'd clung to me ever since Sam saved them from the slavers. I know they're still frightened about being near humans, but I do hope they'll come out of their shells a bit more. They'll be scared of humans forever at this rate. Though those two weren't the only ones who needed to be open-minded. Sam's kept his distance from the spiderlings. I know he's afraid of spiders, but he's an adult. He can afford to be more open. Thinking about Sam brought a smile to my lips. I hadn't spent much time alone with him in the last few days, which is my own fault. I'd spent the entire trip back to Gloom Harbor with the little ones. Neither of them liked being alone and were so wary of Sam and the rabbit men that they'd refused to talk to anyone but me. We'll just have to change that. All right, time to get up and start the day. 
I set up off the comfy bed, reached over to shake the children. Tegan's eyes jumped open at my touch, but he smiled when he saw it was me. Time to get up, Tegan, I said. It's too early, just a few more minutes, he mumbled. You don't want to sleep the day away, do you now? Come on, wake up your sister, and let's go get breakfast. Tegan just rolled over and cuddled up with Kira. I smiled at his back. I guess it won't hurt anything to let them sleep in, and there isn't anything important to do today anyway. That, and it would give me plenty of time to bathe and get myself ready. I didn't have any of my clothes in the room with me, but Sam had cleared a bunch of space in his wardrobe for me, which I appreciated. It was kind of him to turn his bedroom into our room. I opened the heavy oak door that led out into the hallway. The guest room was located on the top floor of the castle, with everyone else's bedrooms, but it was also the furthest from Sam's room. I shut the door as quietly as I could. The spiderlings would sleep through a thunderstorm, but I didn't want to wake any of the guild if I could help it. They've all been very gracious to accept me into their home. I know Sam's the leader, but everyone's been very welcoming. I made my way through the hall as quiet as I could, though the thick red rug that lined the entire hallway made it very easy. My bare feet enjoyed the plush carpet under them. I reached the door to the room and was just about to go inside when footsteps rose from the stairwell. They were light and padded, muffled by the stone walls. Almost as soon as I heard the steps, I wrinkled my nose. The rough stench of water, moss, and fungus tinged my nostrils. It was the smell of Lake Gloom. Strange. Who'd be at the lake at this hour? A second later, a thin man with long, shaggy brown hair walked up the stairs. His hair was so thick and unruly that I couldn't even see his eyes, though he could see me. He smiled when he noticed me, waving. Ah, good morning, Eris. I hope fortune finds you well, and may your skies never darken. Good morning to you too, Marcos. How are you today? I asked. I didn't really understand his words, but they were meant with sincerity, and that was good enough for me. The fates have found me in fine health this morning. Is Durin up yet? Miguel and his crew just finished unloading our profits and picked up their shipments of mushrooms. Durin told me to tell him when the Delilah arrived. Ah, oh, that explains the smell. I shook my head. I'm not sure if he's up yet. I was just going to see him and get a bath. Would you like me to get him for you? Marco shook his head. Oh, no, it's not that important. He can deal with the coin at his leisure today or tomorrow, though I'm sure Wilson would insist it being today. I pressed down the brass handle and kept my voice low. I'll let him know. I promise. Thank you. May the light always find you smiling. The same to you. Marcos was a strange man, but he was an easy person to like. I nodded my goodbye to him and stepped inside. Sam wasn't in bed. His bed was unmade and the pillows were strewn all over it. His fluffy crimson blanket was halfway off the bed. I chuckled at the sight. Sam never makes his bed. I'll have to try and break that bad habit. A bed should always be made properly each morning. Well, I could at least make the bed for him in the meantime. It wouldn't take long. I busied myself with the task. The sheets are dirty and will need to be washed before we leave for the Sylvanus Darkwoods. My heart swelled at the prospect. There are still some hive left. I couldn't fight the wide smile that tore at the corners of my mouth, and I hummed while I worked. I'm not alone anymore. I tried to keep up a brave face for Sam, but some nights I could still hear the call of the void, and I knew it would never truly leave me. Sam was the only reason I hadn't succumbed to my misery, but the fact that there were others of the hive sent my head spinning. I went to head into the bathroom when I noticed the door to his balcony was open. Is he outside? I walked onto the balcony to find it empty. There was nothing out here but a large crystal bottle, half filled with amber liquid. I picked it up and took a sniff. The sharp medicinal scent burned my nose and made me want to sneeze. Why would Sam leave his liquor lying on the floor? He's lucky it didn't break. I didn't know what to make of it. Sam was usually a neat person. He wouldn't just leave something lying around to get damaged or lost. Well, he's not in bed and he's not on the balcony. Maybe he's bathing? That thought brought a smile to my face. We hadn't shared much intimacy with the children around, and while I had to take care of them first, I missed Sam's touch. I crept to the door and opened it as slowly as I could, wanting to surprise him. As I opened the door, I was met with silence. 
The clear absence of the room told me Sam wasn't here either. I couldn't stop the smile from falling from my face. I wanted to spend some alone time with him. I don't know why, but I'm starting to feel uneasy. But I was just being ridiculous. Sam was just downstairs getting breakfast. I could have used our bond to check on him, but Sam valued his privacy. He wouldn't say it, but I know he didn't like it when I abused our connection. Even if I can't share it with him, I still need to bathe. We could always take one together later, after all. I stepped over to the edge of the bath and stripped out of my shirt. I sat down on the lip and stuck my feet in the water. The heat was wondrous. Sam had increased the temperature of the water, and steam rose off it to swirl about in the air. It floated towards me and was blown away when I breathed out. I stayed there for a few more minutes, staring off into space and daydreaming. The shimmer of the water along the walls made getting lost in thought easy here. I had to quit when my stomach growled with hunger. I lowered down into the bath. The water came up almost to my neck. The bath was built for Sam, who was a bit taller than me. At least it didn't swallow me completely, though if I were any shorter, it would. I proceeded to wash myself clean. As the soap ran over my pale skin, hints of vanilla, lavender, and cherry stuck to me. It smelled like Sam, which sent my heart fluttering. I washed the sweat from the night before from my skin and let the water carry the suds away. I wonder how the bath stays clean. Sam said he had help from Adam in building it but I hadn't the first clue how it worked. Sam told me Adam was a genius with building things, but I couldn't begin to understand how he did it. When my hair was clean, I grabbed the wash rag floating in the water and cleaned my ears. They needed extra attention, and I would need to see if Sam had any oil I could rub on them. They dried out and flaked easily if I didn't take care of them. I looked through the rack, but there was nothing there. I didn't expect there to be, but Sam was very hygienic and kept himself clean, so I was hoping. I guess I could ask McKenna or Evelyn if they have any. Yumiko also takes good care of herself, but I'd rather not ask her. I wouldn't bother the vampire unless I didn't have a choice. Maybe Sam isn't the only one who needs to get past his prejudices. I had a strong distaste of the nocturnals, but I could do with being more tolerant of them, or Yumiko, at least. My rumbling stomach screamed for attention, so I unwillingly climbed out of the bath. My hair was still soaking wet and it kept getting in my face. I wonder if Sam keeps an extra hair tie around somewhere. I padded over to the wash basin next to the bath. The gray stone was cool to the touch. It was nice after the heat from the bath. The steam made me lightheaded. The mirror had fogged over, so I wiped it clear with my hand. My reflection stared back at me. The pale skin of my face was red with the heat of the bath. My dark blonde hair, even darker and heavy with water, it streamed down my face to drip onto the floor. My black eyes stared back at me. I'd always hated them because they were so different than the others. Everyone else got pretty rainbow colors, and I got stuck with the ugly black ones. Father hated them and would insult them whenever he could. But that was then. I don't mind them so much anymore. They have a depth to them that the others of my kind didn't have. It took time, but I was coming to accept and even enjoy the previous aspects about myself that I once hated. Though as I stared down at my breasts, I still wished they were a bit bigger, even if Sam liked them. I grabbed the towel and dried and brushed my hair. There wasn't a hair tie on the basin, just more soap and Sam's razor. With the towel wrapped around me, I left the bathroom and went to get dressed. I placed the towel in the wicker hamper by the bathroom door and went searching for a hair tie. The first place I searched was the wardrobe, but I didn't have any luck. There were several sets of armor and my chest plate in the top, along with our casual clothes in the bottom drawers, but no hair ties. Since I was over here, I picked out what clothes I wanted to wear. Sam bought me plenty of outfits to wear, as well as several matching skirts. I didn't really see the need to wear them, but Sam was adamant about it. At least he didn't make me wear shoes. I hated shoes with a passion. Nothing but cramped, sweaty toe prisons, and I'd had enough of prisons to last several lifetimes. I picked up one of my newest shirts. It was a deep burgundy color with a high collar that clasped around my throat. I might just leave it unbuttoned, though. I slid it on and tried to find a matching skirt. I had several ones that would work, and I decided on a black one that stopped mid-thigh. 
I had a longer skirt, but I preferred the short one. If I'm forced to wear one, I'm going to wear the one that covers me as much as absolutely necessary and not an inch more. When I was dressed, I checked the last place I could find a hair tie, the nightstand. I opened the top drawer to find it dominated by pieces of wood in disarray, along with a set of knives and odd instruments. There was a rather large piece of wood that looked to be in the process of being carved. I picked it up and turned it over. I gasped in surprise. It was me, a tiny, incredibly detailed statue of me, down to my eyes and ears. It was carved with loving detail and could only be from someone who loved the subject. I couldn't stop the few tears that fell from my eyes, nor from my heart straining against my rib cage like it was going to burst from my chest. It's beautiful, Sam. Thank you. I set the sculpture back in the drawer carefully as to not damage it in the slightest. I didn't want him to know that I'd seen it. I would have to act surprised when he showed it to me. Just thinking about it brought more emotion welling up, so I doubted it would be too difficult. As I shut the top drawer and opened the second one, I found it was filled with Sam's underwear neatly organized by color, mostly hues of black and gray with some dark red sprinkled in. A quick glance told me what I was looking for wasn't here. I shut the drawer and opened the last one to find it mostly empty, barring two small chests. I opened one to find it filled with gold coins, nearly to the top, thousands of them, but no hair ties. With the first one having no luck, I closed it and opened the second one. It was a makeshift jewelry box, separate compartments for rings, necklaces, and bracelets, all made with the highest level of detail, some with gemstones set into the metal. Why would Sam have these? I've never seen him wear jewelry except for his wedding ring. The matching band around my own finger. I played with it as I searched. Spin, spin, spin. There were plenty of beautiful pieces here, but no tie. I was about to close it when one item caught my eye. It was a silver hair clip, masculine in its structure, but it was so pretty with its emerald stone set in silver. It was otherwise unadorned and plain. It suited Sam and I would have preferred something more feminine, but it would work, and it was still pretty. I picked it up and held it with my teeth while I pulled my hair back and used the hair clip to keep my hair in place. With my outfit and hair problem solved, my ravenous stomach demanded attention. The children have been sleeping long enough. Time to get them up and go eat. Closing the drawers, I left our room and headed back to wake Tegan and Kira. The hallway was clear and silent as I made my way to the guest room. The torches had been lit and cast ample light. I reached the door and entered. The children were right where I'd left them. Tegan was still cuddled into Kira. I went over to the far side of the bed and shook Kira. She awoke slowly and yawned, showing her rows of sharp teeth. What is it, Aunt Eris? Time to get up, sweetie. Breakfast. Her rumbling stomach was her reply, and I giggled at hearing it. Come on, get your lazy brother up, and let's feast. Kira sat up and rubbed her brown human eyes. Even though both of them were in safe company, they preferred to use their camouflage to conceal their true natures. I wish they wouldn't, but I understood why. Kira turned and started poking Tegan, not gently either, with a heavy voice. Hey, get up, Tegan, I'm hungry. He just scooted away from Kira and waved her off, which made her frown. She grumbled to herself before grinning like a madman. A devious idea played around in her head. She leaned over her brother and whispered to him, Wake up, or Misumina will eat you. Tegan bolted out of bed as if he were on fire. I'm up, I'm up, I swear. Kira rolled on the bed, clutching her sides as she shook with laughter. It went on for half a minute before she calmed down and climbed out of bed, tears streaming down her face. She wiped them, still chuckling to herself. Gets him every time. Meanwhile, Tegan glared daggers at his sister for pulling her prank. He was upset and there were a few tears in his eyes, though for different reasons. I went over to him and knelt to wrap him in my arms. There, there, it will be all right, little one. Tegan was prone to tears easily, and Kira knew it too. For her to be younger than Tegan, she acted like the big sister, the mean tomboy big sister. Kira, apologize to your brother. She huffed but apologized. She knew she had gone too far. As soon as the words left her mouth, Tegan stopped crying and went and hugged his sister. Much as they fight and bicker, they love each other to death and would do anything for each other. It was a wonderful sight to see, and it made me hopeful for the remaining members of the hive. 
with both of the spiderlings up and my belly crying from lack of food, we all headed for the kitchen. I held both of the children's hands as we left the room and walked down the many stairs to reach the first floor. The top floor bedrooms were deserted, but the second floor was bustling with half a dozen of the maids that kept the castle clean. I hadn't explored the second floor much. It was filled with training rooms and workshops, things I didn't have any business with, so I stayed away. We descended even more steps till we reached the first floor. Even though we were still a good distance away from the dining hall, hints of food being cooked wafted our way. Baking bread and the heavier scent of cooking meat. Bacon, if my nose was telling me straight. The curious sniffs from the children told me they could smell the food too. I smiled down at them. Let's hurry. We quickened our pace and, in a minute or two, had reached the heavy door to the dining hall. Before I even opened the door, several people talking at once and boisterous laughter slipped through the crack under the door. I tugged on the door and just managed to pull it open. I held the door for the children and squeezed in just as the door shut with a thud. If the sense of food were strong in the hallway, in here they were nearly overbearing. A dozen different smells swirled around me, from the soothing scent of fresh milk to the sharp tang of peppers cooking. Too many different kinds of scents sent my poor nose into overwork, but I tried to ignore it as best I could. It was all heavenly, but thick and heavy. The dining hall was built with the same stone as everywhere else in the castle, but had over a dozen windows that were open to let in a cool breeze which swept some of the heavier scents out. The morning sun shimmered off lake gloom in the distance. The water looked inviting but would have to wait, as I desperately needed food. From a quick glance, it looked like most of the gloom knights were here eating. There were several huge wooden banquet tables in the room, but everyone sat around the largest one that sat closest to the giant stone fireplace, which had a raging fire going. I searched the faces of everyone, looking for Sam, but he wasn't here. Odd, I wonder where he could be. I'll ask the others after we eat. Most of them were busy with the food on their plates, but Gil, Wilson, and Evelyn glanced up as we entered. Both Evelyn and Wilson returned to their food, but Gil welcomed me with a broad smile that showed his shining teeth that only served to stand out next to his chocolate skin. Good morning, Eris. I was wondering when you and the lughead would crawl out of bed, Gil boomed, his voice deep and rumbling like thunder as he spoke. His serious voice didn't match his friendly attitude at all. Gil was the big brother I'd never had and I couldn't help but grin at the giant. Good morning, Gil, I beamed at him. I sat down across from him, and the children sat on either side of me. The children were frightened of so many humans around, and they huddled into me, refusing to look at anyone but each other and myself. I stroked both of their heads in an attempt to get them to open up. Gil just watched the exchange with quiet amusement on his face, though his words finally registered past my hunger. Have you not seen Se- Durin this morning? I said. Oops, that was a close one. Gil picked up his mug and gulped what smelled like ale and wiped the phone from his mouth before speaking. No, at least I don't think I've seen him today. We talked for a bit last night, but that's it. Why, wasn't he with you all night? I shook my head and was about to answer when one of the maids tapped me on the shoulder. She was cute with dark brown hair that stopped at her chin and curled. Her brown hair and freckles gave her a mousy appearance. What can I get for you, miss? She asked. Oh, um, I'd completely forgotten about food, but as soon as it crossed my mind, I couldn't notice anything else. I looked down at the children and asked them what they wanted, and I wasn't picky, so I let them decide. Meat, they said in unison, and I couldn't help but laugh. I turned back to the maid with a chuckle. Well, you heard them. The maid blinked, squishing her eyebrows together as her eyes darted from the children and me to Gill. Um, am I missing something? I asked Gil. He looked like he was trying so hard to hold in a laugh. His cheeks were red, and he was trying not to smile. He pointed to the children. We can't understand them. I nearly slapped myself. How could I forget such a simple thing? Oh, right, I forgot that. Gil couldn't hold back his laughter anymore and nearly doubled over from his giggling. I had to smile at my own idiocy. I forgot that no one else could speak, Ragnarin. Through all this, the maid was still waiting patiently for our order. I'm sorry about that. I completely forgot that little fact. Um, could we have a bunch of meat? No other preference beyond that. The maid nodded at me. Right away, miss. And what to drink? Milk will be perfect. 
She nodded once more and turned to head back to the kitchen. I wasn't brave enough to drink ale first thing in the morning, and from what Sam had said, I was a lightweight, whatever that meant. Gil was still chuckling softly to himself. I wonder if anyone else has seen Sam. I looked over to where Evelyn was eating. Her pale skin and silver hair were perfect, not a strand out of place. She was picking her way through a plate of eggs and bacon, though she was hardly touching the food. Instead, she was buried in conversation with her brother. I hated to interrupt them, but my need to ask about Sam outweighed my reticence. Um, Evelyn, could I ask you something? She looked up in a flash, her golden eyes ringed with fury. It sent a wave of chills down my spine. But as soon as she noticed it was me who had spoken, her fiery gaze softened considerably. Oh, it's you, little queen. What can I do for you? I was suddenly less sure of asking her questions. I hadn't truly believed Sam when he told me Evelyn was dangerous, but the darkness in her eyes was unmistakable. I sat with my hands in my lap, running my fingers over each other while I worked up the courage to speak. H have you seen D today? With the drop in temperature from her eyes came quizzical humor. The guild leader? I haven't seen him since yesterday. Why, I thought you and he shared a bed. Trouble in paradise? Of course not, but Tegan and Kira didn't want to sleep alone, so I slept in the guest room. Evelyn picked up a piece of bacon. The smell sent even more waves of hunger through me. She took a deliberate bite and chewed thoroughly. Her eyes never left mine, but there wasn't a trace of her earlier hostility. Her eyes were smiling at me, but I hadn't the first clue why. Right, the spiderlings. She nudged Adam with her elbow. He jumped and looked up from the book he was reading. What? Have you seen the guild leader today? D. No, not since yesterday. Why? I frowned. This is getting strange. Surely someone has seen him today. Adam returned to his book and picked up a strawberry from his plate and popped it into his mouth. I'm sure he's fine, he mumbled, already engrossed with reading. I was about to ask McKenna and Harper, who were sitting a few seats away but the maid returned with our food, and my stomach forced me to put Sam out of mind while I focused on quieting my pangs of hunger. She set the plate down along with three mugs of milk. Tegan and Kira's eyes lit up at the sight of so much food. The dish was piled high with bacon, sausages, and ham, along with half a loaf of bread and some spicy-smelling pork in a brown sauce. All were nearly spilling over the plate. I let the children dig in, but there was more than enough food for all of us. I picked up a piece of bacon and nibbled on it, but it was overcooked. Well, overcooked to me. So I let the children devour the rest of it. I tried one of the sausages, and the hot juice and spice flowed into my mouth when I broke it open. I savored the flavor. It was indeed quite spicy, but I enjoyed the heat as it brushed my tongue. Taggett enjoyed the bacon, but Kira didn't much care for it. She, like me, stuck to the spicier meats. They didn't touch the bread, so I tore it apart and dipped it into the brown sauce, which turned out to be spicy gravy. It was delicious, and I mopped up every last drop, and when the spice became too much for my mouth, I washed it away with the milk. It was cold and tasted fresh, which was strange, as I hadn't seen any cows in the castle. Where did the fresh food come from? I was going to ask, but the children were eating their weight in food, and there wasn't much left so I picked at whatever they didn't like until I was stuffed. From the looks of content on the children's faces, they'd eaten their fill. They simultaneously took hold of their milk and drained it to the last drop. It was adorable. With my hunger satisfied, my thoughts immediately turned back to Sam. I knew he wouldn't like it, but I was getting worried, so I trailed a tendril of thought through our bond. It was just enough to crack open the door to his psyche. It was also enough to tell me everything I needed to know. Sam was gone, far away from me, and he was afraid. A pit of despair rose up in me, and there was nothing to stem the tide of grief that overtook me. Sam was far away, so very, very far. It was like a punch to my stomach, and for a second I forgot how to breathe. I choked and nearly spit up my milk but I fought back the bile and the sadness that rose in me. My heart was about to crack at the terror radiating from my bonded. My lungs wouldn't work anymore, and I let a few tears escape while I fought to keep 
from sobbing. Chapter 3 The Cracks Deepen Samson What are you saying? I understood Magnus's words, but they refused to make sense. My mind didn't want to comprehend what I'd heard. A thousand years, that's impossible. I stood from the chair so fast it tipped over, clacking heavily against the stone floor. It can't be true, it can't be. There was a plan, right? A plan for going back to Earth after the ghouls had been dealt with. They wouldn't just leave us here. But my thoughts rang false. We were nothing but lab rats, to be discarded when we'd served our purpose. I'd known that from the moment that man placed the barrel of his pistol against my head. We were completely disposable. I grabbed the mug of ale in front of me and downed it. The sweetness did nothing to ease the turmoil running through my head. I looked around for Magnolia and motioned her over. She came to me immediately. What can I get you, my lord? Whiskey, I managed to stammer out. She left without a word, and I stared down at my hands for a minute or two, trying to process things. While sweet, the L had some effect as inebriation kicked in. Rapturous bliss brought heaviness to my thoughts, removing my inhibitions and, by some miracle, let me think around the world-shattering revelation Marcus dropped on me. What am I freaking out about? So what if we're stuck here? There is nothing left for me to return to anyways. Mom, Dad, Micah, they're gone. Sophia's gone. I've been dead for a very long time. My body is probably dust by now. There's nothing left in that world for me. This is my home now. By some miracle of the gods, Magnolia returned quickly and set down a rather large bottle of liquor and a glass. I didn't even bother to read the label. It had probably cost a fortune. I don't give a fuck what it is at this moment. It could be paint thinner for all I care. I poured the whiskey in the glass and chugged it, barely paying attention to the sickening burn and nausea as I filled my throat to the brim with forgetfulness. All right, so we've all been here a hell of a lot longer than any of us realized. So what? Doesn't change anything. Doesn't change the life I've built. I poured one more glass of the top shelf whiskey not nearly as full as the others, and knocked it back. The drink was already starting to hit me. A soft fuzziness slipped in from the edge of my vision. I poured one more and drank it slow. After nearly three glasses of liquor, I was finally ready to face Magnus. He hadn't moved from his seat. Both he and Deliria watched me devolve in silence. Magnus still held his look of sadness like he'd accidentally kicked my puppy, rather than shoved a stick of dynamite in my skull and lit it. Regardless of the turmoil I was going through, all I had to do was ignore it and keep pushing on. Easier said. I put the thoughts out of mind and focused on Magnus. Okay, so we've been here for a thousand years. How? Why? Magnus sighed and leaned back in his chair as he worked through his thoughts. Are you sure you want to know? It won't change anything. You can leave, you know, go back to your castle and live the rest of your days in peace. After all this, all I've gone through these past weeks, just pack up and leave? Of course. You weren't supposed to be involved in the first place. A mistake on my part for handling the situation poorly. But nevertheless, you can wash your hands of this. Go home and spend time with your wife. His words were tempting, enticing even. I fiddled with the ring on my hand, considering his offer. Just leave Magnus to his own devices and go back to running the guild and spending time with Eris. It was my dream goal. The goal I'd been trying to find for so many years. A life I was content with. Magnus was a bad man, yes, who kept company with some of the worst scum I'd ever come across here, but who was I to cast stones? With the things I'd done, I had no room to judge anyone. And he was right, after all. This wasn't my problem. I liked his offer, and I was going to take it. Walk away from all this, go home and spend a week in bed with Eris. I told this to Magnus, but what I said wasn't what I meant to say. My words twisted, and what I spoke wasn't what I'd said. Regardless of any of that, I'm here now, so tell me. God damn it, Euroboros. This was the second time it had taken over my words. Whatever purpose it wanted me for was here with Magnus, and I knew too well the pain that awaited me if I tried to fight it. 
I growled under my breath. Fine, I know you're listening to me, so hear this. I'll cooperate for now, but don't you think for a second I won't settle accounts when this is all said and done with. He rose from his chair, along with Lyria. Well, if you want to know the truth, then come with me. I finished the last of my drink, slammed the glass down on the table and stood, walking with them out of the dining hall. Magnus led us through the hallways. The sameness of it all made me think I was being led in circles. I doubt I could find my way out of this place if my life depended on it, holy hells. Magnus knew right where to go, and before long we'd arrived at another plain unmarked door. Without a word, the door opened for Magnus, and he strolled inside. He was a study, well furnished with extravagant decor, lit by a chandelier that hung above our heads and by several other candles that hung on the walls or in holders around the room. A desk sat in the corner with a plush leather chair pushed against it. The center of the room was dominated by a scale model of the Isle of Nexus, crafted with such incredible detail that buildings and towns were recreated almost exactly. Near the center of the map was a model of Castle Gloom Harbor nestled against Lake Gloom. To the west of my home were the Compass Kingdom and the outlying villages. I just stared at the detail for a long moment. It was incredible. I could even pick out the capital of the elves, Ilsaria, nestled deep in the Emerald Ocean. As I continued to gaze at the map, I noticed a few things. Places on the map that I'd never seen before. Far in the northern mountains, Magnus had mapped the location of the home of the Rabbitmen, the Pale Everlands, which I'd never been to before, but I'd heard it was located on one of the four great mountains. If this map was to be believed, the Everlands were situated on the smallest of the four. How does he know all this? This is more detail than I've ever seen before. What is this, Magnus? He grinned at me. The work of dozens of years and far more gold than I expected. I leaned over the table, still taking everything in. For what purpose, though? He ignored my question for the time being and said he was busy showing off his map, rambling about its construction and the time it had taken. It was a little disconcerting to see the most powerful man I'd ever met nerd out over his creation. At this moment, he reminded me so much of Adam that it was almost funny. He pointed down at the rolling hills that were located next to Castle Gloom Harbor. I traversed across most of them at one point or another, but there was something there that shouldn't be. The hell is that? Crystal Court? Magnus replied nonchalantly. I whistled. By the nine kings of hell, that's close to home, far too close. Does the Alice know? Of course she does. The queen of the fae usually doesn't take kindly to interlopers into her domain. Wonder how he managed that. Magnus scratched at his beard. His eyes were someplace else, lost in thought. He probably won't tell me, but I've got to know. How'd you manage to glean the location of the home of the fairies? I bargained. At that, Magnus pursed his lips, making it clear he had said all he was going to on the matter. I relented. I probably didn't want to know anyway. I left the gods of this world to their own devices. But in showing me all this, there had to be some point. As amazing as it was, Magnus didn't strike me as the type who showed off on principle. I was here for a reason. So why don't you tell me why we're here? Illyria spoke from the doorway. How much are you going to reveal to the boy? His eyes flicked to Alira, and a warning flashed in them, a tint of anger that was gone as soon as it came. So quick, if I hadn't been looking, I'd have missed it. As much as he is willing to listen. My payment for the burden I've caused him. He turned to me. Are you sure you want to know? I owe you a debt, but this is poor payment. I can send you home with enough money to live in luxury for the next seventy years, if that would be preferable. Hell, yes, that would be preferable, but I don't get a choice in this. Tell me. Magnus let out a breath, long and slow through his nostrils. Not the answer he was expecting, but he would honor my wish, even if it wasn't my god's damn wish at all. He moved back to the table, stretching his arm over it. Fingers splayed out in all directions as he conjured magic from out of nowhere. In an instant, a spell formed in his hand. No script circle or incantation. Magnus bypassed the laws of magic and just willed his spell into existence. I don't get how he's doing it, but worry about that another time. The better question is, what the hell is that spell he cast? 
It wasn't a spell I was familiar with, and I'd seen most of them. A shimmering wave appeared over the map, like the heat that rose off buildings on a hot summer day. It drifted over the table and condensed into a small circle the size of a dinner plate made of pure glass. I peered over to get a better look at it. Magnus noticed my interest and decided to demonstrate the function of the spell. He brought the glass lower over the map, right over Castle Gloom Harbor. From within the circle, every single detail of my castle was clear, as if I were standing directly in front of it. Magnus manipulated the spell to circle around the castle, showing it from all angles. Light and movement on the ramparts of the castle drew my attention. Several men-at-arms were patrolling around the castle, torches in hand. Was this in real time? I shot my head up to stare at Magnus. He was already looking at me with a wide smile on his face. He had anticipated my question and had the answer at the ready. Yes, you are seeing your home as it is right now. Not possible. Illusion magic or some other explanation. There is no spell that can do that. With a flick of his wrist, Magnus canceled the spell. It fizzled out with a pop, and he backed away from the table, walking over to his desk, and pulled out a large roll of parchment. He rolled it out and beckoned me over. For you and the rest of the players, you'd be correct. It's a little creation of mine. You can't create... I shut my mouth. I was getting really tired of Magnus shattering my worldview. Magnus kept doing things and showing me impossible things, breaking the rules of the game that we've been living with for 30 years. Over and over again, he was crumbling all the beliefs I'd come to know as fact. So tell me, how can you create spells, something that's impossible for the rest of us? A hint of a grin turned the corners of Magnus's lips. I help design and program the Euroboros Project. As such, I gave myself a few perks. I leaned against the table and blew out a short breath. So, that's how you can do so many incredible things. You're cheating the system. His face darkened as I accused him. A fire raged in his eyes before he composed himself. It's insulting to call someone a cheater, though I understand how you came to that conclusion. But no, I am not, nor can I, cheat the system. I may have given myself a few advantages, but not even I can cheat the AI. Uh, I don't know whether to believe him or not, but I guess it doesn't matter. He can do these things and I can't. It's that simple. He picked up a couple of paperweights and sat them at the corners of the parchment. Player-created spells cost a tremendous amount of mana to use, and it's not something I'm capable of anymore, regardless but that's not what I wanted to talk to you about. I went over to the side of the desk to look at what he'd unfurled. It was another map, though not half as detailed, and it was mostly unfamiliar to me. I recognized the Isle of Nexus, but there were other landmasses entirely new for me on this map, including a continent that was well over double the size of Nexus. It was labeled Summervale in rough scribble. I pointed at the unfamiliar location. What's this? I've never heard of it. Magnus ran one hand through his shaggy length of hair, his fingers gliding through his golden hair while his other hand drummed in a staccato rhythm on the parchment. He wasn't looking at me, he wasn't even looking to Illyria, who stood silent as a wraith, her cold eyes drinking in the scene unfolding before her. Magnus was looking from his hands to the wall to stare into the soft, lambent light of the candles. Anywhere but at me. His behavior was stoking my curiosity. If he was going to play coy now, after all he had shown me, must be something big if it's got Magnus so nervous. My impatience overrode my fear at the answer. Well, what is it? Magnus blew out a breath, long and slow. What you are looking at was the true size of the world. I didn't understand. Was? Magnus inclined his head. Yes. This is the original map of the world for this server of the Euroboros Project. I backed up from the desk. That was too much information at once for me. I was already reeling from his earlier statements, and he went and threw me into even deeper water. I paced around the table, sorting through and dissecting his words. Okay, you can do this. Gods, I need a drink. I stopped my circling and faced Magnus. Okay, walk me through this. So, first off, pretty much everything I know is wrong. 
Not only was the world much bigger than I realized, but there are other servers than this one? Pretty much. What are they like? Magnus shrugged his shoulders. I haven't a clue. I was only involved in creating this server. Fine. Whatever. What happened to the world? Magnus paused. His face grew slack as if he were nothing but a statue. He stayed quiet. Magnus? I don't know. What the hell? No, seriously, what the actual hell? Okay, okay, okay. I ran my hands over my temples. The alcohol in my system wasn't enough to stop the pounding headache that was trying to crush my skull. Okay, not okay. So not okay. God damn it, I so don't want to know any of this. Magnus took note of my freakout and spoke to Illyria. Would you have Magnolia or Jasmine bring him a drink? I'm sure he could use it. Illyria turned and left without a word, leaving me alone with Magnus and with my thoughts. I faced Magnus, my head pounding. What do you know, then? He picked up the paperweights and neatly stored them in a drawer on the desk. He looked at me with eyes that held the weight of a dozen lifetimes and sighed. All I know is... Something happened just over 300 years ago. A massive system crash nearly destroyed the entire server. Because I had admin access, I received advance warning from the governing AI. But things spiraled much quicker than we could repair it. Magnus bent over the table and conjured his magnifying glass once more. He brought the lens over to the very edge of the map, way out into the Ecclesian depths, the deepest part of the Azure Seas. Where I expected to see endless ocean, I was met with an incredibly strange sight. A creeping darkness at the edge of the sea. Water rushed to fill the space, but was swallowed whole. What is that? I asked, dumbfounded. The void, or some variation of it. I gestured at the table. I can see that, but what's it doing there? What it does best. Devouring everything. Magnus canceled his spell, and the image before me disappeared with a pop. When the system failed, we had to make a drastic choice. Sacrifice a few for the good of the many, or let the whole thing unravel. You can guess which choice we made. Right now, best I can tell, the damage was contained, but it destroyed most of the hard drives. Right now, we're operating on about 25% of what's left. So the system devoured the other continents to save space on the remaining drives? Magnus shook his head, holding a very forlorn and pained expression on his face. Not just the land masses, but NPCs, players, memories, and even history itself. Anything that was deemed non-vital. What? He cast his eyes towards me with a raised brow. Have you not wondered at the current state of things? The fact that we don't have an accurate record of history or any concrete time system? I coughed, turning away from the weight of his eyes on me. He expected a reasonable answer, which I didn't have. I tugged at my ponytail. I mean, I guess I've thought about it in passing, but there was always something better to occupy my time with than sitting around reading books or theorizing. There was always something else to worry about. Some new job or quest, some dungeon to explore while I made the climb to level 100. I didn't have any inclination to sit still. It always brought up old memories. I passed failures. Magnus sighed at my answer before chuckling. You, and most others in this world, though I suppose it's a blessing. If too many people learn the truth, it would be chaos. I'm used to dealing with chaos, nothing new for me there, but this, this is beyond anything I could imagine. Magnus was about to retort, but was interrupted by Magnolia, bringing a large silver tray with a large bottle of liquor and two glasses. She set the tray down and bowed to Magnus. My mood picked up at the sight of the bottle, and I walked over and poured a too generous measure into the glass. I knocked it back and poured another. The booze quieted my rampaging thoughts that were haunted by what I'd just been told. It was too much, way too much for me to handle, and I downed glass after glass in the hopes of finding some sense of normalcy in the world. It didn't work, and I got nowhere but drunk. And at this point, I'm okay with that. Damn it all to hell. I stood off the ground, 
How I'd gotten there was beyond me, but I managed to stand after a few tries. The room spun, so I leaned against the magical spy table and tried to focus on Magnus. There were three of him in the room. Was there always three of him? Odd that I never noticed. My vision swam again, and I blacked out. I awoke to pain. My head pounded with the remnants of the overabundance of alcohol in my system. My hangover made even moving a challenge, but the light currently blinding me made it a necessity. I sat up slowly, pushing myself out of the blistering light, and when I got up, resistance clung. Soft and warm hands held me. Good morning, love, I said to Eris. I reached down to unstick her from my side, only to find short auburn hair obscuring her face. Eris doesn't have red hair. Wait a second. Oh no, tell me I didn't. I slipped the heavy slate comforter off me. Okay, still have my pants on. That's a good sign. The events of the previous day came crashing into me, and I put the massive existential crisis out of mind for the moment and focused on the naked girl in bed with me. I poked her gently. Jasmine? A low mumble was her response, and I tried again. She lifted her head. Yes? What are you doing? Cuddling. Why? You asked me to, she said, pressing herself to my side. Why did I ask you to cuddle? Jasmine shrugged and nuzzled into me. I don't know. I thought you might have been joking, but I wasn't sure. I let out a long sigh and tried not to get upset at the maid. It's not her fault I'm an idiot. Okay. Well, you do not have to cuddle me again. Best not take anything I say when I'm drunk seriously. Okay. So, you can let go of me now. She shook her head. Why not? Because you're very warm. It's nice. I tried once more to pull away, but it seemed she was adamant about not letting go of me. Jasmine, could you let go of me for just a second? No. I gave one final attempt to pull myself free, but without putting a considerable effort into it, I wasn't going anywhere. How the hell do I get her off me? I was about to resign myself to be this girl's pillow for the next few hours, when a delicious thought struck me. It was mean and childish, but I couldn't help but smile at what I was about to do. I reached over for the pitcher of water on the nightstand by the bed. Jasmine, will you please let go of me? Another shake of her head, and she clung even tighter. I gave her ample opportunity. It's on her now. I moved the pitcher over her sleeping form, snuggled so soundly into me. What a rude awakening this is about to be, I thought, and dumped the remaining water on top of Jasmine. The result was better than I could have hoped for. As soon as the cold water touched her skin, she bolted, her eyes open, just in time to be drenched as the rest of the water landed all over her. Jasmine let out a half-gargle, half-screech of surprise, and flung herself as far as she could away from me. The bed was more than accommodating, and she found herself with plenty of room that wasn't now soaked with water. I stood off the bed and threw on my shirt. While she glared murder at me, I undid my hair and quickly retied it before walking to the door. Have a good morning, Jasmine, I said, and hastily left the room. I found Magnolia a short walk later. She asked me about Jasmine, and I admitted where she was, but I hastily assured her again that nothing had happened between us. I was worried when she didn't return to her room last night. I'm just glad she's all right. Without another word, she led me to the dining hall. Magnus sat in the same spot as last night. In front of him on the oak table were an array of dishes hardly touched. He sipped from a porcelain cup and picked up a piece of parchment, though his eyes rose as I approached. Good morning, Durin. I trust you slept well. I groaned a non-reply and sat down in the same chair as last night, resisting the urge to lay my head down and sleep. Magnus was cheerfully awake, dressed in a vibrant butterscotch tunic, looking like a man who'd gotten a full night's rest. I didn't get more than three hours, and he was still wide awake with Illyria when I blacked out. That thought brought a question to mind. Where's Illyria at? He picked up his cup and took another sip, ignoring my question for the moment. As he sat his cup down, he spoke. She's taking a bath. I'm sure she'll be along shortly. 
He lifted his cup and gestured towards me. Would you like some tea? It's my own special blend. I think you'll find it to your liking. When Magnolia returned, I almost leapt out of my chair. The door opening was a gunshot to my senses. I flinched at the sound and shook the table. Magnus looked up with a grin and drained the rest of his tea. By the time Magnolia reached the table, I'd calmed my shot nerves. She sat down a large cup of tea with a wink. I made it special for you. The smell rising from it was heavenly, a mixture of black tea, lemon, and a sharp, bitter undertone that I recognized well. I took a large gulp. The tea was delicious, but the liquor was what made me sigh in pleasure. The bite of the alcohol soothed my aching head almost instantly, and I drained the cup in several gulps before setting it back on its saucer. Guess let's get this over with. I need some answers. Can we talk? He looked up from his papers to answer me. Of course, I'm sure you have many questions. That I do. Magnus picked out one of the biscuits on the plate, tearing it apart with his fingers and flicking the pieces into his mouth. I'll answer what I can, but as I mentioned last night, there is still much I myself don't know. Yeah, I got that. But let's work through what you do now. Before we go off speculating, I'd like to have a good grasp of the situation. It was a lot to take in last night, and I want to fully understand the situation before we add to it. Go ahead. I fumbled with the knife next to me, buttering a half of a biscuit I had no intention of eating. Let's start with the easiest thing for me to understand. So the world used to be much bigger than it is now? Correct. And up until 300 years ago, everything was fine until something happened. You don't know what, but it caused a massive crash. Indeed. So the system compensated by this by deleting shit, including people and even history itself? Magnus nodded. A bit more eloquent than I'd have put it, but you have the basics. Why haven't we noticed any of this? A few have, but the main reason is that everyone's memories get deleted. Wait, what? Memories take up quite a lot of the data, and with our limited hard drive space, it was the simplest option. I paused to consider his words. I got the gist of it, but the technical aspects behind it boggled me. How does that even work? Magnus sighed, rolling up his parchment and sliding it into his pocket, giving me his undivided attention. It's basically on a cycle. We have enough space for about a hundred years of everyone's memories. When the storage starts to exceed our allocated space, the AI resets the world. It deletes our memories and resets everyone back to square one? Precisely. It hard resets everything back to the first backup, which was made when we reset the world the first time, and erases the data. I pointed a finger at him. How do you know all this? Perks of being the lead programmer. I've kept all my memories since the very beginning. I whistled. That's a thousand years of memories. Magnus took a sip of his tea. It's certainly been a burden to bear. It's hard to make friends when they'll just forget you in the end, he smiled. Though there are a few exceptions. Illyria, of course, but there have to be others from the sound of it. I was about to ask when Magnolia returned with more tea. The clink of china interrupted my chain of thought. Magnolia sat the full cup down on its saucer, and from the smell wafting past my nose, it was at least as strong as the first cup. I picked it up and took a tentative sip. It was more alcohol than tea. I took a big gulp, enjoying the burn of the booze as it went down. It helped me get my thoughts in order, or at least sort them into manageable chunks for me to digest. Okay, let's not go off and ask every single question that's running through my head right now. We'll be here for hours if I pester him about pointless things. I need clear, concise, and understandable information. The void at the edge of the world. I'm assuming that's a threat. Not by itself, no, but it's indicative of a much greater problem. Which is, I hedged, chaos. Or, for lack of a better term, instability. It means something is wrong and the system is compensating again. Can't you just use your admin access and find out what's going on? I asked before drinking another sip of tea. Magnus shook his head and sipped tea. I could if I still had it. I lost my contact with the AI and haven't been able to access any higher system functions. How'd that happen? Agnes paused, 
His eyes shifted away from me. I don't know. Liar. But I didn't press further. It would only anger him, and he was entitled to his secrets. There were much bigger things to worry about. Are we in danger? Not at the moment, but something needs to be done, or it could turn into a serious problem. I leaned back in my chair while I digested what he just told me. There were things Magnus was keeping from me, it was obvious, but what was also obvious was that something was wrong. Okay, so something is going on here. Something big. It's not just Magnus's words, but whatever that's been taking over my voice. I'm being pushed into this whether I want to or not. I can't afford to sit this one out, even if I had a choice in the matter. Wonder what the aspect thinks. I closed my eyes for a second, reaching down for its presence. It's been unusually quiet since meeting Illyria. Hey, aspect, talk to me. It pulsed, keeping me alive, but it refused to answer my call. I pushed, and it sent a spike of frost through my heart. The pain was sharp and took my breath from me before fading and disappearing. What the hell's going on with it? It was terrified, which in turn terrified me. The aspect was strong, abomination or not, and it had saved my life more than once, so for it to be afraid meant serious news. I ran my fingers over the cup of tea, trilling over the smooth porcelain under my fingers. It was a real physical sensation that helped ground my fear and let me work through it. As I was about to respond, there was an itch in the back of my head. Eris is up. That thought made me happy for a split second, but it couldn't erase the fear and unease running wild. There was too much unease flowing through me that there was no way I could keep it from her. I was so afraid. And Eris knew it. She opened our bond, and our emotions mixed. They poured over one another and did nothing to quell each other. If anything, it made things worse. Her misery at my absence only magnified when my terror slipped through. There was no way for me to communicate with her, and her tidal wave of emotions flooded into me, drowning me. I had to close off our connection, though it pained me to do so. It had to be done. Our emotions would only hurt the other, and it wasn't what I needed to focus on right now. Throughout all of this, I tried to keep my distress off my face, but Magnus saw right through it. He was looking at me with a quizzical expression on his face. He put down his tea. Something troubling you, Durin? Instead of answering him, I picked up the china cup in front of me and drained the contents. As always, the booze helped to calm my racing heart and mind. As I sat the cup on the table, I spoke. Uh, I'm fine. Just a little headache. My weak lie did not get past him. Trouble with your wife? That obvious, huh? He laughed. Only to me. Like you, I've spent ample time with an entomancer. You pick up a few things. While I'm not bonded to Illyria, I understand the concept easily enough. His words surprised me. I'd assume the two of you were bonded. Oh, by the stars, no. Not that I'm opposed to the idea, but Illyria, for obvious reasons, refuses to be bonded ever again. Well, with how things ended with her first bondmate, I can't say I blame her all that much. She doesn't want to end up like me. The door to the dining hall opened once more, and Deliria strolled in, her pale skin flushed by heat, her hair damp, turning the golden strands into tarnished brass. Her hair was tied back out of her face in a ponytail, and she was garbed in a dark crimson dress that flowed down to her ankles, though her feet were bare. Like mother, like daughter. Magnus looked for me at the sound of the door opening. Ah, speak of the devil. We were just talking about you, dear. Illyria smiled at his words. All bad things, I hope? All right, Magnus. What do you need from me? Magnus stopped mid-sip, his teacup frozen halfway to his lips, and confusion lit up his eyes. I'm sorry? There's obviously something big going down. Now that I know about it, what can I do to help? Magnus looked from me to Illyria and back again. His confusion washed away to amusement as he realized my meaning. He chuckled, but it wasn't his usual laugh. There was absolutely no kindness in it. I think you've misunderstood things. After our meal, I'll give you a teleportation scroll and send you home. What? 
I couldn't stop my anger from boiling out. I slammed my fist down on the table, knocking over my empty cup in the process. The table shook in my outburst. Excuse me? I yelled, spitting fury across the wood. After all this, everything you've told me just to go home? Precisely. Magnus picked up his cup and continued to drink his tea, as if we were discussing nothing more important than the weather, his face betraying no hint of his reasoning. Why? I tried and failed to keep my voice level. Do you want the truth? Obviously, I said through clenched teeth. Magnus sighed, setting down his cup and looking me square in the eye. There was judgment and darkness in them. You're clearly a capable man. I won't deny that. Tough and strong-willed, but you're also quick to anger, dangerously unpredictable, and your penchant for drink borders on alcoholism. You bring much to the table, but you also leave much to be desired. He paused and took a breath leaving me in stunned silence. In short, I have no use for a man like you. His words stung me, but purely from the audacity of them, they rang hollow in my ears. Magnus clearly didn't understand the kind of person I was. Alcoholism? Ridiculous, I've never had a problem. His words should have enraged me, almost did, but to give in to my anger would have just proved his point. Instead, I countered his accusations with one of my own. Who is Magnus to levy judgment when he keeps his worst kind of company? Yet you employ the likes of Darren or Liam? Yeah, you clearly have discerning tastes, all right. Magnus looked up, eyes widened. You've met Liam? I have. Liam's been with me for many years and has proven himself loyal time and time again. I laughed in his face. Loyal? Liam was a right bastard, a slaver like Darren, who preyed on the weak. Magnus couldn't help but notice my wording. The inflection in my tone betrayed Liam's fate. Was? Liam asked. He got in my way. You killed him? Magnus's tone changed from bored to incredulous, as did his face. He didn't believe me. I inclined my head. Well, it was a combined effort, but I don't think he needs the details. Magnus took his eyes off me to stare at his interface. His eyes dropped when he realized I spoke the truth. A flash of sadness tinged with righteous fury crossed them before Magnus could compose himself. You weren't lying. You must forgive my disbelief. Liam was one of my strongest lieutenants. Few were capable of besting him. He shook his head brushing his blonde hair from his face as he composed himself. Even if they were friends, Liam will be back in a few months once he respawns. Well, aren't you full of surprises? Lyria said from beside me as she leaned over to whisper to Magnus. I strained my ears but couldn't pick up more than half a word or two. Nothing that could help me make sense of anything. As Illyria broke away from him, Magnus spoke. You make an excellent point. I hadn't considered that. He turned his head to me. Very well. You say you wish to help. If you have the skills to defeat Liam, then despite my reticence, I could use your assistance. I don't like this one bit. I rose from my chair. Why do I feel like this is a trap? Magnus smiled at me, back to his cheerful self. Not a trap, a test. It'll be dangerous, risky. I won't lie, but if you truly want to help, I'm going to regret this, but what the hell? All right, what do you need from me? Magnus set down his cup of tea and pushed the remains of his breakfast away from him. He picked up the pristine white cloth in his lap and dabbed at the corners of his mouth, wiping non-existent stains away. Why don't we continue this conversation in the war room? The what now? Magnus grinned wide his eyes sparkling with anticipation. Oh, you're going to enjoy this. Chapter 4 Just Another Job Magnus said I'd enjoy the war room, and what met me as we stepped through the heavy iron door did not disappoint. The room was large, easily the same size as the dining hall or throne room, but there were no windows or stained glass here. No, there was floor-to-ceiling stone. Bright green lights hung along the walls and in gigantic wrought-iron chandeliers from the roof. 
They all bubbled and frothed effervescent, casting dancing shadows onto the muted gray wall, which came alive with darkness. The lights were mesmerizing, and it took a concerted effort to pull my gaze from them. I growled under my breath. What the hell is Magnus thinking? Some warning would have been nice, Magnus. Mage lights aren't things to play around with. He cast a small grin my way. If you can't handle the little mind games, you'd be utterly useless to me. Little mind games, I scoffed. People can go insane from just one, and there's hundreds here. You're not people. I stand by what I said, but I now have much higher hopes for you. As we walked through the room, we came across the first area. The entire room was divided into sections, each one taking up one-fourth of the space. The first one looked like nothing short of a military command center. It held an exact replica table of the one in the study, though this one had a few noticeable changes. From a quick glance, I could tell what this table was for, planning conflicts, assessing threats. I scanned over it, but I'd already seen its tricks in his study, so it was far less impressive a second time. When I stood up from the map table, I caught the glint of metal in the far corner of the room, and when my eyes adjusted, I saw what the latter half of the room was hiding. Rows and rows and rows of armaments. Hundreds, if not thousands of them. What must have been one of nearly every weapon in the world, lined up in neat order next to one another. A full rack of swords was next to a rack of spears, which continued to a rack of daggers. None of them were below hero tier which put just one little racket easily the most expensive thing I'd ever seen. And there were dozens upon dozens of weapon racks. I'm staring at tens of millions of gold just in weapons alone by the nine kings of hell. This, more than anything else I'd seen since coming here, terrified me to my bones. Magnus was a truly powerful man, but his magic was so far out of my purview that I didn't understand it. I was so far out of my depth regarding him, but I understood these weapons. I understood the unthinkable amount of wealth they represented. If Magnus so desired, he could overthrow the entire Compass Kingdom, could topple the Five Kings, and proclaim himself Emperor of Humanity. And he hadn't. This amount of money was enough to corrupt even the Whisper herself, and I knew deep in my soul that I wouldn't have been so noble. This money would have destroyed me with the power it could grant. And this was just one-fourth of the room. The other half was a mixture of over two dozen sets of armor, each one clearly hero tier, the highest quality that existed. Alongside the armor were quite a few sets of mage robes, all of them humming with untapped power, even to my nearly magicless senses. I couldn't ignore the power they gave off. And if the weapons and armor weren't enough, the last section of the room was dedicated to miscellaneous items, potions of every kind, Everyone I'd ever seen, as well as many more that I'd only ever heard about. On a large wooden bookcase next to the potions was a small library of scrolls, sectioned off and labeled. The more I looked, the more I was amazed. Jewelry and charms, magic items that did gods knew what. Everything was neatly organized and displayed like a prized collection, but I knew exactly what I was looking at. An armory. This room was an armory, built to wage war and I believed with my entire being that there wasn't a force alive that could stand against Magnus. He might as well be a god with his unnatural powers. He might actually be one. I turned to him, my mouth hanging to the floor. Why do you have all this? Magnus laughed. A product of my nature. I'd rather have it and never need it than find myself wanting. If you need this much firepower, I weep for all of us. Magnus laughed again quietly. Perhaps. Once Alira gets here, we can go over the assignment, he said, then busied himself with the table, already lost in his thoughts. I decided to have a look around at the unbelievable weapons while we waited. Naturally, I was drawn to the swords. I walked over to the rack and admired the gleaming metal. The first row was dominated by what I would say were the lowest quality weapons, which baffled me to even think about because I saw a similar sword to the one I carried. And this was just the lowest shelf. The unbelievable quality only increased as I reached the next levels. The top two racks only held a single sword apiece, and these enraptured me. They were rather plain-looking longswords, without much ornamentation, but they needed none. 
The sword that was eye level with me was solid black from hilt to blade, but when I blinked, splashes of red and orange seemed to trickle in and out ethereally. It was beautiful in its simplicity, and I wanted to wield it. It called out to me. I shook my head and focused on the next sword. It was the inverse of the previous sword, shining silver metal that sparkled even in the dark. The hilt was solid white with a golden pummel, and the blade of the sword shone with soft white light. However, this weapon made me want to run screaming from it. I recoiled and backed away. The hell are these? I asked, my voice cracking slightly. Hmm, Magnus said, looking up. He squinted before his light green eyes lit up. Ah, I should have known you'd take an interest in those two. What are they made of? Magnus waved his hand, and the black sword was in his grasp. It flared to life as if lit by the flames of perdition itself. It goes by several names, but I call it Hellsteel. It's incredibly hard to forge, but not impossible. Several prominent blacksmiths have managed over the years, and before you ask, no, I won't tell you how it's made. Damn it, I want one. Fair enough, but what about the other one? Why do I want to never go near it again? His lips turned up in a half smile. It has that effect on the unworthy. What's that supposed to mean? I snapped. Magnus held up his hands to placate me, but his eyes lit up with humor, none of it ill. I meant nothing by it, friend. If it makes you feel better, I can't wield it either. My eyebrows raised. How come? Magnus snapped his fingers, and the hell steel sword vanished, only to be replaced by the shining silver one. It floated in the air above our heads, lazily spinning on its axis. It's called God Steel, and it's not meant for mortals. Only those with shards of divinity can wield such weapons. How do you have it then? I asked, not having a clue what he was talking about. A small, sad smile met me. I'm holding it for a friend. Who? But my question went unanswered as Magnus busied himself at the table. It was clear he would say no more on the subject, despite leaving me with far more questions than answers. Okay, just leave me alone to unpack literal demonic and divine weaponry. Seemed like Magnus liked to play it that way, blow my freaking mind, and then leave me hanging with questions. Whatever, just more shit that doesn't make any sense, which is rapidly becoming normal for me. Why don't you get to the reason why you brought me here? Magnus brushed my question aside, focusing on his map table, pushing pieces around it like it was a chessboard. Magnus! I slammed my palm flat on the table, sending his little pieces scattering across the map. Anger clouded his face and his eyes darkened. He glared at me, and suddenly I couldn't move. I stood stock still. My airway was clear, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't breathe. My lungs refused to operate. I couldn't even fall to the floor. I just stood there and suffocated. For nearly a minute, I maintained my cool. I pissed him off, and I figured he would relent, but after another half a minute, my consciousness waned. Panic quickly set in, and I started freaking out. I railed against my invisible bonds as hard as I could to no avail. I wasn't moving an inch. My sight grew dim as my brain starved of oxygen. My head grew heavy, and my thoughts lost all cohesion. Then he released me. I tumbled to the floor and lay there choking on the air I shoveled into my starved lungs. It took several long moments before I regained the strength to stand. I stumbled up and clutched at the table to support myself. Magnus looked me dead in the eye. You forget your place, Durandal. I am not someone to make demands of. I may not be your enemy, but that doesn't mean I won't kill you if you cross me. From the look in his eye, he meant every word, and he more than had the power to carry out his threat. Much as I hated to admit it, he was right. I had forgotten my place. I'm nothing compared to him. My power is nothing. My skill with the sword is nothing to a man who can kill me without a word. He outclasses me in every possible way. I nodded to him, rubbing my throat. Message received. He straightened, tugging at the cuff of his golden tunic. Good. Even with all your faults, I find myself liking you, and I try not to murder people I like, but it happens. Magnus began fixing the table, 
placing the toppled and scattered pieces back where they belonged with pinpoint accuracy. He worked with speed. In under twenty seconds, he replaced every one that I had knocked over. As he situated the final piece, he spoke up. To answer your question, I am waiting on Illyria. She is bringing something of importance. She should be here. The heavy door opened, and Illyria walked in, still wearing that dark crimson dress, accented by a rather simple silver necklace in the shape of a honeycomb that draped across her slender throat. She smiled at Magnus before turning her gaze upon me. I hope you two weren't waiting long. He shook his head, smiling at her. Not at all. Dern was just looking at my collection, he said, as if I hadn't almost lost my life moments before. Let's get started. Did you bring her? Illyria nodded and placed two fingers in her mouth and whistled. Soft footsteps from the door caused me to turn at the new arrival. She was tall for a girl, as tall as Illyria, which put her just under six feet. Her thin black dress left her alabaster skin bare at the shoulders and hinted at the immodest with its plunging neckline, revealing the curves of her sizable bust. The girl walked with her head low, hiding her face behind a veil of her jet black hair. But at that moment, her appearance didn't matter. Her gait as she walked in is what caught my attention. The pace she walked and the set of her shoulders screamed nervousness. Her hands twined together in front of her, long slender fingers playing over each other again and again. She kept her eyes to the floor and refused to look at anyone. The girl stopped just shy for Magnus and Illyria, kneeling in supplication. You called for me, master? Her voice was heady and sweet like honey, but it cracked with anxiety. I'd heard it before, yet couldn't place where. Rise, I have a task I need of you, Magnus commanded. She bobbed her head in acknowledgement and stood, giving me my first proper look of her. She brushed her curtain of dark hair back and let it drape down her back where it rested just above her thighs. Her face was soft and kind, small chin, low rounded cheeks, and downward turned raspberry lips that were made for smiling, something this room desperately needed right now. However, the most profound aspect of her visage were her blood red eyes. I'd have taken her for a vampire, but the red didn't stop at the iris. The color bled to the whites, staining them crimson, leaving only her small pupil and a thin black circle in an ocean of red. My eyes widened when I realized what she was, and I grimaced. Our eyes met. Sorrow and regret stared back at me as she hastily looked away, though her gaze lingered on me when I turned back to Magnus. A shapeshifter, fucking perfect. Been a long time since I've seen one of her kind, but what's she doing here? Why is the shifter here? The girl flinched at my words and dropped her head once more. Magnus glanced at me with approval in his eyes. Raven's here because you will need her help for your task. Raven? Pretty name for a monster. I frowned, furrowing my brow as I tugged at my ponytail. So not only have you not told me what I'm doing, but you expect me to run a God's damned escort mission with a shifter? I resisted the urge to pace and placed my hands firmly on the cool wood of the map table. Enough games and secrecy. What's the job? Nothing terribly difficult for one as talented as you. A simple retrieval, Illyria said, her eyes smoldering with predatory delight. I barked a quick laugh. All right. What do you need me to steal for you? She smirked at my response. Such a clever boy. Magnus tilted his head from the table and chuckled. Told you, he said to Illyria before turning to me. You're correct. What I require isn't something I can purchase. The gods know I've tried. He paused, which set my teeth on edge. Magnus danced around the topic, refusing to outright tell me what I needed to know. And that worried the hell out of me. All I know is it involves the shifter, which already isn't a good sign. I don't trust them, never have. The price for their power has always been too high. Someone who's made that bargain has nothing to lose and no line they won't cross. She's dangerous. Illyria came to lean against the table next to me. She sighed and placed a finger on the map, on top of Aldrust. What we need is an emerald, rather large for its size. An emerald? What? Oh, no. 
My heart jumped up in my throat and blood pounded in my ears. You can't be thinking. Oh, by the nine kings of hell. I stared at her pale finger, at the blood-red fingernail pointing at my death. You can't be serious. That's a suicide mission for even the most experienced thieves. I'm worse than a bull in a china shop. No, I said, my voice drier than the sands of the Badlands. Magnus sighed, disappointed at my answer, but it wasn't a shock to him. He knew exactly what he was asking of me, and he understood. Illyria, on the other hand, wasn't having any of it. Her face clouded with anger at my flat-out refusal, while the shifter stood ramrod straight, not looking at anything but the floor. The tension in the air was so thick I could have drowned in it. You're just backing out? Illyria asked. Damn right I am. You know what you're asking, right? Lackmerel's heart, really? Are you a fri- Illyria began before Magnus cut her off. We know exactly what we are asking and the risks involved, which is why I won't hold it against you if you decline. You wouldn't be the first. I'm sure, I'm sure you've sent plenty to their depths after this fucking MacGuffin hunt of yours. Professionals, I'm just a thug for hire, a hammer, not a scalpel. If you've tried in the past, you obviously would have hired the best the Thieves' Guild could offer. No way I succeed where they failed. I disagree he said with conviction. Something in them had faith in me, despite everything, despite the callous words he had thrown at me an hour ago. He had told me his truth that he thought I was unfit to help, yet now he stood there with his knowing eyes that told me I could do this. I wasn't half as confident. Wipe that look off your face. I'm not doing it. But he still kept his gaze firm and unblinking, staring into my soul. Even if it could save the world? His words hit me like a truck. Would you like to help save the world? The question that started it all. The one question that brought me to this world in the first place. The question asked of me all those years ago. The question that got me to join up in this crazy experiment. A thousand years later, and I still don't have any clue as to what the point of any of this was. Why are we here in the first place? But I had better questions that needed answering right now. I thought you said we weren't in danger. We aren't, not right now. But we could be if we don't do something. You said you wanted to help. So help save this world. Save the world. You make it so nonchalant like it's just another job. Agnes shrugged. It isn't, though. No, no, it's not. What was being asked of me was beyond dangerous, and if I failed, I wouldn't live long enough to regret it. Do I want to save the world? My answer to back then was no. I'd had no desire to save the earth, only to escape my miserable existence. And now I was being asked again. Earth was beyond saving? Is Nexus any better? I didn't think so. This world was much the same as Earth. Giving humans access to magic and game mechanics didn't change us. As soon as we got our bearings, we set about conquering this world, killing and enslaving those we thought inferior to us. We drained this world dry as fast as we fucking could. This world was just as corrupt and debased as the one we left. It didn't care about me, so why should I care about it? Let someone else handle it. I'm going home. You hear that, Euroboros? I don't want any part of this madness. I turned to walk out, to walk away from all of this, half expecting Euroboros to stop me, but I met no resistance. This world doesn't matter to me. Find someone else for your suicide mission. I left them in silence. The only sound in the room was the echoes of my footfalls. I reached the large iron door that would lead me upstairs and away from this. I had the handle in my grasp when Illyria spoke. What about Eris? My body froze on its own, nothing stopping me but my heavy heart. Damn it all to hell. She knew my weakness and knew exactly how to twist it to her advantage. The worst part about it was I couldn't even be mad at her. I'd have done the same thing in her position. I didn't care about Nexus. It was just a place. Let it burn for all I cared. But I absolutely cared about Eris. 
I cared for her, for Wilson and Gill. I cared about my friends and my castle. I cared about my warm bed and my balcony view, and I couldn't enjoy any of it if I was dead. But it brought up an important question. Can I live without them? Can I live with the knowledge that the world might be in trouble and I could have done something to stop it? No. I'd rather die a hundred times than lose my family again. I huffed, knowing I was beaten. Fine, I'll hear your plan, but I'm not promising anything. If I don't have a chance of pulling it off, then I'm out. I'll find another way to save us if it comes to that. I returned to the table with a scowl, only to find Illyria looking quite smug and superior as she plied her power over me. Her demeanor left a sour taste in my mouth, and I needed to find some way to wash it out. You know that's your daughter you're leveraging as a bargaining chip, right? Her smile fell. Much better. Now let's get back to my need to be committed for even thinking about attempting this. I took a look at the map and guessed where Magnus had built his castle. I'd only seen a few glimpses of the outside world, so I had nothing but a hunch. I pointed to an open spot on the map on the far edge of the Badlands right where I guessed Magnus's castle to be. Magnus didn't smile or acknowledge I was right, but a slight intake of breath told me as much. All right, so we're about a four-day ride to Aldrist. Is this a time-sensitive job? He shook his head. Not to you, no. I've been waiting for years. A few days, give or take, won't be an issue. That's one thing sorted, but I still don't like this. There are far too many unknowns. Anything you can tell me about the job? Any information I might need? A little. I've got several teams on retainer in Copper Lowtown. Raven is my point of contact for them. So you'll have as much backup as I can provide. But unfortunately, my scrying magic doesn't work underground or indoors, so I don't have more actual intel to give you. Damn, this isn't good. I untied my hairband and ran my hands through my hair before quickly retying it. Not inspiring a ton of confidence, Magnus. Your team might work for you, but not here. I want my guild in on this. Wilson is one of the best thieves in the business. He could handle this much better than I could. Absolutely not. Your gloom knights have quite a reputation, and barring a few exceptions, like yourself, I'd sooner do it myself than allow your guild anywhere near this. Indignation flared through me. My fingernails dug into the soft wood till it hurt. I trust them with my life, yet I have to work with a team I've never met and a goddamn shifter to steal one of the most heavily guarded artifacts in the world. In a nutshell. Oh, fuck this, I said and pushed off from the table, heading back to the stairwell. Come get me when you want to stop tying my hands while asking me impossible. The door was an inch away when a scorching hand grabbed on my arm. It spun me around to face Illyria whose face was set with a stubborn determination. I jerked my arm from her grasp. I'm not your plaything. Don't put your hands on me. Illyria leaned into me, placing her hand on my shoulder this time. My first thought was to pull away again, but something about her demeanor stopped me. She got right up to my ear and whispered, If you leave now, Eris will die. What did you just say? Absolute pitch-black rage exploded from my chest in an unrelenting tide. Before I could stop myself, I picked her up by her throat and slammed her against the iron door with a resounding clang. I hadn't called it, but chitin came with my fury. Subtle scents of the forest flowed around me as it oozed over my forearm and coated my hand and fingers in jagged obsidian. I squeezed tighter, tearing into her flesh and splashing drops of crimson over my hand. It snaked from her throat to run over my arm to drip to the ground. Don't you ever fucking threaten her. She smiled at me through the pain, which only made me squeeze tighter. I wanted her dead, but first I wanted her to suffer terribly, and I split her pale skin open, drawing even more blood. Illyria's smile never wavered. She reached out a hand and tapped one finger on my chest, right over my heart. As the first time, my world shattered with pain. The chitin around my arms dissolved to black rain and slunk back under my skin. I dropped her as my strength waned and blood dripped from my eyes and nose. It spilled metal into my mouth, and I spat it out to join the growing puddle on the floor. She smirked, 
Her eyes flashed victorious as she backhanded me. I hit the ground, my cheek landing in nearly scalding blood. I tried to stand, but her foot connected with my ribs and turned me over. You don't have the first clue how to use your power, do you? What a waste of a night, she scoffed and walked over to Magnus. Would you be a dear, love? Of course. He snapped his fingers, and her wound closed as if it had never been there at all. Now go apologize to him. You provoked him on purpose. I stood up, glaring death at her. I hated her. Hated her more than I'd ever hated anyone before, in the real world or the virtual. She was nothing but the incarnation of cruelty. And I promised to see her dead before I let her anywhere near Eris. You would threaten your own daughter's life just to force me to cooperate with you. You disgust me. She barked out a laugh so cold it chilled my very bones as she wound her finger through Magnus's. I don't have to lay a finger on her, abomination. You'll kill her long before that. Her words struck cold fear in my heart, and I wanted to ignore them, storm up the stairs, and flee this place, but I couldn't, and Illyria knew it. God damn it if she's lying to me. The thick stone floor cracked with every heated step I took. My fury this time, however, burned with cool detachment. My face nearly touched hers when I spoke through clenched teeth. No more fucking games. Tell me what you mean right now. Or what? Or I tear myself to pieces to kill you, bitch. Now tell me. Illyria breathed through her nose at me, relaxing her posture to drop her cruel gaze. She stared at me with very human emotions at her face. I'm not so heartless, you know, to treat my daughter so. Could have fooled me. That garnered me a quiet chuckle. She backed up and looked at me without all the pretense, without her air of superiority. As the cruelty and darkness left her face, she looked so much younger. She actually had a kind face, a face that haunted me. I would never harm Eris, not ever. But you will, whether you want to or not. You're not entirely in control anymore. Denial was on the tip of my tongue, and I was a millisecond away from denying it with every fiber of my being. But she was right, and I couldn't say otherwise. I'm not in control of myself anymore, not since I made a deal with the aspect. But the aspect is part of the hive, it can't harm the queen. It was part of the hive. But like you, it's not entirely pure anymore. It's corrupted, and the more power it gains over you, the less it has to obey. One day, it will overpower you. I won't let it, I said. But my words were hollow. I couldn't stop it. It had already proven as much. I needed help, but Eris couldn't help me. She told me she couldn't. Illyria could, though, and she knew it. What made everything worse was that I was playing right into her hands. Whatever game she was playing with me required me to steal Lacrimal's heart. They needed it, and this was just bait to reel me in. What are you offering? She smiled, and her kindness disappeared back to her usual self. You perform this task for us, and I can rid you of your monster. There was no room for me to maneuver. She'd beaten me. I would do anything to keep Eris safe, a fact that was too dangerous for my enemies to know. I was a puppet on strings, dancing for Illyria's amusement to help achieve her and Magnus's goals. And I couldn't do anything against it. They had me, hook, line, and sinker. I wanted to scream at her, but I calmly made my way back to the table next to Magnus and Raven. I propped myself against the table and stared dead into Magnus's eyes. All right, let's steal the heart of a god. Chapter 5 Rock and a Hard Place Eris It took a few minutes to calm myself down enough to speak without crying or screaming at my own helplessness. I wiped away what few tears managed to escape and composed myself. I took the hands of the children, and it helped. 
Gill and Wilson looked at me with a mixture of concern and confusion. The others further down the table whispered about my outburst. Gill scratched his bald head and spoke first, his voice filled with worry. Eris, you all right? What's wrong? I tried to speak, but my words caught in my mouth, and I choked on them. I shook my head and tried again, but I had to force them out. Sam's gone. As soon as the words fled my mouth, my emotions threatened to spill out once more. I fought them down, held back my tears, and squeezed Tegan and Kiera's hands tight. Gil drew his brows together, tilting his head. Who's Sam? Oh, no. In my despair, I didn't realize what I'd said. The fact that I'd let slip his name only sent me further into misery. I couldn't fight the tears that spilled over my cheeks. I meant Durin. Please don't tell him I told you. He'll be angry with me. Gil chuckled and grinned, trying not to break out laughing. He looked at me with a smile so warm it made him glow. Oh, girl, have you seen the way that boy looks at you, and you at him? He is incapable of getting angry at you. He stood from the table and walked over to me. Gil leaned over and wrapped his humongous arms around me. He pressed his lips gently against the top of my head and whispered in my ear. Don't worry, your pretty head. I won't tell him. Gil stood up to look at each of the members of the guild. None of us heard anything, isn't that right? A few yes and some nods of agreement rose from the table, all except one. Harper spoke up from further down. His bright orange hair and pale forehead were all I could see of him. I heard what she said. His voice held a devious joy in it, as if he was planning something. Yumiko stood up in a flash, her crimson eyes flared with anger. Shut the fuck up, Harper. You didn't hear shit. She brushed a lock of her beautiful black hair from her cheek and looked over to me. She gave me a curt nod and a twinge of a smile before sitting back down. Thanks, you, Evelyn said, humor light in her golden eyes as she looked over. Now, what do you mean he's gone? He's not in the castle. I don't know where he is, but I know that it's very far away and that he's afraid. And how do you know this? Wilson asked from the head of the table a quizzical expression in his dark gray eyes. D and I are connected. He is my bonded, and we can feel each other, no matter how far we are. Gil whistled at that, which earned him a few chuckles from the others. Though Wilson didn't seem to fully comprehend what I meant, and I couldn't fault that. Humans don't have a frame of reference for bonding, and I'd be confused if I were in his place. So you can read each other's minds? He asked, tugging at his full beard. No, I said, shaking my head. I'd expected that question and let out a small laugh. Turin asked the same question when we first bonded, but no, we can't read each other's minds. We can only feel each other's emotions. Wilson pursed his lips as he frowned. The lines at his eyes and forehead became pronounced as he sighed in frustration. He reached across the table to grab Gil's mug of ale. Hey, Gil protested but didn't stop him. Wilson chugged the contents and tossed the wooden mug onto the table. It rolled and splashed the last dregs of ale onto the wood, but nobody complained. Everyone was too lost in their own thoughts to worry about a little spill. I don't get it, but that's not important at the moment. Durin wouldn't leave without telling anyone, and with how attached the two of you have become, he definitely wouldn't leave without a word to you. Wilson stood from the table and looked at each of us in turn. That means Durin didn't leave here voluntarily. There is no way for anyone to get in and out of here without one of us noticing, Gil shouted. That's simply not true. Wilson and I can do it quite easily, Evelyn interrupted. Gil looked from Evelyn to Wilson. I call bullshit. We spent nearly two years making sure this place couldn't be infiltrated, and you're telling me that both of you can do it without a sweat. Pretty much. Of course. Gil let out a groan and buried his face in his hand and reached for his ale only to realize once again that Wilson had drunk it. He grumbled under his breath and went to fetch another one, though as he walked past me, he flashed a kind smile to the children and me. He came back a minute later, new mug in hand, and immediately started debating with Wilson and Evelyn, with the others swiftly joining in. They got louder and louder, but nothing was getting accomplished. All right, all right, settle down, you mongrels, Wilson said, and amazingly, everyone got quiet. This line of questioning is getting us nowhere. And the answer doesn't matter right now. 
What is important is that our guild leader has been abducted to God's nowhere, and we're bickering like high schoolers. I didn't know what a high schooler was, but I had to agree on his points. Sitting here going back and forth was stupid. There was nothing more that I wanted to do than immediately rush off and scour the entire island to search for him. But I couldn't. I didn't have the first clue as to where to start, and I wasn't strong enough to go off on my own regardless. I hated it. Hated my own weakness and inability to do anything to help my bonded. But if I couldn't help Sam, I'd only be a hindrance. And even if I could, I can't leave the children by themselves. I can't help Sam. I knew he could take care of himself just fine, and I had to trust that. I had to trust that my bonded would come back to me, or I'd never get a moment's peace. We can't help the guild leader. Even if we knew who had taken him, we don't have a single lead to follow. Silence draped over the room as everyone realized how powerless we were to help him. McKenna looked up from her meal to join in. Who do we like for this? An excellent question, Wilson said. I think we all know the most likely suspect, Gil interjected. I shot my head up, and everyone was nodding in agreement. The answer was so obvious to everyone but me. Who? I nearly shouted. I can't begin to guess who it could be, so how could they? Evelyn just stared at me. Magnus, it has to be. Oh, I said. It was obvious. Durin killed quite a few of his men, so he's getting his revenge, Wilson said. Gil thumped his large hands on the table, causing me to jump. What are we going to do about it? He asked, looking at all of us. I sighed, trembling as I stood, my heart in pieces. I knew the correct answer, knew what we had to do. We do nothing. Gil's eyes went wide. What? You should be the first person busting down the gates to get him. That's exactly what I want, but what good would it do? We don't have the faintest idea of where to look. We could at least ask our informants. They could have a lead for us, Wilson said as he stroked his beard. And how well did that go for us the first time around? Might as well be a ghost with how difficult he is to pin down, Evelyn chimed in. And you can bet no one is going to spill any secrets, not to us. Magnus has too much money to throw at his problems. Wilson sighed into his hands before his head shot up and he slapped himself on the forehead. Gods were stupid. He motioned with his hand, his eyes staring at something I couldn't see. His interface, I guess? He moved his hand for a few moments before growling in anger. Of course it couldn't be that easy. What? I asked. I tried to send Durin a message, but his contact card is grayed out, Wilson said, his face distressed, full of anger. He slammed his fist into the stone above the fireplace and cursed as his skin tore and blood oozed out of the wound, which he ignored. Wilson threw his hands up, which only caused flecks of blood to fly in the air. God damn it. What the hell else are we supposed to do? Evelyn's eyes turned to me with a curious smile. I think our little queen has an idea. I had to frown at her. It's an idea, but I'm not happy about it. Gil took another drink of his ale. Well. Let's hear it. From what I see, there isn't any way to help Dee. There is too much we don't know, and it would be nothing more than a wild goose chase to try, much as that hurts me to admit. I don't see a way to help him right now, so I don't think we should even try. He can take care of himself. I believe that, but I have to do something other than stay here, or I'll be sick with worry. I'm going to take Kira and Tegan home. Evelyn perked up at this. Back to Slaughter Woods? The Sylvanus Darkwoods, yes. She smiled wide at me, her bright white teeth and golden eyes lighting up with anticipation, her whole body awash with the energy of adventure. I'm so going with you. It's been ages. I happily accepted her offer. There was no way I could go by myself, and I was about to beg the guild to help me anyway. Of course, I was going to ask you anyway. I can't go alone. I'll die by myself long before we reach the woods. Evelyn tilted in her chair to glance at the other members. Any other volunteers? You're not leaving me behind, Adam said. Of course not, little brother. Adam scoffed, but he was hiding a smile. We're twins, idiot. Wilson chimed in next. I would love to help, but with Durin gone, it falls to me to lead the guild, so I have to stay. Well, if Wilson is too afraid of the big, bad, man-eating woods, 
Then I'll go, Gil said. I beamed at him. Thank you, Gil. He just chuckled. Can't let my best friend's mean squeeze go alone. He would never forgive me. Besides, you've grown on me. I'll go too, McKenna said with a raise of her hand. Everyone looked at the little woman with surprise, to which she flushed with embarrassment. Her face turned as scarlet as her hair, but her emerald eyes held determination and excitement in them. Just think of all the unusual creatures that live in those woods. I can't miss an opportunity to study them. Her answer received a round of laughter from the entire guild. Of course, leave it to the bug freak to want to go, Harper said. Shut up, McKenna replied. Read the room, you moron, Gil said, pointing to the children and me. Oh, right. Sorry, I forgot. I ignored his words, too thankful for the other members to let anything get me down. Thank you, all of you. Wilson stood from his chair. All right, everyone go and get packed. You know the drill. Immediately, there was a bustle of activity as everyone filed out of the dining hall, leaving me and the children by ourselves. Well, best go pack myself. It was painfully apparent that I owned very little. I packed my clothes in a spare bag in Sam's room, but that was all my belongings in the world. I shouldn't have spurned Sam's attempt to give me money before. I'll probably need it. I sighed as I stared at the elegant nightstand by the bed and opened the bottom drawer. He won't care in the slightest, but why do I still feel like a thief? I opened the chest of gold and grabbed a handful, tossing it in a small canvas bag with a leather drawstring, and pocketed the money with regret. I'll pay this back, love, I promise. I stood, all my possessions in order, and went with the children to find Gil. As I reached the inner bailey, I opened the door to Gil's forge. The air was hot, and while the temperature didn't bother me, it stifled the air and hung in my lungs with every breath. Several sets of metal benches sat along the wall, and I told Tegan and Kira to sit while I went around the corner to speak to Gil. He was hunched over a grindstone in the corner of the space. The sleeves of his sapphire tunic bunched around his biceps, showing his dark, muscled forearms. Sweat dripped down his head and neck as he worked furiously to sharpen a large black axe. Sparks arced from the stone, landing harmless on the dirt floor. I called out to him, but it was drowned out by grating metal against stone. I tried again, louder, nearly shouting. Gil turned, stopping his work. Done packing already? He asked, wiping his brow. I nodded. He leaned around me to glance at the meager bundle I had slung around my back, at which he rubbed the back of his bald head and grinned. Looks like you don't have much. That won't do, won't do at all. He turned back to his work, grinding away at the axe. He spoke between grinds. Once I'm done with this bastard, I'll see about getting you more gear. He nearly jumped as if he was stung by a bee. That reminds me. I have a present for you. I'll give it to you here in a minute. He turned back to his weapon and started whistling to himself as he worked, a soft but upbeat tune to which he bobbed along, filled with energy. Gil worked for half an hour while I went and stayed with the children. When he was done, he came around the corner with a massive black axe strapped to a makeshift harness behind his back. He had a box in his hand and set it at my feet with a cheeky grin. I knelt and pried the lid off the box. It fell to the dirt with a thump, and I gazed at what Gil had been so excited to show me. A bundle of fabrics and leather stared back at me. I picked up the first piece in the box. A thick leather cloak rolled out. It was short and would stop just above my knees. As I picked up the dark brown garment, a slight jangle sounded, nearly inaudible to anyone but someone with my hearing. I turned over the cloak to see the inside was interwoven with chains. Chain mail. It's nothing fancy. I wanted to make it out of shadow steel, but I used the last of my supply working on my project. So it's not as good as I would like, but it's all dusty in steel, so it's durable and lighter than average. I also sewed a weight into the hood. It should keep from falling off your head if we have to hide your features. It's perfect. Thank you, Gil. Think nothing of it. He smiled wide. As I said, you've grown on me, and you may not realize it, but you being here has had a major effect on all of us. What do you mean? I've known Durin for a long time. In fact, I met him at probably the worst period of his life. I've seen him at his worst, and what I thought was his best until he met you. It's obvious to those who have spent so much time with him. He's different when he's with you, and it makes us happy to have some light return to his eyes. 
it dawned on me that I didn't know how Sam and Gil met. Sam called Gil his best friend, and I could see why, but I wanted to know their story. How the two of you meet? Gil laughed and tugged on his ear, but his eyes looked away from me. Um, when he tried to rob me. I snorted. Really? He nodded but looked at me sideways. You don't seem surprised by that. I'm not. I know Sam used to be a bandit. I don't like it, but it's in the past, and he's not that person anymore. True, but anyway, back to how we met, he said and sat beside me. I was working as an adventurer in the Compass Kingdom. Ran with a guild of gold-ranked players, so we started taking more dangerous quests, trying to earn as much as possible. One day, the leader comes back with a quest to guard a caravan of elven merchants delivering goods to and from Ilsaria. The pay was good, so we all agreed and teleported to Siltfall and met the merchants as they came out of the Emerald Ocean. Two days out, and things were quiet. Until they weren't, I said. Until they weren't. Caravan gets ambushed and Karen takes an arrow to her throat. She drops, and all hell breaks loose. I rush in with my axe, but it's clear that we're outnumbered. My guildmates are dropping like flies. And then out comes this kid, a wild glint in his eye, sword stained with my friend's blood. My heart spit up as he told his story, cotton in my mouth. Durin? He nodded. He fought like a devil, but you've seen what he can do. Second best swordsman I've ever seen. What happened next? He looked up and to the side, staring off into space. He stood up quickly. That'll have to wait. We've got to get a move on. Evelyn just sent me a message, and I'd rather not keep her waiting. Gil gathered up his bag, which hung next to a rack of swords. He took a look at the swords and back at me. You need a weapon. I shook my head, standing and going to rouse the children. I've got magic, so I don't need to carry a sword. Magic alone won't help you if an enemy gets close. You need something stabby, just in case. I chuckled and ruffled Tegan's hair as he tried to go back to sleep. I appreciated Gil's concern, but I'd gotten stronger at controlling my magic, and I didn't need to carry a weapon. It'll be easier to show you, I said and held out my hand. I pulled at the magic that thrummed through my veins, the magic that flowed through time and space, connecting me with my ancestors. The magic of the hive. My hands pulled with smoke and brought the scents of the Nemerian forest spilling through my fingers. The smoke dripped down my hands to cascade around my feet and pulsed with the energy of every living creature under my balawick, the descendants of the once proud hive. My children. I let them rest in their safe havens. I had no need to call them to me. I pulled much deeper into the hive mind, drowning myself in verdant smoke and the echoes of the Nemesine. I'd never dug this deep into my magic before, and I let the shades of the past whisper to me and guide me to where I thought I needed to be. A brush of my own aspect guided me to the spell I wanted. I had never used this spell before, but I tugged, and it came without resistance. The aspect wished for me to stay, immerse myself in power at my command, but I couldn't. My magic was fading quickly, and I needed to see this done. I had to prove I could do this. I brought the spell I wanted with me out of the hive mind and departed. As I came out of it, the spell activated, pulling chitin over my skin, burrowing out of every one of my pores. Black chitin wrapped itself around my arm and crawled up my hand to form to my desires. A blade of darkness, sharp enough to sever the very air in two. Throughout the process, Gil had stood there silent, dumbfounded at my display of power. As the chitin sword finished constructing itself, he whistled appreciatively. He looked at me with a sly smile on his face and wonder in his eyes. Bad ass. I've never seen magic used like that. I mean, you didn't even use script. Oh, right. Sam voiced the same thought when he first saw my magic, but I didn't see why it was all that special. Liam could use magic without spells, so why was my magic any different? The hive was ingrained into my soul. Why would I need to use an incantation to use a part of myself? Hive magic doesn't require such things. Gil laughed, his eyes still wide at the lingering smoke that drifted down my hands. Yeah, I can see that. He once more stared off into space and cursed. All right, all right. Jeez, have some patience, woman, he muttered as he turned to me. I know I promised I'd help get you ready, but I've got some last-minute preparations to handle. He opened the door and pointed at a building across from us. 
Head into the storehouse and take whatever you need. I nodded, but he'd already gone around the corner. I glanced at Tegan and Kira, who'd woken up from their nap and were now drawing in the dirt, completely disregarding how filthy their clothes were getting. I've got to go next door. Do you want to come with me or stay here? I want to finish the drawing, Kira said, her voice light, happy. Yeah, Tegan replied. Okay, but if you need anything, I'm just over there, I said and pointed to the storehouse. And don't be afraid to ask Gil for help. He's a good human, I promise. They nodded emphatically, not paying me any mind. I smiled at them. It's good to see things have changed. The old hive wasn't like this. Makes me hopeful for the future. I got up and left the heated shop. The cool breeze was soothing on my skin. It swept up small leaves and dust that swirled in little clouds as the breeze rolled through. The storehouse was easy to find, as it was the only other building besides the stables in Gill's shop. The wood old and worn, but well kept, and the thatch roof looked fresh and damp. I opened the pine door and was bathed in darkness. To my surprise, I wasn't alone in the building. Adam looked up from one of the many shelves that ran through the large building. It was filled with more items than I'd ever seen in one place. Even the store that Sam took me to paled next to this. Nearly a dozen rows of wooden shelves were stacked in a neat and orderly fashion. Potions, tools, clothes, and boxes upon boxes of things labeled in small, neat handwriting that I couldn't make out from this distance. Oh, this is a lot of stuff. I don't have the first clue what I need. Thankfully, Adam noticed my utter confusion and graciously decided to show mercy on me. What are you looking for? I smiled sheepishly at him. I haven't the faintest idea, I admitted. He laughed to himself and sat the blue vial in his hands back on the shelf and walked over to me. He looked me over, noticing my clothing, and gave me a nod of approval. I take it you're needing supplies for the trip. I nodded at him. What kind of supplies do you need? One of the strands of my hair had fallen loose, and I twirled it around my finger. I was a little embarrassed about how utterly clueless I was about so many things. I'm not sure. He smiled a tight smile and started looking around the room, using his finger to count the aisles, looking for something in particular. He shook his head and muttered to himself, almost so quiet that I couldn't hear it. No, that won't work. He rubbed his hands together and clapped. I've got it. Adam ran over to the wall and grabbed a large backpack. Well, it probably would have been average on anyone else, but it would look ridiculous on my slight frame. He seemed to notice that very thing as he grabbed for it. Definitely not. He went through the many bags that lined the wall until he found a small bag that looked like it would fit nicely. It was made of worn leather but seemed quite sturdy. He smiled, and his eyes glazed over and ran through the tightly packed aisles at random, grabbing things by the handful and stuffing them in the bag. I tried to keep up but was almost immediately lost as to what he was putting in the bag. It took him next to no time to fill up the bag completely. In less than five minutes, he returned to me and handed me the bag. I went to take it from him only for him to snatch it from my hands. I forgot something, he said in a rush, and went over to the racks of potions on the shelves. He snagged a small red vial and a blue one. On his way back, he picked up what looked like a piece of leather. You probably won't need these, as we tend to carry them in excess, but it won't hurt to have them just in case. He stuffed both vials into the leather cloth, which had pouches sewn into them. He rolled them up and tied them with a thin cord before dropping it into the bag and handed it to me once more though this time I was much more careful about grabbing for it. There you go. Should have ample supplies for the trip. I opened the bag and peeked inside. What's all in here? I asked. Adam paced back and forth, scratching at his head as if he couldn't remember what he had placed inside the pack either. Um, should be your typical adventurer's pack. Tent, pillow, and blankets, along with two weeks of dry rations and spices. Flint with steel with tinder. Dungeon delving kit. Fifty feet of tightly wound rope and two torches. Hunting kit with a knife, along with a first aid kit and one health and mana potion. Should be more than enough. I tried to cram my meager bundle of clothes in with the bag and just managed to squeeze everything in and close the bag. I hefted it on my shoulders and found it cumbersome but manageable. I had to untie my cloak to secure the bag to my back, but once I had done so and retied the cloak, I found the thick leather concealed the bag nicely and that it didn't jostle or clank when I moved around. I beamed it at him. Thank you so much. He looked at me, confused. For what? For the backpack. His eyes lit up with recognition. 
Ah, right, right, right. Of course, you're more than welcome. At that moment, the door to the storeroom opened in haste. It banged against the wall outside with a heavy thump. Evelyn stormed in. She didn't look angry, but the force of the door slam suggested she was. Her posture was one of aggravation, even if she kept it off her face. Her long silver hair whispered behind her back as she strode through the storehouse. The sharp clack of her shoes on the stone echoed, and her bright golden eyes shone with the light of the sun even in darkness. There you are. I should have known you'd... She took note of my presence, almost like an afterthought. Oh, little queen, you're here as well. She shifted her gaze to my back. You're all set to go? I nodded. I am. Good. Then let's hit the road. Adam seemed to panic a bit at the abruptness of Evelyn's arrival. Wait, I'm not ready yet. Evelyn turned and glared at her brother, her eyes not accepting Adam's excuse. You've had your bag packed five minutes after we left the dining hall, and you have all the constructs and creatures that you could possibly need or want, so don't give me that nonsense. Quit dragging your feet and get your ass in gear. Adam nodded, crestfallen, his head hanging low as he followed his sister out. What a strange family. I laughed at that. I had no room to talk. I quickly followed them back into the biting daylight. Chapter 6 The Salted Mire The four of us made our way to the stables. Since I was with them, they couldn't take a teleporter, but the others didn't seem upset at the prospect. Adam opened the door to the stables for us, and we walked inside. The others scrunched their noses at the smell of the stable. The raw stench of manure, sweat, and animal blended together with the body heat of the horses. I didn't mind the smell, though. Evelyn, Adam, and Gil immediately went to separate stalls. Each one housed a different horse. The horses recognized their owners and were happy to see them. I didn't have a horse of my own, a fact that became apparent to everyone quickly. Adam thumbed his finger back at me. Who's sharing a horse with her? I walked over to the furthest pen from the door to see a familiar face. I smiled at the obsidian horse. Why don't I ride Lacuna? Adam laughed. Don't bother. She hates everyone but Durin. I leaned over the pen to run my hand over her face and along her thick mane of midnight hair. Lacuna nuzzled against me. Good girl, I cooed. Adam's jaw dropped, which caused me to giggle. Well, I take back what I said. The others busied themselves with saddling their own horses while they went to grab Tegan and Kira. They hadn't moved an inch, still playing where I'd left them. I picked them both up, dusted off their filthy clothes, and carried them to Lacuna. I sat them on the horse and climbed up. It was difficult, but much easier than the last time I tried. Sam's not here to do it for you. Do it yourself. It took two tries, but I managed. I let both of the children ride in front of me. They were small enough to fit in the seat together comfortably. Everyone else was atop their horses. Evelyn rode a deep gray horse with a snow-white mane while Adam sat astride a beige and chocolate horse with deep brown eyes. Gil's horse was nearly as tall as Lacuna, but where Lacuna was lean and tall, Gil's horse was clearly a war horse with a mountain of muscle. It was a deep champagne with black hair that was longer than the others. They were all beautiful creatures, but none could compare to Lacuna. I reached down to stroke her hair. Is everyone ready to go? I asked. We are, but why do I feel like we're missing something? Gil's question was answered by a high-pitched scream. Wait for me! The four of us turned our heads simultaneously at the source of the commotion. A shock of bright red hair tied back in pigtails flapping in the wind greeted us as McKenna ran full sprint from the keep. Clouds of dust rose in her wake as she ran with her bag nestled in her arms. She tried to sling it on her back and keep running at the same time, but she tripped and landed in the dirt. She sat up with a groan and wiped the mass of dust from her traveling clothes. McKenna wore dark green wool pants that hugged her legs quite nicely, and a black sleeveless tunic only a tad big on her. She was maybe an inch taller than me, and even with the dirt, she was too cute. She doubled over and tried to catch her breath, gulping down huge lungfuls of air. Gil inhaled sharply and muttered to himself beside me. I forgot about her. Oh, she's so going to poison me in my sleep. His words both confused me and intrigued me at the same time, so I had to ask. I turned to face Gil. Why would she poison you? I didn't think my question was rude, but Gil shot me a heated look. His eyes pleaded with me, but the damage was done. Gilgamesh, you ass! 
You forgot me, didn't you? Gil sighed into his hand. Shit. Oh, that's why. I'm sorry, Gil. I think I just got you in trouble. I'm sorry, Kenna. I got so absorbed in my work that I tuned everything out. She huffed, and it was clear she was still angry at him, but she let slip a grin, letting him know he was forgiven. But Kenna still jabbed a finger at him. Since you have so much time for your side projects, then you have time to get Cinder saddled for me. Of course I can, Gil said, hopping off his horse and walking as fast as his legs could carry him back to the stables. He returned a few minutes later with Cinder in tow. I found her name to be appropriate. Her coat was such a bright brown that it seemed like fire alight under the eyes of the sun, and she had a mane the color of a burning wick, black, which lightened to a bright auburn as it fell down her flank. McKenna dropped her pack and ran over to her so she could run her hands over her coat. Cinder reveled in the affection, but the others weren't so accommodating with her. Evelyn hummed under her breath for a few moments, eyeing McKenna before she got tired of it and yelled at her. Quit playing with your horse and let's get a move on. We're already behind schedule. McKenna stood with a jolt. Right, sorry. She leaned to pick up her pack and closed it. She motioned with her hand and the pack vanished. McKenna expertly climbed onto Cinder, a method that seemed the most natural thing in the world. I'll have to see if I can get her to teach me that. As soon as she was in her saddle, Evelyn led the group to the castle gate, which opened from a sharp whistle from Gil. A young-looking man on top of the wall gave a sharp nod and lowered the gate for us. The heavy wooden gate thumped on the dirt road, sending more than a few clouds of dust spiraling into the wind. The whistling breeze muted the clump of hooves over the wood. It screamed past our ears like the wail of the dead, and brought with it a chill from the lake below us. I shivered, despite the beating gaze of the sun. We rode off the gate, and with a command from the gate guard, the massive gate began to rise back once more. The gloom knights all stayed for a moment to make sure that it was secure before we set out. As soon as the gate shut, Evelyn took off at speed, not bothering to look behind her to see if we were following. With a swear from Gil, the others raced to catch up with her. I followed along, but at a reduced speed, just enough to keep them inside of me while I tried to master horsemanship. Lacuna was a very smart horse, and she helped me as much as she could. It took around a couple of hours or so of riding before I got the hang of it. Lacuna would neigh and speed up whenever I was in danger of falling behind, so she made for a competent instructor. Once I had learned the basics of horseback riding, I sped up to join the rest of the party. Gil rode side by side with McKenna while Adam and Evelyn were leading the group from the front. I had no idea the direction we were heading, but at least they did. Gil turned in the saddle to look at me when I had caught up with him. Hey, look who finally joined the group. McKenna let out a snort of laughter, but spared me a smile and a look of solidarity. It's okay. Took me a few good tries before I got the hang of it, so don't let it bother you. I nodded my thanks to her. I'd spent most of my afternoon on learning the ropes of riding by myself and making sure the children weren't going to fall off, and I had neglected to notice that we had been heading in a different direction than the one Sam and I took to the Compass Kingdom. We'd passed out of the green plains and hills that surrounded the castle and were now in unfamiliar territory for me. There were still plenty of trees and green grass blowing in the wind, but it seemed like with every passing mile, there was a little less life around us. It took me quite some time to notice, but after three or four hours of mostly silent riding, I had to speak up. What's going on with the surroundings? I asked Gil. He took a look around as if he didn't understand my meaning. Oh, this is your first time being out this way, so I guess it would be a bit of a shock if you'd never been here before. He pointed northwest. About five days' ride is the South Kingdom, a brutish place, but home to the largest salt mine on Nexus. Why does that matter? Well, the mine is important for a number of reasons. There are a few other salt mines dotted around, but nothing compared to the size of this one. Gil stretched his arms out for emphasis. I'm talking hundreds upon hundreds of feet deep, with miners working around the clock to haul as much as they can. It's undeniably a profitable business, and it's made King Sykes one of the most influential of the five kings. He gestured to the land around us, a little sadness in his eyes. But that profit comes at a cost. The salt mined over the decades bled into the ground, into the water, and pretty much everywhere else. Turned the land sour. McKenna sighed in agreement with Gil. Welcome to the salted mire. Nothing but salt-soaked marshlands for a hundred miles. I sniffed at the air. It was slight, 
but hints of salt lingered in the air. Gil laughed bitterly when I pointed it out. Get used to it. It only gets worse the further we go. I frowned at his back. The smell doesn't bother me now, but if it gets more intense, I may have to cover my nose. Salt wasn't my favorite. It burned my nose in high doses, and I hoped it would at least be bearable for me. We lapsed into silence once more, though I didn't mind. It let me enjoy the greenery while I still had the chance. I daydreamed as we rode. My thoughts briefly thought of home, but mostly I thought of Sam. I couldn't banish the worry in my chest, so I wished it would leave me be. It did nothing but ache. With my heart so low, I tried to focus on other things, but the long stretches of silence left me with little to occupy my time. Gil and McKenna chatted happily to one another, and Adam and Evelyn were engrossed in some form of hushed conversation, but that left me with no one to talk to. I suppose I could have woken up Tegan and Kira, who had fallen asleep about half an hour after we left, but that would have been selfish of me. Both of them were sleeping comfortably, and I refused to ruin that just for the sake of alleviating my boredom. The others were oblivious to my agitation, and I couldn't even be mad at them. They weren't excluding me on purpose, so I just kept riding along as the green landscape slowly died to make way to wet and muggy scrubland. The ground squelched underfoot, and water pooled in the tracks we left. The air became stifling and heavy with each passing step we took. The stench of salt grew more pronounced. My already dwindling happiness was soundly ruined as we got closer to the salt-ridden marshes. I love nature, every living aspect of it, and after a thousand years of the pitch-black void, I had reveled in nature once more, but this wasn't natural. The poisoned earth sickened me to my very core. To destroy the environment for the sake of money is abhorrent. The greed of humans disgusts me. Life was more important than wealth or power. This lesson I learned the hard way. The Intomancer race paid the highest price for our greed. If humans aren't careful, they'll have to pay for their sins someday. The last of the greenery fell away to gray and so sunk my spirits. With nothing else to do, I resorted to opening up my hive mind. I kept one hand on the Kuna's reins while I let the other rest on her flank, allowing a trickle of magic to dribble out of my fingers to drift to the muddy road. I plunged myself into the small amount of life that lingered here, pockets of resistance to humanity's intrusions. There were very few spiders or ants anywhere near. They clung to the last remaining trees. Scorpions and cockroaches seemed to be the majority of the holdouts. However, the scorpions were unhappy at the salt-rich land, and yet they still survived in the heavy moisture that sunk through the ground. The cockroaches were indifferent to everything and carried on unhindered by the salt. I poured a trickle of my consciousness into them all. All my little ones going about their lives. They, too, acknowledged my presence and rejoiced for their queen. I poured as much love as I could into our connection and spent a little time with them while we rode. Having used this particular spell more than the others, it drained my mana the slowest. I still had to be careful of my mana usage, but I could handle using it better now. The more creatures I touched with the hive mind, the more mana it cost me, but as we went deeper into the mire, fewer and fewer could stay with me. I bid them farewell and was about to sever the connection when I noticed a strange bird on one of the trees. One of my little spiders watched it from its home in the deadwood. It was afraid of the bird, and though it looked right at my spider, and made no attempt to eat it. All birds were the enemy of my little ones. My goddess loves to pit her creatures against each other. So why isn't it eating the spider? I pulled more of my power into the little spider, trying to get a better look at the bird. It was clearly a bird but it wasn't like any I had ever seen before. It was large, black, and menacing. Its beak was a striking blood red. As it looked at the spider, it shifted. Its whole body flickered for a second, like a mirage. The singular bird leaked shadows, bleeding ink out into the world, before it faded for a second. It was there, then it was gone, replaced by three identical copies. Each of them looked not at each other, but out in the distance, where we happened to be riding by. The three birds shifted themselves, creating more and more of them as I watched. Dozens of them appeared before one flickered on top of the spider I was controlling and crushed it underfoot. With the death of the spider, my mind flooded back to my body in a rush and left me with a pounding migraine. 
I gasped as I came back to myself, jerking in the saddle and managing to wake up both of the children. I looked up from them to find the others looking at me with mixed emotions, from concern and confusion to bored curiosity. Gil spoke up first. What's wrong, Eris? I didn't know how to explain what had happened. It was confusing to me, and I knew I would just muddle things if I tried to explain what I saw, but I tried my best anyway. I paused over my words before I spoke. Um, I'm not entirely sure myself. I shifted in my saddle to point at the tree a few hundred feet away, where even now the birds kept shifting and multiplying. But there are some strange birds in the trees over there. Gil and McKenna laughed off my explanation, I guess thinking I was enamored over the wildlife. But Evelyn frowned, drawing a firm line with her pale lips. What do they look like? I tried to recount their appearance. Large and black, with really red beaks, and odd. They kept shifting like an illusion. Both Gil and McKenna stopped chuckling, and they turned to face me with anxiety on their faces. How many were there? McKenna asked. I told her. Just one at first. Then they multiplied. Oh, shit, Adam cursed. The others reacted in a similar manner, their relaxed attitude shattering as they drew arms and climbed down off their horses. I was utterly lost at this point, but I stopped Lacuna and followed suit, dropping to the ground and sinking about a foot into the swamp. The mud and wet earth slid between my toes and covered my feet. While I had no trouble navigating through the muck, the others were hobbling and taking concerted steps. I went over to Gil, who seemed to be having some difficulty standing upright on the uneven and soft road. What is going on? I asked him. He looked off in the distance, his face solemn and firm. We've been marked. Am I supposed to know what that means? What? I asked. Evelyn inclined her head to the tree line, where over a hundred of the birds perched, staring us down. Shades! Adam barked a laugh. It's about to get exciting. As if by command, the flock of shades rose in unison from the trees, taking to the skies and unleashing a horrendous caw. It sent shivers of fear through me and made me want to do nothing but flee and never look back. Their echo reverberated through my skull, and all I wanted to do was curl into a ball from the pain. Gil reached me and hauled me to my feet. Stand firm. Don't let their mind games affect you. It'll get worse if you don't fight it. Here they come! McKenna shouted. They sent another debilitating screech at us, and a wave of death descended on us. Hundreds of shades swept from the trees to assault us, and with every passing moment, more appeared. Each of them dripped shadows like ink from a giant squid in the water. They blotted out the sky with their shifting darkness, and as they dove down, I jumped out of the way, finding ample footing through the damp muck. Tegan, Kira, hide. I'll find you when this is over, I yelled at them. Without a second's hesitation, they bolted from Lacuna and took off into the marsh, sprinting through the reeds out of sight. I regrouped with the guild, who were having a much worse time navigating in the sticky marsh, their feet sunk deep into the soft earth. Even though they were having difficulty moving, they were far more deadly than I. Each time the birds swooped down to attempt to claw us apart, they died. Gil swung his glowing axe and slaughtered dozens with ease. Each time his giant black axe struck, sparks flew out and set the birds alight. With a horrendous screech, they burst into flames before withering and turning to shadows. Even though I was having an easier time moving, I still wasn't faster than the shades. They showed an animalistic cunning, catching me off guard and raking their sharp claws over my exposed arms. I cried out as sharp talons ripped through my skin. Blood ran from the deep gashes to drop down my arm. By the void, that burns. Their claws left shadows to stick to my wound, eating away at my exposed blood. I need to protect myself. I couldn't enter the hive mind in the heat of battle, but I accessed the two spells I had on the tip of my tongue, chitin armor and chitin sword. More and more of them kept coming, and the five of us had separated in the wetlands. Quick, regroup in the trees, Evelyn shouted and headed into the largest mass of birds. Something happened to her. A translucent shimmer formed just off her skin. As if controlled by a gust of wind, it blew out in a circle around her. As soon as it touched one of the birds, they simply dissolved, cracking and turning to black mist as they died by the hundreds, enough to give us an opening to run to the copse of dead trees a couple dozen yards in front of us. What are you waiting for? Get moving! Gil followed through the hole Evelyn made for us. 
I took off after the giant, quickly gaining ground on both of the gloom knights as I ran through the mud. I kept pace with Evelyn as we reached the trees. A random dead branch from a tree snagged in my cloak, but didn't tear through as we dove behind cover. It was a short run, but I was panting as if I had run for miles. My nerves screamed at me, and my beating heart drowned out the world around me. The shades circled overhead, screeching in unison. Fear welled in my stomach and my hands shook, and I fought the desire to turn and run, to escape. Evelyn smiled at me, even though her eyes watched the rest of the guild and the incoming swarm. You can move, I'll give you that. Now let's see how you fight. I nodded breathlessly and called upon my magic. Evelyn's eyes rose by a fraction as green smoke flowed from my hands and black chitin appeared from my skin. I shrugged off my backpack and cloak before the sharp chitin tore through the leather. It crawled up my skin in seconds and covered me from head to toe. As the chitin slithered over my head, I lost the ability to breathe until it hardened and allowed two small slits under my nose. Chitin didn't have a smell itself, but it carried with it the scent of the forest, and when it formed over my eyes, my vision swirled with green light. In the bright day it faded, but in the low light of the salt-soaked mire, everything was clear as day. Coating my entire body with chitin took a massive amount of mana, and when I used it in tandem with chitin's sword, my limited mana pool dropped even lower. With two simple spells, I was down to less than half, which fell by the minute as I kept both spells going. I don't have enough to last five minutes. By the void, I'm weak. I'd gained a little bit of control over my magic while traveling with Sam, but I would still be considered a novice when compared to any other member of the hive. Even the Apocritans and Manitarians could use more magic than what I'm able to muster right now. And I'm supposed to be the hive queen. The other races would have laughed me right off the throne. McKenna lagged behind Gil as they charged over the soggy ground. The squelching mud was overshadowed by the cacophonous sound of hundreds of feathers flapping in unison. The shades gained on the pair quickly. It was apparent that they wouldn't reach the tree line before the birds were on them. McKenna stopped, drew nearly a dozen long needles from seemingly out of nowhere, each of them tipped with a glossy dark liquid. With pinpoint accuracy, she flung her hands in the air, and each needle pierced through a shade, killing them instantly. What was strange was one of the ones she hit was higher than the others and when it died, nearly a dozen others followed it in death, ones she hadn't touched. Go for the puppeteers. They're the controllers, Evelyn shouted next to me. Yeah, we know. But how the hell are we supposed to tell them apart? Gil asked, swinging his axe. The shades attacked en masse, but they couldn't do more than superficial wounds as Gil and McKenna were both wearing thick leather armor that held up to the bird's sharp beaks and claws. Gil had donned a full-faced helmet, and McKenna pulled her hood taut over her head, leaving the shades no way to inflict more than scratches. As before, they showed more intelligence than any bird should have, and when they couldn't swarm their prey, they cawed in unison a grating shriek that sent panic through my body. I wanted to run screaming, but I held my ground and tried to fight through their tricks. The others were far less affected by the shade shout than I was, and Evelyn ran from the trees to join her friends. Wait for me! I called and ran after her, not knowing what I was going to contribute to the fight. When I reached Gil and McKenna, the shades changed. In a fraction of a second, they backed into the sky and shifted again, but this time they folded back into one another, forming five large rolling shadows suspended in the air. What are they doing? I asked. Morphing. Shades can take the shape of anything they've seen before. I expect they realized a flock of birds wasn't getting the job done, Gil said. What are they going to change into? I asked as we all waited for the shadows to take shape. Before anyone could respond, five humanoid shapes dropped from the endless darkness to attack us, and the shadows overhead disappeared to allow some of the muted sunlight to stream in from the overcast. Each of the five shades looked human. In fact, they looked exactly like the five of us, albeit without any concrete facial features, just more twisting shadows. Without a word, we began fighting our doppelgangers. My shade swung at me with the facsimile of my chitin sword, but it wasn't made of actual chitin, so when I brought my sword up to block, it bit into my rival's shadow blade. It hissed at me and let out a cry of pain. Is it using its own body as a weapon? The answer didn't matter as I pressed forward, stabbing and slashing with all the finesse of a child wielding a toy. I knew I lacked skill with the sword, but I didn't need to be a master to hit a single target. My sword wouldn't cut through the shades, but with each landed attack, the shades screamed, and droplets of shadow trickled to the ground. 
For all the intelligence of the creature, it had no skill with the sword, but still landed a couple of good hits. They glanced off my armor, causing only superficial damage and chipping. At least it can't get through my armor. I'm safe as long as I can keep it up. It had only been a handful of minutes since I cast them, but already both spells were wearing me out. Sweat beaded on my forehead, and my arms grew heavy with each attack I made. If its weapon can't get through my armor, I don't even need my sword. I can just hold it off while the others deal with theirs. The rest of the Gloom Knights had a much better time in dealing with their shades. Evelyn was the first to destroy hers. All she had to do was touch the thing, and it disintegrated. Once hers was dead, she just stood back and watched, even though her friends were in danger. Adam tossed a single crystal onto the ground and easily ducked his shadow's attack. He spoke two words, and before the shade could react, a massive black and silver wolf appeared from the crystal and ate half of the darkness with a single bite. The rest of its lifeless body felled and scattered in the wind. With a laugh, Adam held out his hand, and the gigantic bane wolf disappeared back into its prison. The crystal snapped back into his hand, and he pocketed it to go and speak to Evelyn. Gill and McKenna fought theirs just out of my field of view, but I couldn't take my eyes off my own foe to see how they fared. Wind whistled behind me as Gil struck with his axe, and the marsh filled with the acrid scent of fire. I tuned out Gil and focused on my foe. I let the magic holding chitin sword fade. My exhaustion waned once the drain on my mana eased up, and I was able to catch the mimic sword in my hand. I pushed it aside and let it slide off harmlessly off my arm. I brought my fist up and tried to punch the thing's face, but when I struck, my hand sank in like I was wading through ooze. I eventually pushed through to something very spongy at the center of the shade's head, but my punch didn't do anything besides make it angry. It warbled a screech and swung up my head. I was slow to block, and it landed hard against my temple, sending me to my knees. My hands sunk into the muck as I steadied myself, and Gil shouted painfully loud to my ringing ears, We have to help her! I risked a glance, and both Gil and McKenna had defeated their adversaries. I was the only one still fighting. Gil had his axe and was tense panicked as if he were about to charge in. Leave her be, blacksmith. I want to see what the little queen is made of, Evelyn said. Gil grumbled and lowered his weapon. A tear ripped into my heart when Gil stepped back, leaving me to fight alone. I didn't like it, but I understood. I'm the weak one here. I'm holding everyone back just by being in their presence. I need to defend myself, and I can't rely on everyone else for the rest of my life. I attacked the shade recklessly, knowing I was safe from harm while I had my armor up, but I was running out of time. Something solid was in its head, so that's what I aimed for. I tackled the shade to the ground, it was much lighter than I expected, and I hit it with all of my strength. I took my hands and willed the chitin to form cloths. It shifted at my command, but that one change dropped me to less than 10% of my remaining mana. I reached my clawed hands into its head and dug into the soft substance at the center. The shade buckled and recoiled in agony as I did, releasing such a terrible scream that I thought my head was about to split in two. I bit down, gritting my teeth, and dug in deeper. I used the pain and my anger at my own helplessness to fuel my strength. I gripped the center in both hands and pulled it apart as quickly as I could. It came with minimal resistance, tearing in half under my fingers, and I ripped until it was broken. As I pulled it free of the massive shadows, the shade stopped screaming. It stopped doing anything and dissolved into nothingness, leaving only a squishy, pale yellow ball of sponge in my hands. I dropped it as a rush of adrenaline surged through my bones, invigorating me and bringing a warm strength to my aching joints. Hey, I leveled up. Chapter 7 Complications Samson it had been most of a year since I'd last been to Aldrest, and even in the span of a year, things could have changed drastically. Because the kingdom itself resided far below ground, along with the constant mining going on, the layout changed every so often to reduce the risk of cave-ins and rockfalls. I can't rely upon my previous knowledge of the layout, so we're going in blind. I had a few friends living in the Dwarven Kingdom, and the thought of what we were planning left a sour taste in my mouth. I was about to waltz in and steal their most prized possession, and I was starting with absolutely zero workable intelligence. My first thought was to call up Wilson or Evelyn, 
they'd be much better suited to planning a heist than I ever could, but my contacts in my interface were grayed out. I couldn't send or receive any messages. When I asked Magnus about it, he made a corny joke. My castle is at a dead zone. No cell service, he chortled. Funny, I said, and turned back to the map. The trip to Aldrust would take a little under four days by horse. I wanted just to teleport, but since I had to bring the shifter with me, I couldn't do that. And Magnus flat out denied me when I asked to go alone. Why? I can do this alone and I don't need her help. Raven tensed at my words, lowering her gaze as she turned away from us. I didn't care that I'd hurt her feelings. I didn't want to tag along on this job. Magnus shook his head. I disagree. Raven will prove herself a valuable tool for you. She's only going to slow me down. I can teleport and be there in Aldrust in under an hour. By horse, it will take at least three days. Magnus held his hand and stared me down, not willing to even entertain the idea. She's going with you, if for nothing else than to help ensure a smooth delivery. Ah, it clicked why he wanted her along. She's there to watch me as much as she's watching my back. Magnus doesn't trust that I won't abscond with Lacrimal's heart if I do manage to pull the job off. I wasn't getting my way in this, and I relented. There was too much at stake for me to just back out, no matter how distasteful I found the prospect of working with a shapeshifter. Fine. You win. Magnus acknowledged his victory with a subtle nod of his head and the beginnings of a smile. Your contact in Aldrest will have a better idea of what awaits you when you get there, but feel free to take anything you might need from my armory. That was very generous of him, but outfitting me was only common sense. Lacrimal's heart was easily more valuable than any one item here, and since I sorely lacked in equipment, I happily took him up on his offer, though I had to ask one specific question. Even the Hellsword? He grimaced but nodded. If you can use it, though. That specific sword was designed for a magic user, not a knight. Why would a mage need a sword? Unless you specialized as a battle mage, physical weapons are almost useless to pure casters. I walked over to the rack, anticipation building. I wanted the sword, wanted to wield it. My hand reached out as if it were being pulled by a string to grasp the hilt of the fiery blade. It glowed with delight at the thought of being used, but the moment my hand touched the hilt, it shocked me, sending my hand away from it. Ow! Damn, that stings. Magnus and Illyria both laughed from the far side of the room, chuckling over my pain. Even Raven let out a quick snort of humor, which didn't endear herself to me in the slightest. I warned you, Magnus said. A notification appeared in my interface. Warning. Stat requirements unmet. Stats required. Strength 90 met. Constitution 80 met. Wisdom 75 unmet. Damn it. Oh well. I fanned my hand, trying to dispel some of the pain and numbness. I'd forgotten how much that hurt. With that sword out of the question, I went through the many racks of swords, searching for one that would be appropriate for me. I discounted the heavier and large claymores and such to focus on the lighter weapons and went down the line, picking them up one at a time and testing them out. A few were nicely balanced and felt right in my hands but were completely ostentatious, adorned with gold, silver, and numerous gems. I nearly picked the one that was just like my own sword, but I hesitated. It was nice, but it was built for a class similar to Blademaster, something I wasn't any longer. So I tried to find one better suited to my Hive Knight class. Only a few swords remained when I found the best choice. It was a hand and a half sword, and a little flashier than I was used to, but not overly so. It was slightly shorter than a normal longsword, the blade wide and thick, and it sported a solid heft to it that I liked. The blade was shadow steel and a stark black. The handle was polished dracorn, and the smooth gray accented the black of the blade and the silver crossguard nicely. Etched into the silver were the branches of a tree, and in the flickering light, they came alive as if blown about in a breeze. The final and most extravagant aspect of the sword was the pummel, which was also silver and had an emerald the size of my eye set into the hilt. I found the stones symbolic of the job I was about to undertake and very fitting. I rubbed the gem for good luck and strapped the sword to my belt. The sheath was a pure black with small green lines spreading out like the veins of a leaf. Sword down, next is armor. I went to the far side and perused the armor sets. 
As soon as I took a good look, I immediately found the section I wanted, the medium sets. These were all made with a mixture of leather and chainmail, but the chest and back plates were crafted from shadow steel plates. I chose one of the darker ones, black wyvern leather with thick shadow steel plating. Flipping over the chest piece revealed something startling. It was backed with thin leather along with chainmail, but as I ran my fingers over the blackened chain, I found it wasn't standard steel, it was shadow steel. That's something you don't see every day. I equipped it and moved around a bit to get the feel of the new weight. It's not that noticeable, but I'm slower. The weight is heavier than I'm used to. That could prove fatal if I don't watch it. But the main ideal feature of my newest equipment was that, despite its heaviness, there was no discernible sound as I moved around. Every single slab of metal was separated from the rest. The only sound was from the leather rubbing against itself. But with a little oil in those trouble spots, I'd be virtually silent. Perfect for a heist. Speaking of, if I'm pulling a heist, I'll need some specialized tools. I'd probably need a full burglar's kit. And since I'd be deep underground, it wouldn't hurt to have a dungeon delving kit, just to be on the safe side. A dull pain throbbed through my skull at the thought of everything I might need for this. My go-to was usually carry more than I could possibly need. Overkill has never failed me before. Before I left, I went through the potions. The entire bottom shelves were stacked with health and mana potions, hundreds of them in neat rows. I took ten of each. Then I went through and grabbed everything I could even think I might need for such a quest. Potion of the Revenant went into my inventory, along with a light step potion, wraith sight, and an invisibility potion. All the ones I might need for this job. I had turned a head out of the room when a thought struck me, and I went back to search the shelves for one more potion. Gotcha, I said as I snagged the recovery potion that was hidden behind a few dragon's bane drafts. Potion secure, I headed for the door. Magnus and the others had already left the war room, leaving me alone with literal millions in gold. Is this another test, or am I reading too much into it? Regardless, my inventory could only store so much, and I couldn't carry away even 5% of the items in this room. I only took the items I absolutely thought I needed, though I would still need supplies and provisions. Magnus would know where I could acquire them. The emptiness of the room amplified the echo of my footsteps on the stone. With the absence of people, the bubbling green mage lights dotted around sent chills up my spine. I ignored the urge to look at them and fled the room. I thrust open the door and almost ran headlong into Jasmine. Ah, uh, uh, sorry, Jasmine, I wasn't expecting you. She stepped back, her face a little flushed, but she smiled at me. That's okay. I was sent to bring you upstairs when you were finished with your preparations down here. She brushed a lock of auburn from her face. I take it. You're done? I nodded to her, suddenly confused. She was furious with me this morning. Why is she being so nice now? Yeah, I'm done here, though I still need a few things for the trip. Of course. Mother is preparing your supplies as we speak. Good, I'm getting tired of this place. I went up the stairs ahead of Jasmine, but it seemed she was determined to keep up with me. I slowed my pace and let her walk side by side with me. I was fine with the silence, but she kept prodding me for conversation. Are you leaving today? Soon as our supplies are ready. Are you coming back? Probably. She pouted at my terse responses and hunched her shoulders, but stuck close to me as we climbed the many stone steps, our labored breathing and footsteps breaking the silence. She kept brushing up against me. Her fingers lingered on the back of my hand. I sighed, but didn't stop her for myriad reasons. I wasn't going to reciprocate her feelings, but I also didn't feel like shattering them either. Though I poured cold water on her this morning, most girls would have gotten the hint. I tried to get my bearings and see if I remembered the way to the throne room when Jasmine locked the door to the stairwell. The lock engaged with a loud clunk. I turned as Jasmine stowed a large brass key into the folds of her uniform, her face slightly flushed from the climb. She noticed me watching her and flashed me a wicked grin, pulling her top down in the process to give me a peek at her chest. Sweat beaded up on her rich skin, glistening in the lambent light before sliding down between the curves of her breasts. I turned away quickly, my face beat red. Great, you didn't say anything, and now look where you're at. Stupid, stupid, stupid. While I berated myself for feeding into her antics, Jasmine led me through the halls, practically bouncing with every step. I tried to be upset, 
but it was hard when she seemed genuinely happy. But I was thankful when we reached our destination. Jasmine muttered under her breath, and her mood dropped as she unlatched herself from me and opened the door. After you, my lord, she said with a wink. Wouldn't have it any other way. She smiled and followed after me. The throne room was busier than I had seen it before. Magnus was, of course, sitting on his throne with a bemused expression playing across his face as he talked in muted tones with Illyria, who laughed at something I couldn't hear. Raven was on the opposite side of the throne, looking as meek and pathetic as she had in the war room. Magnolia was close at hand to her master, ready to answer any command he might need. She noticed how close Jasmine was to me, and even though we weren't touching at all, she just knew something was up and gave me a knowing smile and a nod. I tried to ignore everyone and focus on getting everything ready. As I approached the throne, I inclined my head respectfully to Magnus. Thank you for the weapon and armor. They are spectacular. He grinned wide at me, his eyes glowing as he took me in. Of course, friend, and might I say, they suit you. It's good to see them used again. I've kept them locked away for far too long. Is there anything else you require? Just some supplies for the trip and the equipment needed to complete the job. Right. Magnolia, if you would be so kind. She bowed low. Right away, master. Magnolia walked past me to leave the room, and Jasmine followed after her, both of them whispering to each other as soon as they reached the door. When they disappeared from view, I returned my attention to Magnus, who looked at me strangely, conflicting emotions in his eyes. There is just one final thing you must do before you set out. A necessity, I'm afraid. And what's that? I asked. I admit he had me curious, though the tension on his face suggested I wouldn't like what was about to come. He shifted his eyes to Raven, and an unspoken conversation went on between the two of them. It seemed Raven was as apprehensive of whatever it was, but she could not win against Magnus's wishes, and nodded her head slowly. She moved from the throne, stepping closer to me, her head low, and even though I was staring directly at her, she refused to meet my eyes. Raven will be important in ensuring the successful retrieval of the heart, but... Her going with you presents some difficulties. This again. I don't want her with me in the first place. Then don't send her. I'll be fine on my own. I all but spat the words out, and Raven sniffed, looking away. I disagree. I tried to keep the frustrations off my face, but the sigh of annoyance was audible, and Deliria decided to push my buttons. What's the matter, little knight? Is she not to your liking? Not pretty enough for you. The harsh retort of laughter that fled from my lips cracked like a whip. I could give a damn about her appearance. Nothing good ever comes from working with shifters. Well, I'm afraid you've little choice in the matter. She's going with you, much as you find the idea distasteful, Magnus said. An understatement to be sure, but I was tired of arguing a point that I wasn't going to win so I resigned myself to the fact that I'd be working with Raven and put the matter out of my mind, or I tried to, but Magnus's next words left me speechless. In order to have her accompany you, she will need to be bonded to you. What? I withdrew from Raven on principle, away from the insanity. Hell no. Magnus didn't seem thrilled by the idea either, but I was livid. No way in hell was I going to let yet another person bind themselves to me, especially a shifter. I'd accepted being bonded with Eris, accepted being her mate. I'd grown to love her, and for the most part, it had been wonderful. However, I wasn't okay with binding my soul together with someone I'd just met just for the sake of a job. I'm afraid it's necessary. Why? I shouted. Why do I even need her along in the first place? Give me one benefit to bringing her with me. Magnus stood from his throne and walked down the steps to stand beside me. It'll be faster to show you. Let's step back, shall we? I didn't follow him mentally, but I did so physically, stepping about six or seven feet back and waiting for something to happen. If you would show him, Magnus asked. She bowed her head, her bloodied eyes in pain as a ruffling of feathers rose from out of nowhere. Two large wings sprouted from her back like the wings of an angel or a demon, nearly a dozen feet long and as black as Alira's heart. Hundreds of feathers rained to the stone as she swept her wings in front of and over her head. 
the feathers floated down lazily and completely obscured her from my sight. When the last feather touched the floor, Raven was gone, replaced by her namesake. Standing before me was a monstrous black raven, easily fifteen feet long and terrifying. Raven stared at me with sharp blood-red eyes that held a startling intellect. She snapped her beak at me. It was as black as her feathers and caused me to jump back out of reflex. Holy big bird, I shouted and stumbled over my feet. Magnus and O'Leary snickered at my expense while Raven stepped forward. Sunlight dripped down her glossy feathers as she walked next to one of the stained glass windows. As she got closer, I noticed the massive talons capped at the end of her legs. By the nine kings of hell, that's huge. I didn't think shifters could grow to that size. Seeing Raven shift also clarified her purpose in all this. I'm not riding a horse to Aldrust, am I? Magnus flashed a devious smile at me. Nope. Well, shit. Though as I gazed at Raven's admittedly majestic form, my heart fluttered at the prospect of flying. For all the fantastical elements of the game world, flying still eluded most of us. Well, it'll be a new experience at least. It overwrote my prejudices about partnering with the shifter just enough that I got lost in my daydream of flight and didn't notice as Magnus walked up next to me, grabbed my wrist, and drew a thin dagger across it. Son of a bitch! I hissed as blood welled the snake down my hand. My health bar dipped by a fraction to register the damage I'd taken. What the hell, Magnus? He didn't answer, just held my bloody arm out to the giant bird and true fear crawled up from the pit of my subconscious as I stared into Raven's eyes. They sparked as she shifted back to her human form. Raven shook herself and let her feathers fall out once more. When they disappeared, Raven the human stood and walked over to us. She scrunched up her face at the sight of my blood, but, and after some prodding from Magnus, placed my bleeding wrist to her mouth and bit down. I sucked in a breath and fought back a grimace. Raven downed several large mouthfuls of blood before licking her lips over my flesh. With a look of disgust, she wiped the specks of my blood from her lips and held out her wrist to Magnus. The aspect, though silent, made its desire known. It hungered for her blood, and its chill pulsed faster in my veins. My mouth salivated without my consent at the thought of biting into her flesh. I had to squeeze my eyes hard and will the aspect back into my heart before I lost control and did something I'd regret. There was no way I could let Magnus spill her blood. The aspect was too strong already, and it wanted blood. Giving it what it wanted was something that seemed like a demonstrably bad idea. The blade was halfway to her wrist when I stopped him. Stop, I shouted, trying to keep from having to ingest her blood. I don't like the idea of bonding with her, but if it has to happen... I refuse for it to be by consuming her blood. I don't want to experience her memories in the Nemesine. I didn't want to see the kind of life she'd led. But more than that, I didn't want to give the bastard in my heart an inch. Though the only other option available to me left a sickening feeling in my stomach. It's better than drinking her blood, but ye gods, I don't want to do it. Magnus looked at me with a quizzical expression, the knife hanging in midair. Durin, why am I stopping? This has to be done. Why? Why can't she just go with me? Why do I have to bind myself to her? Agnes stowed the knife back into his tunic and spoke. Her contract was that she would become mine. She can't leave my side for more than three days without suffering excruciating pain that would render her useless to you. That's a pretty ruthless contract, I said. He shrugged nonchalantly. The Alice isn't someone you enter into a bargain with lightly. He had a fair point, and it was the reason I distrusted shifters. Never make a deal with the queen of the fairies. She'll find a way to screw you over every time. Only the damned or the desperate chose to make that deal. Still, contract or not, I didn't want to be a part of this. Here goes one more futile attempt. Any chance I can get you to say you'll let me go alone? None. Damn it all to hell, but I had to try, I said, marching over to Raven. Don't you need the knife? Magnus asked. Hopefully not, I said as I reached her. She shrank under my harsh glare, and I eased off a bit. She looked ready to bolt from the room at any second, and as much as I didn't care for her kind, I needed her acceptance. Look, I whispered, I really don't want to drink your blood. 
it would be problematic for a number of reasons. There is another option, but it's not really a better one. Raven nodded, waiting for me to continue. I found that it doesn't always have to be blood that is required to bond. Saliva works just as well, but that would mean we would have to kiss. I held up a hand. I don't particularly like either option, but since it seems I can't get out of this, I'll leave the choice up to you. Her eyes widened as her lips parted just so. You would give me the choice? She asked softly. I nodded. She paused over the choice for what seemed like ages. When she spoke again, it was nothing more than a whisper. Kiss. All right. It's better than feeding the aspect, at any rate. Before my nerve could remind me what an awful idea this was, I grabbed the nape of her neck and kissed her. It was hardly a kiss. As soon as our lips touched, I brought my tongue into her mouth so our saliva could mix. For half a minute, I swirled around her mouth with no response, and I was about to resign myself to tasting her blood when a force tugged on my heart. At first, it was only the black magic side of my heart being drawn out, but it was no longer just one side of magic in my heart, and both came at the call. It flowed through my veins, searching for an egress, the gash in my wrist. An itch nagged at my arm before tendrils of thin smoke drifted out from my bloody wrist. I pulled away from our kiss as the smoke gathered around my arm and slithered around to enter Raven's mouth. She jerked as it flowed down her throat and into her lungs. She stopped breathing as it seeped into her bloodstream. She twitched and wheezed when she started breathing again, doubling over and nearly falling to the stone floor. I caught her and lowered her to ground before stepping away while my magic tore through her body. She shuddered and groaned softly in pain but did not cry out. For several long moments, her body was racked with spasms of pain before finally settling. I knew it when it stopped. Some twitch in the back of my head told me when we'd bonded. Different than mine and Eris's bond, but similar enough. All in all, the entire encounter took less than three minutes but left me mentally drained. I was itching to leave. The gray stone walls felt claustrophobic. I scratched at my beard and left Raven to get up on her own. All right, Magnus. I did what you asked. Now I'm ready to leave. I don't want to spend another minute here. He nodded. I understand. Magnus held up his hand and flicked his fingers to the side a few times. Here you go. Quest. Steal Lacrimal's heart. Type unique, difficulty 5, reward 48,000 EXP. I do apologize for demanding it of you, but rest assured, I can undo the bonding if the job gets done, Magnus said after I accepted the quest. If? I said when, didn't I? Doesn't matter, I said turning to leave through the same door Magnolia went through a few minutes prior. I'll bring you your accursed rock. The Gloom Knights always get the job done. Safe travels, Magnus said, smiling. I was thankful I didn't have to speak to Illyria as I left. I wanted nothing more to do with either of the two lords of this castle. I had been cooped up inside for too long, and already the outside world beckoned. I rounded the corner just as Magnolia came into view. She spotted me and walked over large canvas pack in hand. I was looking for you, Lord. I was given clear instructions on what needed to go in, so you should find everything to your liking. I took the pack and dropped it in my inventory. Thank you, Magnolia. You've been very kind to me. She smiled. It's no trouble, my Lord. Though, I do apologize for my daughter's behavior. She's been spending too much time with Illyria, and I fear it's had an effect on her personality. Jasmine has also never been around someone her own age before. I think that has caused her to become a little enamored with you. I laughed and waved her off. Jasmine's a nice girl, but Illyria could corrupt even the gods with that attitude of hers. I like your daughter, but not in that way. I should have been more direct with her. That was a blunder on my part. Magnolia shook her head. Don't worry. I'll talk to her about it, make her understand. But I must truly thank you for your kindness towards her. She's never had friends before. I'm grateful. With those parting words, she bowed and showed me to the exit. Magnolia led me up to the ramparts of the castle. Once outside, the burning heat immediately brought budding beads of sweat to my skin, 
only to be swept away by a stiff, salty breeze blowing in from the east. I couldn't see the ocean from the castle, but the wind was unmistakable, and it all but confirmed that I was right about my assessment of the castle's location. In the distance, the sands of the Badlands loomed. Swirling sand dunes extended as far as I could see. Waves of heat rose from the baking surface. On the furthest wall of the castle rose a tower ringed by parapets. Jasmine was at the top already, and we headed over. We were at the highest point in the castle, and I still couldn't see out past the dunes. The sun scorched mercilessly overhead, and even with the soft breeze, standing around wasn't doing any good. What's taking Raven so long? Jasmine smiled at me, her hair drifting in the breeze as she reached into her uniform and pulled a long emerald green cloth from her uniform. I have a gift for you. She held it out to me, and I took it, confused. Is it a scarf? No, too long. Jasmine smiled at my obvious confusion. It's a sword sash. It can be worn horizontally or across your chest, whichever you prefer. Thank you, Jasmine. I'll see you around, I said, removing my sword and wrapping the green cloth around my waist. After tying it, my new sword slid into the hole by my belt nicely, and the rich green accented the black of my armor well, even if it was a bit too ostentatious for my liking. Till we meet again. She bowed and departed with her mother, sparing me a glance just before she went back inside. She really is a nice girl, but that's not going to end well for me. Before long, Raven joined me on the tower. It was just the two of us now, and I wanted to set some ground rules. I turned to her. I've made my feelings on you accompanying me abundantly clear. I don't trust you, but if we are going to be working together, I want to make sure you understand. You do what I say when I say no debates, no discussions. Do you understand? She nodded, bobbing her head up and down rapid fire. Yes, master. Yeah, no, don't call me that. That's rule two. I'm nobody's master. Okay, then what would you like me to call you? My name, if you must. Now let's get going, we're burning daylight. Without further conversation, Raven backed up and shifted, going into her giant bird form. Her voice came from nowhere, even though her beak remained closed. Climb on, Durin, and please be gentle. My feathers break easily. Grumbling, I did as she asked and hopped on as gently as I could. Her feathers were incredibly soft under my hands and warm to the touch. It was like the world's softest down comforter. And I, indivertibly, spoke aloud. These feathers feel amazing, I said before I could stop myself. That's kind of you to say, Raven said. Whatever, let's just go. Raven knelt and launched herself in the air so fast I had to grab handfuls of her feathers just to keep myself from falling off. She soared high into the sky before opening her wings and leveling out to glide forward. I looked back to see the castle, already well behind us on the cliff face. The speed Raven at which flew rapidly turned the large castle into a dot on the horizon behind us. The air was cold despite the heat as we climbed higher. Wind whipped past us as we flew through the air. It took more than a few minutes for my heart rate to settle and get used to the sensation of flying, but when I did, I laughed aloud as the sands of the Badlands raced past at frightening speed. I lowered my head and clung to Raven's warm feathers and found a nice balance between the chilled wind and the desert's heat. The Badlands were nothing but vast stretches of sand, easily hundreds of miles wide, so I settled in for looking at the same hues of brown for a while, and we flew in silence for a few hours. A shrill tone interrupted my daydreaming. A name flashed across my interface. Miguel. Problem with the gloom shrooms? He laughed, breathing heavily. <laughs> Not at all. Delivery went smoothly, dropped off the payment. Then what do you need? I have a job for... Click. I closed my interface and stared at the ocean in the distance. By the third hour, I was getting sore and tight from staying in one position for so long, and without a proper harness to sit on, my ass was killing me. I wanted to stop and rest for a few moments, but wasn't about to complain in front of the shifter. I just about resigned myself to enduring the aches that wormed into my muscles when we passed low over the wastes. I could make out dozens of small dots below us, walking in disorganized chaos, or shambling as it were. Rumors and quite a large horde of them, too. I was itching to do anything other than continue riding at the moment, and a delicious thought came over me. Raven, slow up and circle back. Of course, but why? 
don't worry about it, just do it. She slowed down considerably and dipped low over the dunes, kicking up a gust of sand in the process. She lowered one shoulder and circled around, spying the horde of roamers as I had. That's a lot of them in a single group. Is that what you wanted to see? I grinned. Yep, it's absolutely perfect, I said, tensing. Raven tilted her head to look at me, her large, bloodied eye staring at me with concern. What are you about to do? Just a little power leveling, I said, and jumped. Durin, she shouted, but I was already in freefall. Chapter 8 The Roving Dead I timed my jump precisely, but my landing was anything but smooth as I dropped onto the top of the largest sand dune. I sank deeper than I was expecting and fell off balance, tumbling down the hill. Damn it, I cursed as I spat out a mouthful of sand, the gritty grains fouling my mouth and slipping down my throat. Ignoring the roughness of my mouth for a second, I stood up, dusted the worst of the sand from me and pulled out a water skin, washing out the remaining sand and spitting for good measure before draining a good fourth of the water. Next time, make sure I know what I'm jumping on if I'm going to pull a stunt like that again. Raven swooped down near me, and I shielded my face against the small dust storm she kicked up in her wake. She quickly transformed back to her human form and marched over, clearly displeased. That was reckless of you, she said as she knelt beside me. Was fun as hell, though, I said with a chuckle before dropping my smile and focusing on the roving dead. We'd landed behind the moving horde, and they were brainless creatures who could barely spark enough brain cells to move, let alone think. Pure instinct and need drove them to consume the flesh of the living. As I peered out at the hundred or so rumors, I found a mixture of soldiers, farmers, and even a few who'd once been mages, all of them in various stages of decay and rot. Black magic kept the somnambulists mobile and slowed the rate of decay, sometimes stopping it altogether if the necromancer was strong enough. I don't see anyone leading them, so maybe this is an unbound horde. Maybe their creator is already dead. Dead or not, I was excited to get to work. Roamers in small groups were chumps, even at high levels. But since each undead lost a quarter of their levels during the resurrection, there would never be an undead higher than level 75, barring a lich or any of the spectral undead. Easy enough in small doses, but a hundred is more than I can take at once unless I do this smart. I eyed Raven, who wasn't much to look at. She still wore her thin black dress and had no weapons. A liability, one that would only slow me down. Do you have any armor at all? I hissed at her. She flinched and nodded. It should be in my pack. I withdrew her pack and tossed it to her. Get dressed, quickly. She didn't bother responding. Instead, she stripped out of her dress then and there, giving me a brief glimpse at the smooth, pale skin of her abdomen and her ample bust before I could turn my head. I put her out of mind and focused on watching my prey. The horde moved at a snail's pace, and there were pockets of open areas in between some of the larger groups, giving me plenty of room to work with. Go in from the left where the horde is the weakest and work my way through. I'll only deal with a few handfuls at a time. Best plan I had, at any rate, and considering what I was up against, I wasn't too worried. I gave Raven a few minutes to change, and she coughed softly when she'd finished. She now wore a nearly skin-tight cotton shirt and a pair of pants in mottled hues of dull black and gray under leather armor, dyed a midnight black, with thick padding over her chest and thighs. Any vital spot was covered with leather, but still allowed mobility. As she turned around to grab her bag, two slits stood out from the back of her armor, it was stitched so there was no fraying. Her shoulder blades moved under the holes. Are those for her wings? Whatever, don't really care. She handed me back her pack and I stowed it away. Don't you have a weapon? Don't need one. So, why are we doing this again? She asked. Because I said so. You can either help or stay here. What'll it be? I'll help. Then let's go. Follow my lead. I vaulted the sand hill we'd been on and slid down the steep incline. Using the built-up momentum, I hit the ground running and drew my new sword in the process. The black metal gleamed, its maiden bloodletting at hand. My charge led me right where I wanted to go, and I plowed into a small group of five roamers. Each of them wore alliance breastplates, and they stopped, turning as my life force washed over them. They let out haunting groans of hunger. The closest one lurched at me. Half of his face sloughed off as he whipped around and opened his rotting mouth to assault my nose with a miasma of decay. Before he could bring his arms up, I sliced my sword through his neck 
and as his head sank into the sand, I stuck my blade through it, splitting the weakened skull. One down. The others took their time and stumbled to me in blind hunger. Rotten flesh dripped, and their milky white eyeballs told me they wanted nothing but to taste my flesh. One of them was close enough to grab my armor. His thin, bony fingers gripped as tightly as his failing muscles would allow. I severed his hand at the elbow and whipped my sword back to slice through his head. That makes two. One of them tripped over the supine form of his dead, undead friend and met the tip of my sword as I shoved it through his brain. The remaining two were close now, forcing me to take a step back and goad them toward me. When they moved parallel to each other, I moved. I ducked under their outstretched arms and shoved them into one another, causing them to crash to the ground together. One quick adjustment later to line them up, and my sword slid through the nose of the top roamer and out the back of the head of the second. Two for the price of one, and that makes five. Raven gave me an exasperated sigh and shook her head as I pulled my sword free. I wiped the rotten and blackened brains from the steel. Got something to say? Not at all. Far be it for me to tell you when you're being impetuous. I tossed the torn and now soiled piece of cloth from the roamer. Good, because I don't need another nag in my life. Come on, we've got more zombies to slay. Zombies, she muttered as we edged toward the rest of the horde. I'd created a gap to start whittling away at them from the side, but we would end up biting off more than we could chew if we strayed too close and the others sensed us. There was a group of six or seven farmhands that were the closest to us. I slunk along until I was as close as I could be from them without straying into the horde itself. My life force tempted them, and they turned, coming for me, and breaking away from the oblivious horde as I kited them back a good ways. I was about to engage when a ruffling came from behind me and a shadow passed overhead. Raven floated about fifteen feet in the air in her human form, her black wings stretched out and flapping in lazy rhythm as she stared down the horde. Can I take them? she asked. I thought about it and shrugged. Be my guest. She nodded, and I danced out of range while they shuffled after me. Raven flapped her wings harder and rose a few feet more before bringing her wings down sharply. Dozens of heavy feathers shot out from her wings, spinning end over end like throwing knives as they descended on the unsuspecting horde. She'd put enough force behind them to cause major damage to the seven roamers. A few missed or landed on the soft feather side, but plenty struck properly, sinking the entire shaft into the undead's soft and weakened bones. A few took out eyes and hit the brain, killing them instantly, but she'd only managed kill shots on four of the seven. Uh, not bad for one attack, though. Raven glided back over to me and withdrew her wings, dropping to the ground. My apologies. I wasn't able to get them all. Don't worry about it, I said, raising my sword. I'll finish them off. I ran forward, and with a few quick slashes, I slaughtered the remaining three. That makes eight. One of her feathers stuck out of the sand. I crouched and picked it up. It was heavier than any feather I'd ever held before. I prodded at the tip of the white shaft, drawing a bead of blood. Holy shit, that's kind of impressive. Though sharp, they lacked the heft needed to perform as a true weapon, but Raven had bypassed that by using extreme force. Damned impressive. Before I could do anything else, the feather disappeared, fading away to nothing along with the rest of the ones that lingered over our small battlefield. Faster than a corpse, but I guess they operate similarly because they're organic. I stood up and walked over to Raven. How many times can you use that trick? Only a few times in short bursts. My feathers grow back quickly, but if I lose too many, I won't be able to fly properly. Well, then ballpark it for me. How many times can you use that again right now? Twice more, at best? All right, I said, pointing at the largest groups of roamers. Fly over and see how much damage you can cause. She nodded, unfurling her wings. What are you going to do? I smirked and summoned my chitin shield. Thankfully, I had the wherewithal to unbuckle the vambrace and push the leather higher on my arm. I stowed the armor piece away just as the inky darkness slithered out from my pores and coalesced into a round shield on my arm. The shield was muted tones of black, rough, uneven, and the edges sharp as shale. Wonder if I can take a roamer's head off in one swing. I've had a lot put on me the last few days, and it's only going to get worse from here, so I'm going to go blow off some fucking steam. Instead of pushing my anger down and letting it fester, I let it come to the surface and boil over. I let out as loud of a war cry as I could, and I charged into the mass of undead. My shield raised, I barreled into the nearest roamer. I shoved it with enough force that it toppled over into the crowd and took half a dozen out like a row of dominoes. Two walking corpses were right in front of me. 
I bashed one with the edge of my shield, sinking it just under its nose and crushing its face in until I hit its brain and it stopped moving. The other tried to take a bite of me, but chomped down on my sword instead. With a flick of my wrist, I filleted its skull open. It spilled rancid gray matter and viscous black blood to the sand. I wiped my blade with my finger and shook the gore from my hand. I turned back to the set of undead dominoes which had forgotten how to stand and crawled toward me, eliciting an unholy chorus of groans. I curb stomped each of their heads to vile pulp, staining my new graves and boots with filth and rot. That makes thirteen. While I took out the group, Raven flew overhead and rained her razor sharp feathers down on the zombies. I couldn't tell how many she took out, but she attacked, glided out of the horde before rising, and dropped once more. When she could do no more from above, she circled and dropped next to me as I bashed my emerald pommel into the side of a zombie's face, crumpling the weak bone. It dropped, and I crushed what remained of its skull under heel. Another rushed us, stumbling over the corpse of its friend. Allow me, Raven said, and stuck with what looked like a finger jab to the roamer's eyes. The roamer stopped dead, falling lifeless to the sand. When Raven withdrew her hand, she had sharp talons instead of hands. Her fingers were longer than a human's and had glossy black claws where there should be fingernails. I whistled. Neat trick. How many more are left? I asked. With a flap of her wings, she rose to survey the battlefield. About eighty, give or take. All right, can you fight by yourself or do you need backup? She scoffed and flicked her eyes down. I'll be fine. Whatever you say, I said, and didn't bother waiting for a reply. There are zombies to kill. Between the two of us, we cleared out the shambling horde in under two hours. It took a lot of patience and hit-and-run tactics to whittle them down a handful at a time. I had to be careful of my battle fatigue as the fight wore on, so Raven and I took turns when it neared Max. I went through thirty of them just fine, but my sword slipped off at a particularly brutish roamer's face and let him get close enough to bite me. It wouldn't have gotten through my armor, but Raven crushed its head before it could even try. She didn't even gloat about saving me as she helped me to my feet. Thanks, I muttered and picked up my steel. She nodded and flew into the air to begin her aerial bombardment. As the hours ended, I buried my blade through the skull of the last roamer and sighed in relief. I was utterly exhausted, but I still had the strength to smile at the mound of corpses in our wake. I looked around and spied a large dune to our right. The shadow stretched far and offered a much-needed rest from the sun's beating gaze. I pointed to it, and we both went and sat down, nearly collapsing. God's damn, but that was fun, I said, pulling out two water skins and handing one to Raven, who was currently using my shoulder to rest on. I was so tired I couldn't muster the strength to shove her off. Get off me, I snapped. Sure, sure, she said, and didn't budge but to uncap her water. Whatever. How close did I come to maxing my fatigue during that last pass? I opened my interface to look at my battle fatigue meter. Huh, I still have a little bit left in the tank, but why am I so fucking tired then? I lifted the water skin to my lips and drank deeply, my muscles quivering. Ah, my armor is heavier, my sword too. The shadow steel plates were much thicker than even my own set back home. It added more than a little weight to myself, and with my stat penalty, I wasn't used to the difference yet. As my fatigue wore down, my strength returned, little by little, and I leaned back, basking in the soft wind that carried a nice breeze and gusts of sand towards us. That fight did its job. I feel better. My head feels clear, even with all that madness dropped on me. I was a fighter. My clarity came at the end of my sword. While I had the time, I decided to sort through my notifications. I knew after a fight like that, I had more than a few waiting for me. Combat results. 48 killed, Romer. 14,400 EXP. 4 downed, 1,200 EXP. Mercy penalty, negative 400 EXP. Total EXP gain, 15,200 EXP. EXP 5,100 out of 5,100. Level up times 3. EXP 3,700 out of 5,400. Level 54. 30 stat points available. Less than I was expecting, actually. With how much EXP Euroboros has been throwing my way, these numbers look almost normal. Still more than I should get for killing a bunch of roamers, but for what's coming, I need all the boost I can get. With my stat penalty from being so far away from Eris, putting my points into my main stats would most likely be a waste. Need more durability for sure. Maybe more attack damage as well. I put 20 into durability and 10 into attack damage, which brought durability to 35 and attack damage to 40. Not bad, but I'll need to keep working to get stronger. 
You ready to move? I asked, tipping the last of my water into my mouth. Yeah. Raven used me as a crutch to help her stand, and I was about to shout at her when she offered me her hand. Still a little pissed, I took it reluctantly. She walked a few feet out of the darkness, and the sunlight caught her face. She closed her eyes as the wind swept her inky hair back. The heat feels wondrous. Though I'll bet I'll be cursing those words in about ten minutes. Yeah, probably. Hurry and shift before we- I tackled Raven to the ground as my instincts screamed at me, and a blast of hellfire scorched the sand to glass where she'd been standing a second before. The hell? Who's throwing around black magic? I scanned the area. Nothing but sand and dunes in all directions. There was nothing that I could see. Ruined, a sudden voice shouted. A figure wreathed in darkness appeared from the shadows of one of the larger sand dunes. It was incredibly well camouflaged, and if I hadn't been searching for the voice, I'd have never spotted it. Inside the shade, a darker shadow told of a hidden doorway and the sand itself. Is that one of the entrances to the Nymerian dungeon? I held off that train of thought and stood, pulling Raven up along with me. The figure stalked toward us, tall, his stride purposeful, yet heavy with rage. Though he stood under the blinding light of the sun, shadows clung to the figure, bathing him in midnight. He wore a cloak so dark it obscured his physique, shrouding him almost completely. Only his chin and mouth were visible under the shadows that covered his eyes, his lips set in a ferocious snarl. Ruined, he shouted again, his voice young but tinged with maturity and anger that far outshone any mere teenage angst. Do you two know how long it took me to raise and lead those rumors all the way out here? And you two fucking waltz in and ruin everything? From within the folds of darkness, he withdrew a dark wooden stave, unadorned and plain but oozing wicked intent. My sword was useless at this distance, but I spied a knife in a leather sheath at Raven's lower back. Mind if I borrow your knife? I asked. Help yourself, she said as the hooded man approached. I'm going to make you pay for crossing me. I'm the Shadow King's chosen. I am ju- Whatever he'd been about to say was suddenly cut short by the knife now lodged firmly in his trachea. My throw had been perfect, and I'd aimed at the only unprotected spot he had. He gasped and bled his life out on the sun-baked sand, the blood mixing with the grains of sand and clumped as it dried. Rule number one, never monologue in the middle of a fight. That earned a snort from Raven. You ready to set off? One sec, I said and went over to the dead man and stole all of his stuff. I didn't bother cataloging the items. I just quick looted him and jogged back to Raven. I handed Raven back her knife and quickly sorted out the combat results from that encounter. Combat results. One killed, human, 1,500 EXP. Total EXP, 1,500 EXP. EXP, 5,200 out of 5,400. All right, let's go. She shifted, and I climbed atop her. We set off, and I was grateful to be out of the intense desert heat. The wind tore at my face as Raven put a burst of speed into her wings, but I enjoyed the rush as we soared high above the desert. The shift in temperature was enough to make me shiver, but after sweating bullets minutes ago, I wasn't about to complain. We flew for another hour or so, but the sun was getting low by then, and Raven had slowed considerably, prompting me to lean down and ask to find somewhere to make camp. Absolutely, I'm worn out, she said, her voice clear despite the howling wind. About twenty minutes later, we passed by a high cliff formed of red rock. It was tall enough that nothing I knew of could climb it, and unless wyverns or dragons roosted there, we'd be safe from attack. I nudged her with my foot and pointed toward the cliff. She got the message and swooped down to land. I took a few tentative steps to make sure the ground was solid everywhere, and when nothing crumbled or moved, I was satisfied and pulled out our packs, trying to get the camp set up. Anything I can do to help? Sure. I said, tossing her the pack after pulling the tent out. Knock yourself out. We got to work in silence. By the time I set the tent up, I was furious, and Raven had a fire lit and dinner going. Give me the bag. Raven did so at once, and I rooted through it, getting madder by the second. Knowing I wouldn't find anything, I pulled out Raven's and gave it a cursory look, not finding what I was looking for. God damn it. What? Raven asked, looking up from her preparations. There's only one tent. Oh, she said, not at all looking concerned about the fact. Maybe they did it that way to save space? No, I'm pretty sure it was just a fuck with me. I grumbled and pulled out the one thing that would make the situation bearable. Whiskey. I took a long pull from the frankly oversized travel flask Magnolia had procured for me and went to help with dinner. 
What are you making? Arrayed on a long strip of cloth were salted vegetables and meat, each separated by individual strips of cloth. Instead of dried meat, we had fresh meat with a fine layer of salt over it to allow it to keep. Raven asked for the bag back and pulled out a small bottle of red wine and a bevy of spices and bouillon cubes. All of it went into the cauldron over the fire and was allowed to simmer. In just over half an hour, we dug in. I hate it to admit, as the meat fell apart in my mouth. But it was one of the best meals I'd ever had here. Raven was just as hungry as I was, because she scarfed down three helpings of the meat after I tapped out on one. Hungry? I asked with a smile. She nodded, wiping broth from the corner of her mouth. Shape-shifting takes a lot out of me, and I'm not used to using it for extended periods of time. Today was exhausting. Well, you fought surprisingly well today, I said, setting down my bowl and spoon. Raven looked up with surprise, more sauce at the corners of her mouth where the hint of a grin lifted her lips. What? For a shapeshifter, you mean? I pulled out the flask again and took another drink. Yeah, for a power-hungry leech, he didn't suck, I said, offering her the flask. She took it and drank a larger gulp than I was expecting and passed it back. Damn, that's good. Thanks for sharing. I laughed and gave an exasperated sigh. All right, spill. What happened to the meek, subservient girl in the throne room, kowtowing to Magnus? Seems like you pulled an alternate personality out of your ass. Raven laughed and held out her hand for the flask, so I passed it back. She leaned back and glanced up at the incalculable number of stars overhead. There was absolutely zero light pollution, and millions of stars shone bright in the night sky. It took her a minute to speak, but when she did, her voice was filled with fear. You haven't been around him long enough, but Magnus is the most terrifying man I've ever met. He's utterly ruthless in the pursuit of his goals, and nothing is off limits when it comes to achieving them. I've found keeping my head down is the best way to avoid trouble. She took another drink from the flask. Despite your hatred of me, I'm still grateful, you know, to you. Whatever the hell for, I asked. For getting me away from Castle Illyria, even if it's only for a little while. Castle Illyria? Yeah, she seemed the type. I scoffed. Don't thank me. I'd have left you there in a heartbeat if I could have. I'm just as bad as Magnus, and I don't need your thanks. My words didn't push her away as I wanted. Instead, she looked up at me with a tilted head, her crimson eyes regarding me with intent. I've been watching you ever since I was told I'd become your tool. You're not as bad as Magnus. I can say that for certain. You're wrong. Raven shook her head. I am not. Magnus was cruel when I didn't do exactly as he said or made a mistake. He wouldn't hurt me. Don't be so sure of that, I replied. She scooted even closer to me. Then do it. Raven challenged. Hurt me. My first response was to laugh at her. She was right, after all. Even if I couldn't stand the fact she was a shifter, I wasn't going to physically hurt her. But as I gazed down at her pale throat, the slate raised vein on the side of her neck throbbing in time with her heart, my inner demon roused itself from its slumber again at the mere thought of blood. Do it, knight. Hurt her. Feast upon her flesh and savor her blood. I bit my lip in anger at the flood of desire radiating from my chest. Finally decided to speak after being so quiet. I don't need your influence aspect. Back off. I forced my eyes away from her neck, but the pull was strong. I wanted nothing more than to feast on her blood. To lap at her neck and drink my fill. Get out of my fucking head. You left me to fend for myself with Illyria. I'm not doing a damn thing you demand. The magic in my heart burrowed free from its shell and filled my veins with ice water as it sought out my brain. The aspect sought to control me again, its frigid grip on my mind, fogging my thoughts and weakening my resistance. Pain filled my body and converged on my mouth as if I'd stuck a red-hot coal into my gums and gargled with acid. I backed away and clawed at my face, dragging my nails down my flesh, ripping deep furrows into my cheeks. The pain shifted something in my mouth, and I spat on reflex. A handful of my teeth and a large gob of blood fled from my mouth. What the hell? Raven asked, stepping back. The pain receded, and I rode the pain for all it was worth, because it kept the aspect from taking control of me, though a sense of smugness came from within. 
Fight all you want, knight. We are one now. The aspect faded back into my heart as I pulled out Raven's bag and found the item I'd noticed earlier, a small hand mirror. Opening my mouth with trepidation, I found I'd been changed once again. My canines had elongated and been joined by another set, side by side in my mouth, just like Eris's. I had the teeth of an entomancer now. The mirror showed them in complete detail, and I didn't want to look at myself anymore. I stowed it away and sat back on the ground. Raven had distanced herself from me, and I thought that a wise move. I wouldn't put much stock in that theory of yours, Raven. I can hurt you just fine. Chapter 9 Training Eris As the glow of leveling up faded away, I knelt as fatigue set in. I wiped my brow. The hot, muggy air clung to my skin and burned in my nose from the salt in the air. Oh, that's interesting. My agility increased by five, and so did my durability. That seems reasonable, though I wish I'd gained a bit more mana. Congratulations on the level up, Gil said. What's it at now? Only twenty. I wasn't allowed to take any really dangerous quests growing up, so it took nearly twenty-two years for me to even make it to nineteen. Well, the rate we keep going, you'll climb the ranks quickly. Gil turned back to the others and left me alone. The yellow squishy thing that had been inside the shade was by my foot in the mud. I picked it up, wiped the muck off, and squeezed it gently, my fingers indenting it. What is this? I turned it over and found a slight tear in it. Something shiny lay at its center. I tore it open, revealing a single black ball in the center, about the size of a marble. It twinkled even under cover of clouds. I took it from the external casing and stood. I walked over to the others, who were staring at me with a mixture of emotions. Pride came from Gil and McKenna, while Adam eyed the bauble in my hand with greed, and Evelyn looked quite disappointed. Good job, Eris, McKenna said, beaming at me. Good job. That was abysmal. You have literally no technique. I expected that blockhead you call a lover to at least teach you something of fighting, but it was foolish of me to even expect that much. Evelyn scoffed, her tone reproachful. I couldn't even argue with her. I knew I wasn't a fighter. That was only my third fight and my first one where Sam didn't help me. If I didn't have my magic, I'd be dead right now. I needed to get stronger, so I had to muster up all the courage to ask. I know I'm not skilled at fighting, and I know that I need to get better and fast. So would you be willing to teach me, Evelyn? She sighed at my request, but nodded. I'll have to. I'm not going to babysit your ass. She gave me a half smile. Besides, not like you can be a worse student than Durin. You taught Sam? I asked. Of course, though he developed a few bad habits with the sword, and I had to retrain him from scratch. So you'll be a breeze compared to him. Thank you, I told her. But she brushed me off. Save your thanks. I just don't want your ineptitude to get us killed. Now round up those kids of yours and let's get a move on. We still have a lot of ground to cover. Right, I said and headed off in the direction I'd last seen them. Finding the spiderlings was easy thanks to their acute hearing. I barely had to call their names before they came bounding out from the underbrush, covered in mud and twigs. Tegan smiled wide at me, holding up a six-foot snake he'd caught. Look what I found, Aunt Eris. I see that, I said, taking the snake and releasing it back into the marsh. It slithered off as Tegan groaned. Sorry, Tegan, but we can't take it with us. Told you, Kira said ruffling her brother's fine brown hair. I couldn't help but laugh as I knelt to brush what filth I could from them, though we were all dirty. I need a bath, but there isn't any clean water around that I can tell. With so few insects around, I couldn't use them to pinpoint any fresh water, so I settled in for staying grimy for a while. I held their hands as we made our way back to the group. Everyone was already on their horses by the time we got back. I helped Tegan and Kira onto Lacuna and was about to hop on myself when Gil called out to me and tossed me something. It was my backpack and cloak that I discarded by the trees. Thank you, I said, hastily donning my pack and tying my cloak around me. From the look of the clouds overhead, it was going to rain soon. The breeze that blew through the gray marshes began to pick up, so I climbed on Lacuna and we quickly picked up the pace. The rain would do wonders to wash all the muck off us, but I didn't want to be stuck in the deep mire if it started to flood. 
We sped through the damp as quickly as we could, but it still took another hour of riding before we exited the worst part of the marsh. Dying reeds and mud gave way to a breath of greenery as we took a path that, according to Gill, would lead us out of the worst of the salted mire. The only route to this road is through the deep marsh, but we should be out of the worst of it for now. We're headed to a small town on the outskirts of the salted mire, about twenty-five miles away. So we have a lot of ground to cover, Gil told me as I kept pace with him. I was just thankful to have a breather from the salt-laden wetlands. We were finally on somewhat stable ground. The scent of salt was still present, but it was almost as an aftertaste. Another hour of riding and my stomach was screaming at me for food, but I didn't want to be the first one who complained. So I suffered for a while longer until McKenna spoke up and saved me. All right, guys, I'm seriously about to gnaw off my own arm here. Let's break for lunch, shall we? I heaved a sigh of relief when Evelyn nodded, and we found a decent spot to build a fire and get some food cooking. While Gil dealt with setting things up, McKenna and I carried heavy pieces of deadwood from the edge of the marsh to the fire pit along with some decent kindling. Once we had the fire going, Gil took out a large cooking pot and metal stands to set it over the fire. He poured in a generous measure of water along with salt and spices and let it rise to a boil. When the stew was finished, we all gathered around the fire and let the damp dry out our clothes. The storm clouds had been steadily increasing throughout the day, but the rain held off as we filled our stomachs. I poured two bowls for the spiderlings first and let them eat while I waited for everyone to get their fill. I slurped down as much of the soupy stew I could stomach before sitting back with content. Tegan and Kira cuddled into me while everyone made polite conversation. With nothing to add myself, I took out the strange rock I'd acquired from the shade and twirled it around my palm, marveling how it shone even without a light source. How much? At the sound, I looked up to see Adam leaning over on the stump, staring intently at the rock in my hands. I held it up. How much for this? I asked. He nodded, his head bobbing back and forth like it was attached to a string. Yeah, yeah. How much do you want for the core? This is a core? Sure is, he said, practically bouncing in his seat. Do you know how valuable they are? I didn't have a clue. I had heard, of course, before. They were prized trophies that lucky members of the hive procured from slain monsters, but I hadn't ever actually seen one before and didn't know the first thing about them. Adam seemed overly excited about it, and even if it was exceedingly valuable, I had no use for it. So I tossed it over to him. In his surprise, you must drop the small core. His eyes widened as he palmed it. I can just have it? Sure. I have no use for it, so I don't see why not. Wow, thanks, he said and took out a nearly transparent crystal. And with a long string of guttural words, a glowing blue circle made of light appeared in his hands just under the crystal. He brought the core close to the now glowing crystal, but before they could touch, the core absorbed into the clear gem, turning it black. Where'd it go? I asked, bewildered. Adam laughed and scooted over on the log to show me the crystal. This is a summoning crystal. They're used to store the cores of monsters and black. So you use the shade's core and the summoning crystal to do what? Just watch, Adam said. He stood up from his seat and walked past the fire while I watched and waited. The others didn't so much as stir from their food. Once Adam had gotten about fifteen feet away, he tossed the crystal in the air. Come forth, he called and the darkness burst from the crystal and rained down to form three individual shades. They took the form of humans and stood still, like they were waiting for something. I jumped to my feet as fear ran through me, but Adam just laughed and told me to calm down. They're under my control now, and they won't hurt you. Now my shades return from whence you came. In unison, they bowed and flowed into a single mass of flickering shadow before returning to the crystal. Adam called the gem to his hand and stowed it away. Awesome, some new toys to play with. I had to agree, it was awesome. Sam said Adam was good with creatures, but I've never seen anything like that before. So you have to use a summoning crystal to store cores, I asked. Adam shook his head. Not technically. You can use any gemstone, but they're usually inferior to summoning crystals, which is why they cost so much. Gil's booming voice shouted over to us. Hey, Adam, if you're done with the summoning lesson, let's get going. We still have a long way to go, and those storm clouds are getting darker. After that, we cleaned everything up, doused the fire, and set off again, trying to outrun what was quickly turning into a monsoon. Wind swept at our backs for over two hours as we kept up a frightening pace. None of us wanted to get caught in the storm. 
But for all our might, we were nothing compared to Mother Nature, and mountainous thunder was the harbinger of the storm. It rolled over us and pelted us with rain the size of rocks. The storm was so fierce it whipped up debris around us, and we could not press on without fear of injury. We huddled in a close cropping of trees while the wind and rain hounded us for hours. We couldn't even make camp or take shelter under our tents without them getting soaked with water. So we leaned against the trees and suffered under the rain. At least we were all clean now. It was approaching twilight when the rain finally lit up. The rain drizzled to a stop, and the dense cloud cover faded into the cool evening. I stood from the soggy ground and shook well over a pound of water from my clothes, in definite need of a change of clothes. Gil spoke up for the next tree over. Both he and McKenna were dripping with just as much water as I was, and they looked miserable. Why don't we set up camp here tonight? I doubt we'll find a better spot, and I'll get a fire going while you girls go and change. That sounded like a fantastic plan, and I quickly climbed to my feet, as did McKenna and Evelyn. I told the children we'd be right back, and the three of us headed into a nearby thicket to change. After pushing through some thick underbrush, we entered a small clearing just wide enough for the three of us to move without bumping into one another. I wasted no time in stripping from my soaked clothes, though the leather corset had straps that I couldn't reach on my own, and I struggled for a second before McKenna came over and helped untie me. Here, let me she said as she placed her hands on my back. Thank you very much. It's no trouble, she replied and got to work. She'd done this before, and in under a minute had me out of the armor. I placed it on the ground and stepped out of my skirt easily enough, but my shirt stubbornly clung to me and took far too much effort to remove. When I was finally free, I almost shouted in joy. I piled all my soiled clothes together and opened my pack to change. Well, don't you look sexy. Evelyn said on my back. I turned to find her naked, staring at me with curiosity. I'm sorry, I asked, unsure of what she meant by sexy. She didn't say anything, instead choosing to come closer to me. I couldn't help but stare at her while she did so. Evelyn was beautiful, to a truly remarkable degree. I'd noticed before how lean she was and how her armor hugged her body but to see it uncovered was like night and day. Her skin was flawless, pale like mine, but so much prettier. Hers was almost translucent, it was so clear. She had the grace of a dancer and the strength of a warrior, pure functional muscle, but it was smooth and flowed flawlessly from head to toe. Her breasts were larger than mine, not by much, but still enough that it irked me. They were taut, and her nipples were almost invisible next to her skin. She caught me staring, but wasn't angry. She looked at me with desire in her golden eyes. Evelyn stood several inches taller than me, and she trailed a finger slowly from the top of my navel, through my cleavage, to grab my chin. My heart beat incredibly fast in my chest, so much that I was sure Evelyn could hear it. She bent low to gaze at me, and her breath drifted across my bare skin to tickle my nose and I caught the sweet fragrance of peppermint and honey from her mouth, while her skin smelled of rose petals and lavender. She tilted my neck, and I knew she was looking at my scar. What have we here? Evelyn asked under her breath, her fingers playing over the indentation of Sam's teeth. Seems you like it rough, kinky. More words I don't understand, but I can't tell her about what happened between Sam and I. Sam hates the scar, and even if it wasn't his fault, I don't want to paint him in a negative light. I stepped back from her, not because I wanted to, but because I wanted to be closer to her. I longed to feel her skin against mine, but I couldn't. Sam wouldn't like it, and I couldn't do something knowing it would hurt my bonded. He had a thing about only being with one person, and even if I didn't exactly agree with it, I didn't want to betray his trust. Evelyn kept her hand on my neck but didn't press me, just reciprocated my earlier gawking and looked me up and down. You really are a gorgeous specimen. It's a shame you shackled yourself to the one man who would object to having his own harem. He'd never forgive me if I took you for myself, she said, walking back to her clothes. McKenna watched our exchange with extreme interest, her clothes in her hands forgotten as she stood naked, waiting for something to happen. Her pigtails had come loose, her hair spilled down to cover her modest chest, 
which was as freckled as her face. She was adorable, and as she bent over to climb into a pair of underwear, I noticed a shock of vibrant red hair at her crevice. It matched her hair, and I found that amusing for some strange reason. She looked at me when I started laughing to myself, but thankfully didn't ask why. I didn't have a good answer for her. The close proximity to Evelyn had left me heated, but now, alone, the chill left by the storm sank into my skin. My body heat kept the worst away, but the temperature was steadily dropping. I chose my clothes, a white cotton tunic that came down to my knees, and a short black skirt, gathered up my belongings, and headed back to the fire to dry them. Evelyn was dressed more casually than I'd ever seen before, a black loose-fitting garment that tied at the waist and a pair of pants in a similar fashion. They looked like pajamas, but they also looked easy to move in, so I doubted they were actually sleeping clothes. McKenna chose a billowy tunic that was at least three sizes too large, and I would have bet my dinner if it wasn't Gill's. Adam and Gill had also changed, both wore fresh shirts and pants. Gill's a light cream while Adam wore a navy blue. There were several makeshift racks near the fire that already housed the other's clothes, so I added my own to the pile and went to take care of the spiderlings. Tegan and Kira had no other clothes, so I gave them both a shirt of mine and washed out their clothes and set them by the fire. Once they were taken care of, I went to set up our tent. I had watched Sam do it enough times while traveling that I thought I knew how to set it up properly, but it still took me about ten minutes of fumbling with the strings and stakes to get them to stay in the saturated ground. When the tent was as good as it was going to get, I stowed my belongings inside and went back by the fire. While I was gone, Tegan and Kira had disappeared. Slight panic chilled me when they weren't by the tree, but I quickly calmed down. Those two are smart and as fast as I am. They're probably just playing. Nearly eight hours in the saddle, I'm sure they just needed to burn off some energy. My hunch was correct as around twenty minutes later, they came bounding out of the underbrush, carrying the carcass of a small doe. Look what we caught! They both shouted in unison. I smiled over at them. They were so proud of themselves that I couldn't help but be happy for them. I can see that. Good job, both of you. We'll eat well tonight because of you two. Gil stood up from beside the fire and walked over to us, kneeling by the deer and giving the children a bright smile. Good work, he said, speaking slowly. Tegan and Kira couldn't speak the language of humans, but they understood enough to know that Gil was praising them. Though they were still frightened by the giant, they both managed to return Gil's smile. Tegan had dried blood on his hands, so I led them over to the fire and wiped them clean with some fresh water. I passed the time until dinner by watching the fire. There was something mesmerizing about watching the flicking flames as they devoured whatever they touched with abandon. I stared into the smoldering coals for long enough that my eyes started to water, and I was brought out of my reverie by a curse from Gil. Oh shit, Gil yelled. What? Both Adam and McKenna asked at the same time. Gil just held up his hand and stood up from preparing the deer. His hand went to his interface, and he started babbling. Hey, D, are, are you okay? My heart leapt into my throat, and I jumped to my feet. Sam! Gil looked up at my shout and nodded, before holding up his finger, telling me to wait. I didn't want to wait. I wanted to tackle him and demand answers, but I sat back down while my mind ran in circles trying to keep pace with my heart rate. He kept speaking in low tones, so I couldn't make out what was being said when Gil abruptly shouted again. You're doing what? The beans on his hands throbbed as he opened and clenched his fists. You can't be serious. By the gods, are you insane? All right, all right. I won't try and talk you out of it. But you watch your ass there. Don't be reckless and get yourself killed, you hear me? It seemed their conversation was coming to a close, and I desperately wanted to speak to Sam just to hear his voice. Gil noticed my distress and took pity on my sanity. Hey, uh, before you go, there's someone here who wants to talk to you, and if I hold off any longer, she looks like she's going to mob me, he said, and pushed an invisible button in front of him. Out of nowhere came Sam's voice, his handsome voice that laughed at what Gil had said. Hey, Eris, he said, and his voice was filled with so much warmth that it made my heart melt. Hey, love. I'm sorry about cutting our connection. I didn't want to, but it was necessary, Sam said. It's okay. I was just worried about you. Where are you right now? Gil will fill you guys in. I've had an exhausting day, but I wanted to touch base with everyone before I passed out. Don't worry, love. We'll see each other again soon. I'm holding you to that. Another deep laugh. 
I'd expect nothing less. I love you. As I love you. Until eternity, my bonded. Good night. Good night. When Sam's voice cut out, Gil pressed a button and came to sit by McKenna. Before he could fully sit down, I all but screamed at him. Tell me everything. After Gil finished explaining the conversation that went on between him and Sam, we all stared at him, dumbfounded. He's working for Magnus? McKenna asked. Gil nodded. Looks like it, the damn fool. I didn't know what Sam's reasoning was, but I knew he was no fool. If he's allied with the man that kidnapped him, there has to be a reason. We just have to figure out what. I trusted him enough to have faith that he was doing the right thing. The others were less concerned about why he had sided with Magnus and more about his destination. Aldrist. He's attempting to steal Lackmerel's heart? That's what he said, but I don't see how we can even pull it off. Think we should help him? Adam asked. Evelyn shook her head. Impossible. It'd take over a week and a half to reach Aldrust from here unless we teleported, and it's not like we can leave the little queen to fend for herself. We were all forced to agree with her. We had our own journey to accomplish, even if we could abandon it and chase after Sam. Everyone discussed more while Gil cleaned the meat, but I didn't join in. I had made up my mind about what I was doing, and I couldn't go back on it. Food should be ready in just over half an hour, Gil said. Good. The stew from lunch hadn't tidied me over as long as I hoped. Tegan and Kira were playing by the fire, drawing in the dirt, and I was about to sit by them when a whistling noise echoed from behind me. I turned and caught the object that had been heading for my back. It was a sword, but wooden. Just like the real thing, but wouldn't end with me getting cut to pieces. Nice reflexes, Ellen called as she stepped towards me. In her hands was an identical copy of the sword she had thrust at me. Now, come at me. Without hesitation, she swung catching me on the chin with the tip of her sword. My head jerked back, and she used the opportunity to slash at my shoulder, sending me to the ground. Dead. I struggled to my feet and didn't bother holding back as I swung at her, but I was so hopelessly inferior that it wasn't even fair. Evelyn batted my weak attacks aside with ease, not even trying to hide how easy it was for her. Watch your feet, she said and wrapped my shins hard with her sword. I faltered under the pain and stopped for just a second and Evelyn snapped a kick that sent me sprawling to the wet ground, her sword at my throat. Dead, she repeated. Angry and humiliated, I grabbed a handful of mud in my hands when I stood and tossed it at her when I struck with my weapon. Evelyn grinned and sidestepped both the mud and my attack, whacking my back with her sword. Improvisation and underhanded tricks, you're learning. Never be afraid to use whatever options are available to you. Honor means nothing if you get yourself killed she said, sitting back into her fight stance. Again. I attacked her, trying to get past her, but no matter what I tried, her sword blocked mine effortlessly. Don't attack my weapon, attack me. The weapon is just an extension of myself. You're leading with your body, lead with your weapon, and don't flail. Keep yourself behind your blade and keep your strikes precise. The two of us went at it for what felt like hours. Even when Gil finished preparing dinner and the others tore into fresh venison, Evelyn and I kept up our sparring until I physically couldn't hold my training sword any longer. I fell mid-swing and lay gasping on the ground, aching like my entire body was pulling apart. Evelyn took mercy on me and called an end to our training. I managed to half walk, half drag myself by the fire and let the pouring sweat dry in the heat. I was gross and so bone tired that even eating had lost its appeal. I took two bites before exhaustion set in and I shuffled off to bed. The spiderlings joined me but I was asleep before they could even cuddle next to me. Chapter 10 The Golden Eye Twins If I thought I was sore last night, it was nothing compared to the full body ache that throbbed with every slight movement. My entire body was like a walking bruise, and it made the thought of even more long hours in the saddle so unbearable that I wanted to immediately crawl back into my bedroll and sleep for a week. Can't do that, though, even if it is appealing. The others are probably waiting on me. I woke up the children, and we left the tent. Gil stirred a pot over the campfire, while Evelyn and Adam were up and working through a set of exercises. McKenna intermittently napped while leaning against Gil, who looked up when he heard the flap of the tent. Morning, you three. Hungry? I tried to say yes, 
but it came out so thick with sleep that even I couldn't register what I'd said. Gil just laughed. I'll take that as a yes. Come over here and get a bowl. Stew should just be about done. Thank you, Gil, I said, trying to be grateful. But I was tired of stew, and Gil heard it in my voice. Don't worry. We should hit the town today and stock up on more supplies, he said before leaning down and kissing McKenna on the head. Time to get up, Kenna. She groaned and shoved him in playful anger. I'm not used to this crap. Fourteen or more hours a day on the road is for the birds. Her words stung a bit, but I knew that wasn't her intention. It was because of me that they all had to take the long road, but McKenna would have been mortified if she knew her words had hurt me. So I quickly shook them off and went to sit by the pair. Evelyn and Adam finished up their training and snagged two bowls of stew before coming to sit by us. Evelyn looked me over and smirked. How is the little queen feeling this morning? Like I almost wish I was back in the void so I wouldn't have to feel my body. McKenna perked up at that. What was it like? She asked before blushing scarlet. Sorry, that was probably incredibly rude. I smiled at her. Not at all, I replied. But I paused, trying to work up the courage to speak. The void was called such for a reason, and I doubted I would ever truly stop feeling its effects. Even now, weeks later, it clung to me, wouldn't fully let go. I tried to keep my smile, but it fell as soon as I spoke. The void is nothing, and inside it, I was nothing. I couldn't feel my body, couldn't feel anything, and sometimes, for years at a time, I couldn't even think. Everyone was staring at me now, food left forgotten in the cast iron pot boiling over. I wanted to let the story die, as already my mind kept going back there and the ever familiar weightlessness tingled across my arms once again. I shook my head and rubbed away the goosebumps. As much as I wanted to forget, I couldn't. I needed to get it out and off my chest. Centuries passed in what felt like the blink of an eye, but every time someone picked up my prison, I was forced back into the light. Because of the curse placed on me, I had to choose the person who would free me. But that person would also become my master, and I, a slave. I was able to get a glimpse at the souls of anyone who picked up my crystal. But it seemed only the worst sorts ever picked me up. People with the blackest souls, who could have used me in the worst ways and brought nothing but pain to my life. Seven men and women. Seven black hearts. Until the eighth. Durin, right? Gil asked. I nodded. Thinking of Sam was already banishing the lingering void. I was free and would never go back. Sam was the first person in a thousand years that was worthy, though he doesn't think so. Gil scooted over and patted me on the back. D is harder on himself than anyone I've ever met, but none of us are exactly the picture of mental stability anymore. You have to understand, the world we came from was a hellish place, and for some people, Durin especially, it's hard to let go of your ghosts. I know, it's just... I didn't know what I was going to say. That I wanted Sam to stop blaming himself for Micah's death, along with whatever other tragedy that kept haunting him. It's easy for me to say, but here I was letting my own ghosts still have a hold on me. I'm sorry, my love. You've had to shoulder so much pain, and you refuse to let anyone help. Maybe it's time we both start sharing each other's burdens. I lapsed into silence after that, trying to work through my own past, and the others were aware that I wasn't in the best place to keep up a conversation. Everyone turned back to their food and devoured their meal while I only picked at mine. I knew I would regret it in a few hours, but I couldn't stomach another bite when it was in so many knots. After breakfast, we quickly packed up and set out. The horrible storm for the night before had blown away to reveal bright blue skies and a beautiful day. It was impossible for me to keep sulking when I was surrounded by such beauty, so I soon got over my slight bout of melancholy and perked up to enjoy the day. Sam, when we see each other again, I promise to lay everything on the table, and I want you to do the same. No more ghosts. I'll help rid you of yours if you help with mine. I let the fresh air and sunshine wash away everything and just basked in the open air as we rode. Two hours later, we came out of the woodlands and found a small town, right where Gil had said it would be. 
Welcome to Odalfa, a town where we best keep an eye on our purse strings, McKenna said. Odalfa didn't give off any bad vibes as I glanced about the town as we rode in. We crossed back near the salted mire, and the scent of salt clung in the back of my throat, but the town itself seemed fine. Most of the buildings were built of rough, dark wood with muted windows and worn wooden roof tiles. A few buildings were made of stone, namely the largest building in the center of town that looked like a house, but much larger. Mansions, I think that's what Sam called them. It was built on solid ground, while further towards the marshlands, houses and buildings were on wooden stilts raised off the ground, which looked perpetually wet and muddy. We stayed on the main road and made our way to the largest building next to the stone mansion. From the sign swinging in the wind, it looked like an inn. It was a three-story building, equally as worn as the others around town, and the windows were too dark to see inside. But even through the thick wood door, music mixed with loud conversation and shouting. We stopped at the front porch, hitched our horses, and went inside. It was dark. Even though there were a dozen lanterns along the wall and a fire roaring on the far corner, it only helped to cast dancing shadows along the wall. Thirteen tables were scattered around the floor most of them packed with people, men and women of all types, but each of them looked worse for wear, like none of them had eaten a decent meal in a few days, and they all eyed us hungrily as we entered. Gil and the others didn't seem to be bothered in the slightest. Each of them wore hard glares as they stared down the inn's patrons. Most of the withering looks faded, and people went back to nursing their drinks and food. However, it seemed one of the patrons didn't take the hint, and gathered the courage to attempt to pickpocket Evelyn. I didn't see the man approach but couldn't miss his screech as Evelyn suddenly moved and grabbed him by the throat. I turned as she lifted him with one hand as if it were the easiest thing in the world. The man was young, just out of his youth, and clearly the life he'd led had been a hard one. His blonde hair was shaggy and greasy and his blue eyes were hazy like he was drunk or worse. His teeth were black and rotten as he gasped an apology to Evelyn, kicking and squirming in her grasp. I, I'm sorry. He managed to squeak out. Evelyn smiled a frigid smile. I'm not, she said, and produced a small thin knife from out of nowhere, placing it against the man's heart and slowly pushing in. Blood began to trickle down his chest before increasing to a stream, and it poured down his chest as the blade struck his heart. He struggled in pain but could do nothing against Evelyn and succumbed to death a moment later. Evelyn withdrew her knife, wiped it on the man's shirt, and tossed his corpse aside before going and lounging in the only open table available. The entire inn dead silent, the beating hearts and gulps of fear from men three tables down were audible to my ears as we followed Evelyn and took our seats. Gil gave her a shake of his head and a chuckle, clearly less perturbed about her casual murder than I was. Was that absolutely necessary? Of course not, she said with a grin. But word will quickly spread, and we won't have any more trouble. I'd say that's worth the life of one lowly pickpocket. McKenna sat down with a chuckle. I won't complain. Besides, if it keeps the rabble from getting handsy with us, then I say it's well worth the price. I disagreed wholeheartedly, but I couldn't speak up about it, not when my own hands were stained with blood. I killed because I had to, because Sam or myself would have died otherwise, but that was murder, something I wasn't comfortable with at any level. Sam himself was a murderer, but he always had a good reason for killing. Evelyn may have had a valid reason, but there were other options available that she could have done easily. I sat down heavily, the chair groaning as I dropped my weight on it. Evelyn and the others looked up, saw my face, and frowned. Evelyn picked up a fork and jabbed it at me. Don't even think about it, little queen. You'll just waste your breath. But did you have to? Yes. Now I don't want to hear about it again. I've already forgotten it. With that, she tuned me out and whistled for the barkeep, who had been nervously eyeing us since she'd killed the man. He came over, tray in hand, close to his chest like a shield, and tried to put on a fake smile, but it slipped every other second. What can I get for you today? He stammered. It seemed everyone deferred to Evelyn as she ordered for us. A round of drinks and steak, and it better be fresh. He jumped at her tone and nodded before scurrying back behind the bar. Adam looked over at his sister with a sigh and reached over to flick her lightly on the nose. Your evil is showing, dear sister of man. She laughed. And your point being? Nothing, he said, grinning. 
just being a dutiful brother and pointing out your shortcomings. Evelyn laughed and began toying with the fork still in her hand, making a balance on the tips of her fingers, looking over at me and my sullen face. She sighed. All right, little queen, because I actually like you and it seems not everyone agrees with my decision, I'll stick to clear, justifiable murder going forward, fair? It was probably the best I could ever hope for, so I nodded. Thank you, Evelyn. After that, the mood lightened around our table. A few different conversations picked up between the guild. Gil and McKenna talked to themselves, discreetly holding hands under the table, which I thought was the cutest thing I'd ever seen. Tegan and Kira were sitting together on a chair, each of them fighting for more room on the small chair, until I picked up Kira and put her in my lap. She smirked at Tegan and leaned back into me. See? Told you Eris loves me more. She does not, Tegan retorted. Right, Aunt Eris? I reached over and patted his head. Of course. I love you both equally. Kira's hair was windswept, so while we waited for our drinks, I combed through her hair with my fingers, untangling the knots. By the time I tamed the chaos of her hair, the barkeep returned with an even larger tray filled with glass mugs brimming with a deep brown and red liquid. Far trip specialty. Blackberry mead. On the house, he said, setting the drinks down and leaving, going through a door in the back wall that led to the kitchen from the scents of food that wafted out. I picked up a glass and savored the bittersweet aroma that drifted to my nose. My mouth watered at the prospect of drinking it, and I was about to take a sip when Kira grabbed my arm. Can I have some? She asked. Tegan perked up at that as well and raised his hand. Me too, me too. Should I give them some? It seemed harmless enough, but I wanted to make sure it was okay before I let them have any. I took a sip and marveled at the sweetness of the blackberries before I reached the small bite of the alcohol. It was sweet and smooth, and if they didn't drink too much, I figured it would be fine to let them have a taste. They each took turns as I warned them of only a sip and they both delighted in the taste, lighting up and reaching for more, but I took it from them. As the barkeep passed by our table, I waved him down. Can I get two small glasses of watered-down mead for the children? Right away, miss, he said, and quickly brought over two glasses. Soon after, our food was ready and we dug in, each of us delighting in the fresh meat and drink. I joined in the conversation with Gil and McKenna when they brought up Sam and Aldrust. They were trying to figure out how Sam could possibly complete his task, but keeping the specifics vague since there was a chance we could be overheard. I had never been to the Kingdom of the Dwarves, so I was useless in providing any help, but it was interesting to listen to them talk about it. I knew that most of the city was deep underground, but from the way they were talking about it, it was far larger than I originally thought. So you think he has a chance? Gil asked. McKenna thought about it for a minute before sighing and shaking her head. She was about to say something, but I interjected. Of course he does. He's the most stubborn man I've ever met, human or hive. He'll be fine, I said, putting as much hope that I was right into my words. McKenna smiled and patted my shoulder. You're right. He'll be fine. We ate, drank, and talked for another few hours, enjoying resting after several days in the saddle. Eventually, the number of patrons started dwindling, some heading upstairs with a number of women after exchanging coin. It seemed a strange practice, so I asked Adam about it. He was taking a sip of mead at the time and coughed and spluttered when I spoke up, causing everyone to burst out laughing. Uh, those are, um, prostitutes, uh, women who exchange sex for money. What a strange practice, I replied. Though humans and entomancers view sex differently, so that's probably why. What do you mean? McKenna asked. In my culture, because of the way women were treated, Sexual intimacy was traded rather than bought, especially between the nobility. It was used as a way to further secure favors or trade agreements. Hold up, McKenna said, setting down her mead. So your people just passed the women around whenever it was convenient for them? Essentially. Fucking disgusting, she said, draining the rest of her ale. Were well, you ever treated like that? Evelyn asked out of the blue, eyeing me intently. Oh, um, no. No, I wasn't. I said, blushing. I was the heir to a powerful family, even before my mother became queen. My purity was too valuable to waste. That means our dear guild leader was your first, she said, smiling. I nodded. He was. I admit, he's pretty good in the sack, right? 
Before I could respond, Gil slammed his mug down. All right, that exceeds the amount of girl talk I can handle for the evening. I'm heading to bed. Evelyn McKenna just laughed, but Adam held up his hands in prayer and mouthed, Thank you. The inn only had two rooms available, so we were forced to bunk together. Gil and Adam in one room, with me, Evelyn, McKenna, and the children in the other. Our room was the last door at the top of the stairs and could barely be called a room. It was cramped with two small beds and a nightstand in the middle. From the darkened window, I could just make out the light of the moon reflecting off the bog water in the marshlands in the distance. McKenna complained about the heat, so I opened the windows, letting in the humid night air and chattering of insects. On reflex, I opened the hive mind and spread my consciousness throughout the little ones while the other two got undressed, and Tegan and Kira crawled over the bed and under it. Despite the rambunctious nature of the children, they were barely making a sound as they chased each other under the covers. I turned back to the window, leaning out and letting the thick, moist air lick at my sweat-stained skin. It was lovely while I pushed my consciousness further, trying to build my magical tolerance. It was only thanks to this that I got a look at something that made no sense. There were people out in the marsh, a lot of them, well over three dozen. And as I pushed my reach, I found there were even more circling the town. I don't know what they're doing, but it can't be good. I need to warn the others. There are a lot of men in the marshes surrounding the town. Dozens of them, maybe more, I said, turning to the others. As a credit to both women, they were up out of bed and alert in seconds, throwing on clothes and drawing weapons. McKenna pulled a handful of her needles free and started dipping them in some sharp, noxious-smelling liquid from her belt. I'll go wake the others. Eris, can you use your magic to control the insects in the marsh? I caught her meaning at once and nodded, pulling my consciousness to the most potent of my little ones. You want me to attack them? Yep, slow them down and kill a few if you can. What if they're good people? I asked. Kill or be killed, little queen. I believe this counts as justifiable murder to me. I knew her words were the truth and I had no reason to expect the people in the marsh harbored anything but ill toward us and the town. Last time we were ambushed, we nearly died. I won't hesitate like that again. With my mind made up, I focused every facet of my being into my creatures. There were simply too many men and women hiding in the swamplands to get them all, but it seemed they were just waiting for orders. So I went looking for the leader, but quickly realized I would never find them just by their attire alone. Okay, so new plan, I guess. Let's go after the biggest ones, the ones that look the most trouble. They all looked like trouble, but there were plenty of large men who oozed danger. There were fewer venomous spiders in the swamp, but I took what few I had and had them crawl up the men. It took a few minutes to get the thirty or so to make their way to my intended targets. When the last crawled up, I gave the order to attack. Using all the stored up venom in the spiders, they each bit down on the necks of the brigands. A few pained shrieks slipped from the marshlands but they quickly quieted. The venom was lethal over time in small doses, but by pouring every last drop into their systems, their nervous systems would soon seize up and begin shutting down their bodies, paralyzing them and killing them quickly after. The insect bites were noticed but brushed off as just being outside near insects. Only potent anti-venom would save them, but it was far too late for that. Gil and the others came into the room, and I released the control of the hive mind. One look at me and Gil pulled a mana potion from his inventory and handed it to me. I hadn't noticed, but I was a little shaky, and I greedily drank down the potion, sighing as energy flooded into my muscles. Thank you, Gil. Don't mention it. I managed to bite about half their number, but depending on the individual people, they might still be able to fight even with the venom in their system, though the majority should start feeling the effects any moment now. He walked over to the window, peering out at something, and nodded. All right. I bet when they see their men go down, they charge ahead and surround the town. That or call off the whole thing. But when has our luck ever gone that way? What do we do? I asked. We get set up. Come on, he said and left the room. I followed after him and we headed back downstairs to the bar. All the tables had been overturned and Adam had summoned the shades again. They were in the process of dismantling the chairs and turning the chair legs into miniature spears. Evelyn pulled out a few weapons, a short sword, two daggers, and a long sword. She was in the process of deciding which one to go with, taking practice swings with each of them. A barbaric yawp sounded in the distance, followed by a war horn. Guess the venom finally took effect. The others tensed at the sound, and Evelyn quickly chose her short sword. I looked around, finding one missing. Where's McKenna? I asked. 
A chuckle from above drew my gaze. Though I didn't see anything at first, it took me a second to spot McKenna hidden in the shadows on one of the support beams. What was even more surprising was that Tegan and Kira were up there as well, grinning down at me. Both of them had a singular dagger in hand, and I was terrified for them, but wasn't going to dissuade them of helping. They're fast, faster than almost any human. I trust them if they think they can help. I didn't like it, but if they could help, then let them. The thudding of boots got louder until a mixture of new sounds joined the pounding feet. High-pitched screams and the clang of clashing steel. A battle raged outside, and too soon it reached the inn. Pounding loud enough to wake the dead assaulted the door in front of us, and it was strong enough to force the cheap metal hinges to bend inward. Less than half a minute later, the door cracked and was forced out of the doorway. It crashed down to the floor, and half a dozen men and women flooded into the space. Before they even took a single step further, McKenna attacked, flinging out with her poisoned needles. Four of them hit their targets, but the rest pinged off armor or mist and thudded into the soft wooden floor. While the enemy tried to figure out what had attacked them, McKenna withdrew a small knife with a curved blade and dropped from the support beams, slashing out with her knife as she landed in the center of the mob. One of the men who hadn't been hit with her poison dropped to the ground with his throat slashed open, spilling a fountain of blood across the floor. The others turned to engage McKenna, but she simply flowed around their weak strikes and consumed their entire attention, which is when Kira and Tegan struck from behind. They were smart and aimed for the ones furthest and back and killed them with brutal efficiency. They dropped, killed their targets, and darted away in three seconds. I was immensely proud of them. The men poisoned by McKenna dropped to the ground, lifeless, and she deftly slipped back around our makeshift barricade. In ten seconds, we'd killed the opening wave of invaders, but there were still many more outside to deal with. Shades, scout ahead, Adam commanded. The three wispy doppelgangers marched outside and joined in the fray. A minute went by before a sharp crack of glass shattered through the sounds of battle, and the crystal flew back to Adam's outstretched hands. He sighed and pocketed the crystal. That's what I get for sending the newbies. Evelyn sauntered out from behind the bar, drink in hand as if she didn't have a care in the world. She knocked back the liquor and smiled, her golden yellow eyes glinting in the firelight. Let's go join the fun, shall we? We exited the inn to a bloody victory. Even with their decimated numbers, the gang of bandits had made short work of the town. A few villagers who'd fought back were dead, slaughtered like livestock and left where they fell. No building was left unbroken or unlooted, and the few villagers who were left alive were huddled together in the center of a mob. More than twenty bandits surrounded the inn, the last building standing. All of them had their weapons out and were half a second away from engaging. Gil, McKenna, and I went out first, and the leader of this gang of bandits stepped forward. He was tall, burly, and brutish, with hair the color of fresh straw a day after harvest, that trailed down to his lower back and a thick beard that obscured half of his face though his hazel eyes were alight with bloodlust. He wore heavy plated armor and carried a giant sword that was bigger than I was. He swaggered over to us and laughed. Couple of fighters, eh? Well then, you'll have the pleasure of facing Bandit King Casimir in combat, he said with a wide grin. Who's gonna be my first victim? I believe we'll take you up on that offer, Cass, Evelyn said, walking out with Adam by her side. One look at Evelyn and Casimir deflated. His entire personality shifted, and pure and utter terror paled through him. His eyes widened, and his sword fell from his grip. He dropped to his knees and held up his hands. I didn't know. I swear I didn't. Both Evelyn and Adam's personalities shifted slightly. They gained an air about them that I couldn't identify, but it stopped me from speaking up. I settled back and watched as they approached Casimir. That is a shame, Cass, Adam said. You were always my favorite, too. One of the men, a younger man with hair spiked in every direction, marched over, cocksure as could be, and loudly proclaimed, I don't know who the fuck you are, but you need to show King Cass some respect. Before he could finish his speech, one of the other men ran him through. The man didn't have time to scream as the blade pierced his heart and he dropped to the ground. The man who'd killed him dropped to his knees and bowed low to Adam and Evelyn. Please forgive us, Empress Evelyn. Chapter 11 Aldrust Samson Good night.
I said, and hung up. I sat back and stared up at the black sky, lonelier than I'd been in a very long time. I used to spend days without talking or feeling the need to be around other people, but now I was drowning without Eris by my side. A couple of days, and we'll be back together. I can deal with things for a couple days. Though, I didn't actually believe that. I fingered my teeth, running my fingers over them for the hundredth time. Still can't wrap my head around them. Fucking hell aspect. It just laughed and sent a wave of cold dripping down my spine. I shivered and took another drink of whiskey, trying to banish its lingering whisper inside. It was late, and I needed sleep. But Raven had already turned in after the episode with my teeth, and I wasn't ready to share a tent with her just yet. So I settled for drinking. We'd reach Aldrus tomorrow, and I'd get a refill, so I polished off the rest of the flask in an hour. And when I was suitably drunk enough to stomach the thought of sleeping next to Raven, I turned in myself. Raven was out like a light in the left corner of the tent. She curled over on her side and was wearing only a pair of black satin panties and nothing else. The pale of her back was to me, her toned muscles rising and falling with each breath. Her midnight hair covered her torso like a blanket. I put my back to her and climbed into my sleeping bag. I bunched my pillow under my elbow and forced myself to sleep. Rustling from beside me woke me what must have been only minutes after I'd fallen asleep, but daylight streamed through the seams in the tent, basking the small room in early twilight. Morning, Raven called from beside me. I rolled over to find her right next to me, sitting cross-legged, still naked from the waist up. Raven had light pink nipples surrounded by a perky full bust that jostled as she roughly gathered up her hair with a tie stuck in her mouth. I averted my gaze with a chuckle. What's with the women of my life and exhibitionism? It's more comfortable sleeping like this, she said, deadpan, as she pulled the tie from her mouth and wrapped it around her mess of black hair. You and my wife would get along well, I said, climbing to my feet. Just get dressed and meet me outside. I left the tent and began packing our supplies. By the time I was done, Raven had dressed in her leather armor and was ready to go. I broke down the tent, and we set off as soon as it was done. Raven shifted, and we took to the skies. Even on the second day, it was still exhilarating flying, and I loved it as we soared high above the desert. We flew for a couple of hours and only slowed when the desert gave way to tufts of greenery and trees. The beating heat of the desert faded to lush greenlands for an hour or two until we reached the edge of Aldrust's territory. A huge wall made of dirt and rock rose up thirty feet in a circle, covering the entirety of the territory of Aldrust. Though ninety percent was underground, there was a standing force on the surface to guard the wall and maintain a few small farms. That's a big wall, Raven said as we got close. Yeah, but keep away from it, unless you want to get shot down. Good point. Though I couldn't see them from this high up, I knew there were guards stationed around the wall, ready to engage with anything that threatened them. Raven dipped low, and we landed about a mile away from the entrance to the city. She shifted back into her human form, and we started walking. I was grateful for the exercise. Sitting atop Raven for hours at a time wasn't the most comfortable thing I'd ever done, and from the way she was walking, the same could be said of letting me fly on her. Let me do the talking when we get to the gate, I said. Raven turned and looked at me. Her blood-red eyes bored into mine, and she shook her head. We're a married couple coming to see an old friend. Magnus has already made all the arrangements. I sighed and tried very hard not to growl at her. It wasn't her fault she was pissing me off. We could just eat her. Her flesh looks tantalizing, the aspect whispered. Oh, shut up. How about you just eat her then? No biting involved. She has a fantastic body and I bet she tastes delicious. You're awfully chatty now that we're away from Illyria. I'm thankful to be away from her. She's terrifying. Well, I wish she'd go back to the silent treatment. I ignored the snide laughter of the aspect and kept walking. So, why are you doing this? Raven asked after about five minutes of silence. Doing what? This, all of it, Raven said, throwing her hands up. You don't seem like the following orders type. Well, I'm not but something big is going on, and I don't really have a choice in the matter anymore. 
I've got to figure out what's going on with the world and help stop it, even if that means working with Magnus. Even if it means doing bad things to good people? I snorted. I've done a lot worse for much less. At least this time, I'm helping. Raven didn't respond. Instead, she clammed up and wore a contemplative expression across her face while we reached the entrance to Aldrust. The massive wall of stone, earth, and grass towered above us, casting us into shadow as we stepped under its gaze. The wall was smooth, completely without blemish, as it circled around the territory of Aldrust. Nearly a dozen soldiers stood by the entrance, which was only an entrance if the guards allowed passage. Otherwise, it was just another part of the wall. We got in line behind nearly a hundred others, all trying to enter Aldrust. Most of them were dwarves, but a few humans stood above the heads of the others. Time passed as Raven and I inched closer to the gate, and then it was finally our turn. The gate guard, a taller dwarf male with more muscle than hair, leered at us, calm and collected. State your business, he said, his voice rough and graveled. We're, I began, but Raven held up a hand and cut me off. We're here on our honeymoon, visiting an old friend, Orindrell, she said with a smile. The gate guard nodded. Toxes too, Silver he said and held out his hand. Raven pulled out a few gold coins and dropped them into his palm, and even the stony-faced guard's eyes widened at the money. He turned, held out his empty hand, and spoke a short rolling incantation in script. His hand glowed a light brown as the script circle popped into existence and swirled, ethereal, around his palm. When he finished speaking, the circle faded away, and a thick slab of stone opened in the wall. The gate guard waved us through, and as soon as we were inside, the door slammed shut behind us. Inside the wall was a long passageway made of stone and lined with torches that flickered every couple of feet. Before we'd taken a single step, I whirled on Raven and shoved her against the wall. My finger pressed against her cheek. Don't ever speak for me again, you understand? She nodded, a smile pressing at her lips. I understand. Good, I said and backed off her turning and walking down the hall. Raven followed, her steps clacking quickly behind me as she caught up. We walked in silence, but there was a pep in Raven's step that hadn't been there before. Excited? I asked. What? She asked, her face flushing scarlet. I mean, a little? Well, we've got some time to kill today. We can look around. It'll be beneficial to get the lay of the land regardless. Oh, yes, the city, of course, she said turning away from me for a moment. I left the quirky shifter to her own devices and stepped through the heavy wrought iron door that led to the upper farmland. The sun was high in the sky overhead, and after being in the cool shadows for an hour, I welcomed the heat. Dozens of large natural stone buildings were all around us, along with an abundance of farmland. The earthy scent of freshly tilled dirt and vegetation permeated every inch. Dwarves toiled away at their farms with smiles on their faces as they worked and they had good reason for those smiles. Why is everyone so thrilled to be doing manual labor? Raven asked, confused. Because each and every one of the dwarves working are all dressed best. High nobility, war heroes, Lackmerel's chosen disciples. They've all done something of great importance to have earned their farms. That doesn't make sense. The reward for hard work is more work? Essentially, but the farms are more than just farms. They're status symbols to the dwarves. She chuckled, shaking her head, but I let her be. It didn't really make sense to me either when I first came here. We passed by the farmlands and walked to the entrance of Aldrust. It was basically a gigantic elevator that lowered us down to the city, but it was powered by teams of dwarves and their earth magic. We stepped on it, and after some words in script, we descended. Elevators didn't bother me, but for someone like Raven, who hadn't even been on one before, she was having a blast. Her head darted around as the stone block we were on grumbled and shook as we went deeper into the earth. When we stopped at the lower level, Raven's excitement abated, but it surged right back up as we stepped into the city. Even after seeing it dozens of times, I never really got over its majesty. Everything was carved out of stone. Stone houses and manors rose from the very earth itself. Carved stone formed everything from the streets and stairways to the lampposts that held shining blue monocrystals as they lined the winding roads in all directions. Aldrust was a never-ending maze spreading like the roots of a tree in all directions, all with the level of detail and craftsmanship that would put even the most skilled human hands to shame. High above us, nestled into the rocky ceiling, 
stood the largest cluster of monocrystals in the world. The cluster was the size of Castle Gloom Harbor and pulsed with radiant blue light, creating a facsimile of a sun underground. Wow, I've never seen anything like it before, Raven exclaimed, grabbing my arm. I nodded. It was always something to behold. I let Raven take in the sights for a long moment while I tried to see through the chaos of the streets. All right, enough gawking. Let's get to walking. It's changed since I've last been here, and I want to get a feel for the place. Raven nodded. We've got time. Our meeting isn't supposed to be until this evening, so we can sightsee as much as you want. Well, if that's the case, might as well go visit the rail, since I have time. I want to stop by a friend's shop. It's in Silver Midtown. She held her hand out. Lead the way. While technically we were already in Midtown, the rail shop would be a couple miles further down. It would take a little navigating to get there, but there was always a pattern with the way the dwarves laid out the city. Even when they remodeled it every couple years, there was always a reason for it. The streets were filled with hundreds of dwarves going about their day. The men headed to the mines or manual labor jobs, while the women minded the shops. We stepped around a dwarf woman with long red hair carrying a basket of produce. She'd nimbly wound around us with a wave of apology. If the women weren't so short, they'd actually be very attractive. I was careful not to run into anyone and grabbed Raven's hand as we crossed a few streets and wound up at one of the stretches of market. Thick stone stalls lined the streets, with merchants peddling anything we could ever need. There wasn't anything I needed at the moment, so I pulled Raven along and tried to disengage us from the throng of patrons and sellers. After some careful maneuvering, we'd gotten off Merchant Street and hit the stairs that wound down the city. This place is packed, Raven said, sticking close to me. Well, despite the size of this place, dwarves like sticking close to one another. I think it has something to do with safety in numbers. In case of cave-ins, things like that? Most likely. I shrugged and stepped down the second flight of stairs. Dwarves never made much sense to me, but I didn't bother questioning some of their quirks. They made the best weapons and armor on Nexus, and that was good enough for me. It took around half an hour to reach the rail shop. I had to do some asking around, and an elderly dwarf pointed us in the right direction. The rail shop hadn't changed since the last I'd been there. The outside was stone, with wide bay windows on each wall. Even from here, the heat was intense. Heavy smoke curled around the gray trim and floated skyward. An attached storehouse contained every tool or instrument involved in crafting, and each hung in neat order along the walls and in specific spots on the shelves. I crept up to the window, where loud clanging sounded from just inside. Thorell sat banging away at a long hunk of metal on an anvil. He was tall for a dwarf, round five feet, and skinnier than most, but wiry cords of muscle clung unevenly to his frame. He had a thin, scarred face from years of metalwork and thick blonde hair that had been pulled back into an intricate braid that matched the pattern of his long beard. The rail, I shouted between hammer strikes. He stopped mid-swing and turned, squinting. Durin? Yep. The rail hopped up from his seat, a wide smile across his face. How's my favorite human? Busy. You got a few minutes? I asked. He looked back at his project and to me. For you. Always. He waved me in. Raven and I went around to the door, a smooth portion of the wall. The door slid under the ground without so much as a scrape, and Thorell stood in the doorway, still smiling. He took one look at me, and his smile fell. You go back to Robin? He asked, scratching his head. Not that I'm aware of. Why? He pointed at me with all five of his fingers. Then how the hell did you come by a set of Aaron Mora armor? My jaw dropped. I looked down and back at the rail. No way. I'd know his craft anywhere, he said, craning his neck past me to look at Raven. Good on you for settling down. Was worried you'd die before you found someone to put up with you. But where are my manners? Come in. There's a story here I want told. We entered his cramped home. My head barely missed hitting the top of the doorframe. Inside, his home wasn't much better, and I resorted to a high crouch to avoid bashing my skull against the ceiling. Thorell led us to his living room and offered us a chair. While made of stone, the chair was rather comfortable, and the thick woolen cover kept us from freezing. So, how'd you manage to land such a lovely young woman? He asked, glancing at Raven. Oh, we're, it's a long story, Raven said, interrupting me. Took too long for me to convince him we were meant to be, but I'm persistent. Ha! Good on ya. He's a stubborn one, but not bad folk, all things considered. 
Thorell laughed and slapped his knee. Let me go grab us a drink. I'll be right back. As soon as Threll left the room, I glared death at Raven. I thought I told you never to speak for me. What else was I supposed to do? She hissed at me. We're supposed to be a couple. That's the cover story. Or did you forget what you're trying to do here? I gripped my knee, digging my fingernails hard into the leather, trying not to lash out at her. Fine. By the time Thorell got back with three glasses of dwarven whiskey, I'd calmed myself. He handed me my glass, and I downed the three fingers in one gulp. Still like your drink, eh? Never met a human who could drink a dwarf under the table before I met you, Thrill laughed. So, if you ain't running with the clans again, how'd you get the armor? You could barely afford mine, and Aaron's is a hundred times more expensive. I was about to explain when Raven turned to me. Clans? You used to be a bandit? She frowned, her mouth set in a hard line long time ago. She glanced at her untouched drink on the table, grabbed it, slammed it back, and stood. Raven walked out of the house without a word. What's that about? No clue, I said. I didn't much know or care about what was going on with Raven. It wasn't my concern. Instead, I turned back to Thorell, and we caught up. He told me about the day-to-day -day comings and goings in Aldrust. I hoped for some usable intel, but it turned out to be nothing but gossip, nothing that would help during the heist. I told him about recent events, leaving out certain key aspects to avoid confusion. I couldn't tell him about Eris because of the cover story, but I told him about Magnus, leaving out his name and passing him off as just a rich nobleman. After about an hour of polite conversation, I checked the time and made my excuses. Well, why don't you and the girl have dinner with me and the missus before you leave? Della would love to see you again. Could never miss a chance to have more of her cave mushroom soup. We shook hands, and Thorell clapped me on the back. Damn good to see you again, Durin. Oh, before I forget, wait right here. Thorell disappeared back into his home for a long minute. A few soft curses followed, some clamoring of boxes and things being moved around. He came back a short minute later and held out his hand. Was a custom order for a customer, but they didn't like the design, so I redid it. Meant to put this up for sale, but just never got around to it. He handed me a long black knife forged from shadow steel in a sleek black leather sheath meant to hang scout style at my lower back. I was missing my hunting knife, so this was absolutely perfect. The thought of what I was about to do sickened me, but I fought it down and smiled. It's absolutely perfect, Thorell. What do I owe you? Nothing, he said with a wave. Already got 15000 for your last repairs. Meant to send this with it as a gift, but I forgot. Just hope you'll stop by more often in the future. I will. I waved goodbye and left. Raven stood outside, leaning against the wall of Thorell's storehouse. I secured the knife to my belt as I walked over to her. She glanced at me and looked away, quickly. Stow whatever your problem is. It doesn't matter and won't help the job, I said, walking past her. She didn't immediately follow, but caught up before I reached the stairs that led to Copper Lowtown. Ass, she muttered softly to herself, but it was amplified in the narrow stairwell. Sometimes, yeah. What, you don't like that I used to be a bandit? She shook her head. It doesn't matter. Let's just go, she said, pushing past me. I shoved my hand against the wall, blocking her path. I stared into her crimson visage, into the thin circle of her iris and the black dot of her pupil. I've taken lives and coin with little regard for either. There's no justification for the things I've done, but it's in the past. Can't change it, even if I wanted to. Now we have a job to do, and I need to know that I can count on you, that you'll have my back. Can we work together? Or is this too much of an issue for you? Raven stepped back, her heel half on the step above her and crossed her arms. I guess I have no choice. We always have a choice. I headed down the stairs without looking back. There was slight hesitation, but Raven followed less than a minute later. By the time we reached Lowtown, I was dying to stop at the closest tavern and drink away my frustrations. But according to Raven, our meeting place was deeper in. What's the place called? I asked, stopping as we stepped down to the rough streets of Lowtown. Low Road Bar, Raven replied. Well, let's find it quick. I'm ready for an ale or more whiskey. We walked the Lowtown streets cautiously my hand resting on my sword. Lowtown wasn't any more dangerous than walking the streets of Central at night, but if we got pegged as a mark, we were in for a bad time. 
I just projected confidence and kept an arm around Raven, despite my distaste for her. Someone takes a fancy to her, and that'll just lead to trouble. I don't need to dodge a murder charge today, not when we have a heist to plan. We meandered seemingly at leisure until we found the bar a mile down the street. It was formed from rock and stone like the rest of the buildings in Aldrust, but the level of craftsmanship in Copper Lowtown was considered shoddy by the inhabitants of Midtown and Hightown. The stone was chipped and hadn't been repaired recently, and the slanted slate roof was missing tiles. There were no windows, but there was a crude pipe wedged into a hole near the roof, which belted smoke in a constant stream. A sign hanging from a broken chain told us it was the bar we were looking for. The Low Road Bar. This is the place. Let's eat and drink our fill, then let's have the shifter for dessert. What's with you and blood lately? It's delicious and slakes my thirst. Just a couple drops and I'll be satisfied. Oh, hell no, I said, and shook off the lingering mental chill the aspect brought, ignoring the quizzical look from Raven, and entered the bar. Subtle music mixed with the hum of the patrons. The bar was packed with dwarves, humans, and even one of the fae. She was bartending, which was a strange place to find a fairy. I turned to Raven and let go of her hand. Find your contact and come get me when you're done. She stopped and paused, raising an eyebrow. You don't want to go with me? I'd rather drink. Besides, consider this an olive branch. I expect you to fill me in completely when you're done. I'm choosing to trust you. Don't make me regret it. Trusting her goes against my nature, but right now she doesn't trust me and that could go bad if we get backed into a corner. She nodded. I won't. I left her to her own devices and made my way over to the stone bar top. Half a dozen other patrons crowded around the bar, all vying for the attention of the fairy. She was unnaturally beautiful, as all members of the fae are. Long, straight mahogany hair framed her refined face and cherry lips. Her hair fell to her waist and swirled as she moved her hips to the beat of the drums and flute. Her ice-blue eyes swept over me as I reached the counter, and I shivered under the intensity of them. What can I get you? Something strong, I said, pulling out a gold coin and sliding it across the bar. She smiled and swept the coin into her palm, turning to grab a glass and giving me a good look at her back. Her blue tunic and tight black pants were an unusual style of dress for the fae, but she made it look natural. Two slits above her shoulder blades told me where her wings were, but she'd concealed them with illusion magic. She returned a minute later with a tall mug with a bright red liquid that bubbled and fizzed as it threatened to spill its contents over her slender chestnut fingers. Red Goblin Pale Ale, a personal favorite, she said as she sat the mug down. I took a cursory sip. It was tart and hoppy as hell, but delicious. The fairy came back with my change and counted it out exactly before handing it to me. I took half. Keep the rest. Thank you she said, smiling wide, showing her two rows of pointed teeth. Can I ask your name? Telgenora, but everyone calls me Tell. I nodded and smiled before taking another sip of beer. It's nice to meet you, Tell. It's nice to meet someone who isn't gawking at me. I appreciate it, she said before turning to handle the mob of other customers all demanding her attention. I nursed my drink and listened to the band playing while I kept a sidelong glance at Raven. She sat alone at a stone table in the corner, not talking to anyone, but she kept throwing her eyes my way. I'm not going anywhere, little shifter. Just do your job and we can get out of here. This bar was a decent enough place, but having a creature as beautiful as Tell nearby would only complicate matters. People would do anything for beauty like that, and damn anyone who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Though as Tell flitted around her domain, she kept order really well. One of the scruffier dwarves got a little handsy and grabbed her ass, and he swiftly received a fork stuck through his fingers. The screaming, bleeding dwarf was dragged out of the bar and tossed out in the street while the patrons cheered. Guess she has things under control. Let's break her of that control, drink her dry. I bet her memories are sweet. Oh, God damn it. Look, you sadistic little monster, just wait till we get back home. I'm sure Eris won't mind sharing her blood. A grumbling came from my heart, but the aspect considered my proposal. Fine, I'll behave, for now. The false queen's blood is rich and sweet as sin. You can have her flesh as long as I get her blood again. Deal. Now keep quiet unless you're going to help. 
I finished my drink, and Tell swiftly brought me another one. How'd you like it? She asked. It was perfect. She flashed me another sharp grin and went back to work. She sat up straighter as a thick, black-haired dwarf walked in. So that's Orin. He wore a simple black tunic free of any dirt and a pair of canvas pants. His beard and hair were well-groomed, and his dull green eyes swept the bar in a professional manner. His eyes met mine, and I knew he'd made me. He looked from me to Raven and back again. He jutted his chin toward the table, motioning me to join them. Ah, oh, hell, whatever. I grabbed my drink and ambled over to the table. Raven glanced from me to the contact. Thought you were going to leave this to me? I held my hands up. He made me. Nothing I could do about it, I said and took a drink. Can I have a taste? I slid her my glass while Orin sat down. Raven chugged a third of the beer and let out a sigh of content, thumping the glass against the stone table. Let's get the business, shall we? I said as our dwarf contact pulled out his chair. He smiled and leaned back in the chair. I wasn't told about you. I was told to meet with a red-eyed woman with pale skin and long black hair. A male wasn't part of the arrangement. I don't like this. I'm part of the team. Though I don't know your part in this, I'm sure we'll manage if you want to walk away. Though you would greatly displease our employer, and none of us want that, do we? Orrin blanched slightly, paling as he stroked his beard. All right, you bastard. No need to get nasty. I just wasn't expecting us all. Fluttering from behind me caused me to turn my head. Tell had climbed out from behind her bar and was dancing elegantly our way with a tray of drinks. She stopped and set them down before leaning over and giving Orin a peck on the cheek. On the house. This one was a gentleman, Tell said, thumbing back at me. Orin nodded and ran his hand over Tell's lower back. You're a doll, Tell. She smiled and left back to man the bar, leaving me angry that we'd been had as soon as we stepped foot inside. Tell's your front woman, making sure we're clean. Orin just gave me a toothy smile. Love that woman. Vicious and sweet as syrup. Now, can we get down to business? Raven coughed, speaking up. What we need has already been discussed and payment made. We also need a place to set up for a few nights. For an additional fee, she said, palming a small bag that clinked ever so slightly as she slid it to Orin. He didn't so much as glance at it before stowing it in a pouch by his waist. Understood? I have just a place in mind made with humans in mind so it won't even be cramped. Now that our business has been sorted, I was told to introduce you to the team you're going to be working with, Orin said. He placed his fingers in his mouth and whistled sharply, breaking through the clamor of patrons. Footsteps sounded off the stone outside. Three men from the sound of it. The way this job's gonna go, I'll take whatever help I can get. The men were all human scruffy and scarred from years of hard service and questionable decisions. The two in front were both nondescript, brown hair, one long and wavy while the other was short, nearly buzzed to his scalp. The longer-haired man had bloodshot blue eyes and the other brown. I took them in. Decent leather armor, but worn and scratched, which formed into a rich patina. They had swords bolted at their hips, but they weren't the highest quality. I promptly discounted them. They were nothing but fodder. Maybe level 40 at best with mid-tier gear. They wouldn't be worth much. The third man, however, was a different story entirely. He was tall and thin. Old Japanese heritage gave him a nearly lanky appearance, but there was too much lean muscle courting down his warm cedar skin. Thick veins writhed to the surface as he clenched his hands tight, flushing the color from his knuckles. His long jet black hair was pulled back in a top knot, out of his once soft face that had been chiseled in recent years, as his skin stretched thin over his cheeks and slim, hard-set jawline. The man locked eyes with me, and cold fury stoked the warm brown in his iris as he strolled across the tavern. Mika, his fist, slammed into my nose before I could even rise from my chair. Chapter 12 Bittersweet Blood my head snapped to the side as the cartilage in my nose burst and spilled red-hot agony over my lips. I careened out of the chair and landed hard on my side before sprawling across the floor. I braced myself for a beating, but nothing more came my way. Mika hadn't moved from where he'd knocked my block off. 
I stood and picked up the chair before I looked at my old friend. The tension in the air changed drastically with that singular punch. Raven reacted harshly, sprouting her midnight wings and claws. The others reacted to her and drew arms while I threw my hands up in a panic. Hold the fuck up. No one move. Though we could have heard the drop of a pin, if anyone had dropped a pin, we'd have torn each other apart just at a pure reaction. The other patrons of the bar saw the writing on the wall and beat a hasty retreat, leaving only the seven of us. Raven grimaced, nearly snarling at the others while they stared wide-eyed at her expansive wings and wicked talons. That man assaulted you. This breaches the contract. Why are we just standing here? Because, I said, brushing the blood off my mouth and spitting what dripped into my mouth on the floor. I deserve that. At least that. But that settles our score, Mika said, cracking a smile as the fire faded from his eyes. It's been a long time, old friend. Too long. Now you gonna get over here and hug me, or do I have to break your nose again? I crossed the room and clapped the man who'd once been a brother to me on the back. Mika wore shadow steel, like me, which made our hug awkward, to say the least, but the meaning behind it was clear. I let go of him and stood back. I'd recognize the rails work anywhere, but come on, Mika, you look like a damned samurai from the movies back on Earth. Even have the katana, though it's certainly an upgrade from the original Takamikazuchi back in the swords, eh? I call it Taka 3.0. His armor was black shadow steel, but his sword was shiver steel its silver blade accented by the black tsuka ito wrapped around the handle. It was certainly a beautiful sword, on par with any hero tier weapon. Might even give my new blade a run, though shiver steel would chip and crack, even as it bit through my shadow steel. So we're not fighting, right? Raven asked, still in a combat stance. No, we're not, I replied, waving at her to sit down while I took my own seat. We're all friends here, barring the hired help over there. The two rent thugs scowled at me. Their hands twitched to their swords, but Mika held up his hand. Stand down. He's the leader of the Gloom Knights. You both know what that means. The two men nodded and sat down without another word. God's damn, have some fucking pride. Normally I afforded other rent thugs an amount of professional courtesy, but the two men that had been hired were poor excuses for mercenaries. Their armor and swords were cheap and they had the battle-hardened looks of seasoned men, which meant they skimped on their gear to save profits. A choice only fools would make. I know I joked about your armor, Mika, but at least you know how to play the game. He snorted and sat next to me. True, but it's just like you to antagonize your comrades when we're about to go into what sounds like, by all counts, a really fucked-up situation. You haven't changed. I sighed. I wish that was true. Mika drummed his fingers on the table. I know we have business to discuss, but how have you been? That's a complicated question. Can't be more complicated than how things ended between you and Lonnie, he replied. I chuckled. You'd be surprised. But speaking of, I ran into Ascalon not too long ago. He paused mid-drink. And how'd that go? Couldn't have gone worse if I'd resurrected Sophia only to kill her in front of him. Whisper's lips. Mika cursed. Though, if you can joke about Soph, you must be doing better. I'm getting there, I whispered. Mika smiled and drained his mug. Well, we'll have all the time in the world to catch up properly when we've got what we're after and our richest kings. Your boss is footing the bill for this quest. That means you're calling the shots. What's the plan, D? I stood up and Raven followed suit. For now, recon. Considering the stakes, I'm not leaving anything to chance. In the morning, we're going to scout the location and assess the situation. What your team could do for me is work high town, listen to rumors, monitor foot traffic, you know the drill. Mika and his team nodded. Operational budget? Spread some gold around quietly. I'll reimburse whatever you spend. Understood. With that, our business concluded for the evening, and I was looking forward to some much-needed rest. Mika and his team departed with plans to meet up the following day to discuss our plan. Well, might as well follow me, Orn said as they left. Raven and I stood and swiftly exited the tavern behind him. It wasn't cold enough to fog my breath, but as we stepped onto the street, Raven shivered. I barely noticed the chill. The air outside was fresh compared to the heated confines of the bar, but even with as much wide open space above us, the air was still a little stagnant. 
We caught up with Orin a short jog later just before he rounded a corner and disappeared from view. He didn't so much as look at us as we fell into step behind him, but he did pick up his speed as we crossed side streets and alleyways until he reached a small residential street. Two rows of houses stood side by side as we walked down the street to the last house. It was a modest dwarven two-story, though I was hoping Orin's comment meant it would be spacious inside, but it was nondescript, nothing that would distinguish it from any of the other houses on the street. The roof was flat rather than slanted, and I was betting it had a roof hatch so we could escape if needed. Orin walked up the steps to the front door, which was nothing but a thick slab of stone, and spoke a few words in script. The stone slid under the ground and revealed a quaint entryway. He motioned us inside and followed behind us, raising the stone slab with his magic once more. I have no clue if either of you can use earth magic, but there are a few scrolls etched with a spell next to the door. Bath is upstairs, but there's limited hot water, just letting you know. I gave the place a once-over, just making sure we were alone. It was unequivocally dwarven, with a lot of stone furniture and plenty of furs and blankets draped over everything. Wood was a luxury Copper Lowtown couldn't afford, so they made do. Thank you. I'm assuming the rest of our supplies will be provided, Raven asked. Or nodded. I'll bring them by tomorrow. With those parting words, he departed leaving us alone in the quiet stone house. Before we'd really taken a step inside, a loud grumble caught my attention. I glanced over at Raven, whose cheeks flushed with embarrassment. Sorry. You hungry? She shook her head. It can wait. I could eat. Been a while since I had dwarven cooking. I snagged a scroll by the door and waved her over. Let's grab some food. I know a good place. Do you have any dress clothes? Raven nodded. In my bag? I pulled it out and mine at the same time. Good, let's get dressed and head to Hightown. It's rather expensive, but with Magnus paying, we've got plenty of money. She didn't put up a fight, and we quickly threw on our clothes. Thanks to Magnus, I had plenty of perfectly tailored outfits and chose one at random. It was black with light gold around the collar, and hugged my frame nicely. Raven wore a variation on the black dress she'd had on earlier in the day, though this one was more modest, only hinting at her upper chest without dipping down. When we were both suitably presentable, I led her up, back through the miles of winding staircases, stopping only briefly at each landing so we wouldn't sweat and stain our nice clothes. It took about an hour, but we were both vanished by the time we found our way to the Oak Door, a single-story stone building with gold-trimmed tile for the roof, as its name suggested. The entrance housed a massive, incredibly detailed door made from solid oak. It was a testament to how profitable the restaurant was that they could even afford the wood. We stepped inside and were immediately warmed by the roaring fire in the fireplace by the host's stand. An immaculate dwarf in a simple black suit inclined his head to us. Two, he asked, holding up two fingers. I nodded, and he escorted us to our table and brought crystal glasses with ice-cold water and stood at attention as we settled in our chairs. We have several dishes on the menu tonight, sir and madam. He proceeded to list off the meals we could order, but as he listed the third, I knew that's exactly what I wanted. I'll have the brown butter-basted steak, I said, trying not to salivate. The same, Raven replied. Excellent choice. It's one of my favorites, the dwarf said. Might I recommend a dry red to pair with your meal? The tannins in the wine help bring a near-perfect balance with the meat. I wasn't much of a wine person, but the conviction in which the dwarf spoke left no room for debate. That would be lovely. I'll bring your drinks out right away, he said and departed. Raven looked around the room, and then back to me. I have to admit, this is a nice restaurant. Cozy. Expensive. But the meal will be well worth it. I folded my hands together and glanced at Raven, who had a peculiar expression on her face. I opened my mouth to speak, but quickly closed it, as the silence stretched. Well, this is awkward. I spent the whole trip distancing myself from her, but now I can't even make polite conversation. Even if she's a shifter. I can suffer through a single meal with her, at least. So, how long have you been working for Magnus? I finally managed to eke out. Working? She scoffed. Nice way to say slavery, but to answer your question, about five years now? I shrugged. Would you call it slavery if you willingly put yourself in that position? No one forced you to sign your life away to the Alice. I began, but stopped, my mouth strangling the rest of the sentence before it could spill out. I threw up my hands. Fuck, I really can't have a civilized conversation with you, can I? 
Raven was about to respond when the waiter returned with our drinks and an open bottle of red wine. Enjoy, he said, and departed. I picked up my glass and drained it quickly, barely tasting the hints of cassis and plum as it swirled over my tongue. Raven did the same with hers, and as she finished her drink, she laughed. It's okay. I hate myself too, if it matters. But how about for this dinner? You forget I'm a shifter, and I forget you're an asshole, and we just pretend we enjoy each other's company. I laughed louder than I meant, and quickly covered my mouth as several of the nearby tables turned in my direction. Raven lit up in surprise at my sudden outburst. Her eyes widened, and her mouth lifted in a genuine smile. The first I'd seen on her. It made her glow. And for a second, I did forget that she was a shapeshifter. She was just Raven in that instant and I couldn't fight the smile that crawled over my lips. But reality set in, and the moment passed. My smile fell, but Ravens lingered for a moment longer. Our food arrived a short while later, and we both dug in. While discussing meaningless things, we stumbled our way into a facsimile of polite conversation. We finished our meal, polished off the entire bottle of wine, and half another. Nothing was waiting for either of us back at the safe house, so I thought, why not stay and enjoy the atmosphere? We both lingered, the wine helping to make us forget what we were here to do. After the booze had safely settled, I paid and left a generous tip for the helpful dwarf, and we headed back to Lowtown. The two of us had had enough to drink that by the time we made it back to the house, we were a little tipsy. Raven plopped down on the couch when we got inside and laid out on the furs. Hey, this is actually pretty comfortable she said, sitting back up. Yeah, the dwarves know what they're doing when it comes to stonework. They just can't do much about the cold. Speaking of, a bath sounds amazing. Care to join me, husband? She asked, her words ever so slightly slurred. Pass, and don't call me that. You're not my wife. You miss her, don't you? Raven asked, sliding from the couch and standing. More than I ever thought I would. She walked over to me and stared at me her head cocked to the side ever so slightly. You don't seem the type, honestly, to settle down and get married. I chuckled and went to the kitchen, where a crude stone refrigerator stood in the corner. Half a dozen frost stones embedded in the stone chilled it to nearly freezing, and Orin had stocked it with plenty of beer and spirits. I grabbed a glass bottle and unstopped it, taking a sip. I wasn't, but Eris didn't care. She bulldozed into my life and gave me something I didn't know I needed. And what was that? She asked, holding out her hand for a beer. I reached back in and pulled one out for her, reaching across the small dining table to hand it to her. Acceptance. Raven took a long pull of her drink, eyeing me with a smirk the entire time. Isn't that what everyone is looking for? I shrugged and drained the rest of my beer. Not sure about everyone else, but I damn sure didn't think I'd ever find it. I accept you, knight, the aspect said with a smirk. Oh, shut up, I growled. Raven furrowed her brows, blinking rapidly. What did I say? I grabbed another beer. Wasn't talking to you. She threw up her hands and crossed a leg over the other on the couch. Then who? I blew out a breath and set the beer on the stone table. You want to answer that? With pleasure. The aspect slithered into my head, bringing a blizzard to my thoughts. My head jerked to the side as I worked my jaw around. He was talking to me, the aspect said, its dark, sibilant voice a harsh echo of my own. Raven gasped, dropping her half-empty beer. It shattered on the floor as her hand went to her mouth. What the fuck, she whispered. My head snapped around to stare at Raven. He certainly has issues with you. Doesn't exactly trust you. Though he has little room to judge, he traded away a part of himself for power too. To save his queen, he made a deal with me. What are you? Raven asked, standing up. We moved across the room in a flash to stand over her. Thirsty. I shook my head, forcing the aspect out. That's enough, aspect. Back off. It left me, and I sagged down to the couch, running a hand through my hair, pulling the hair tie out and letting my hair cascade around me, blocking me from having to look at Raven. After a moment, I realized I didn't have to stay here. I got up and made for the stairs. Raven stepped to me and pushed me against the wall. Oh, no. You don't get to walk away after dumping that on me. 
I want you to explain right now. I glared at her. Who are you to command me? Your partner, she said, jabbing her finger into my chest, her crimson eyes slightly glazed. Now what did it mean? It's thirsty. She kept prodding me with her finger, and my rage broke free. I pushed off the wall and threw her against it, my hand closing around her pale throat. It wants you. The monster in my head wants to eat you, wants me to gorge on your blood while I take you. I must have sounded like a lunatic. Raven's eyes went wide for a second before she blinked, long and slow. Then why don't you? She asked, her voice no more than a whisper as she wrapped a hand around my wrist. Because I'm in control, not it. It's my head, and I will not let it make choices for me. Her radiant eyes stared into mine for what must have been only a second but seemed like an eternity. Then she blinked and time reasserted itself. So it wants my blood? And my body? Mostly the blood, I said, nodding. I realized my hand was still around her neck, and I eased my grip. But Raven's hand grew tense around my own and stopped me from withdrawing it. She squeezed my hand hard, curling my fingers tight around her flesh once again. What are you? I was given very specific instructions. Magnus told me to do as you said, to be at your disposal. He meant for the job, and I understood. But Illyria took me aside and told me to seduce you if I could. Raven sighed. I didn't want to, but I had no choice but to agree. Though it seemed you had no interest in me, which I was thankful for. You hate me, I understand. As I told you earlier, I hate myself too. But if we're going to work together, we need to trust each other. If your monster wants my blood. She rose her free hand up, a sharp black talon elongating from her fingernail. She sliced a groove in her neck in a flash, and a thick drip of blood welled up before spilling down her collar. Then it can have it. Her hand stopped me from pulling away as she smiled and twisted her neck, bearing the blood to me as it slithered over our fingertips. Rust and iron filled the air, and I sniffed, drawing the scent in. The scent of blood filled my nostrils and coated the back of my throat, and the aspect followed it. It flowed from my chest bringing the frigid tide in its wake. It crept to my head, and I could do nothing to stop it. Finally, I was right. Her blood smells delightful, it spoke aloud, curling my lips into a gruesome smile. My teeth ached and shifted in my mouth. The sharp canines dug at my lips, and the aspect opened my mouth wide. Raven relaxed as she looked into my eyes and brought her neck closer to me. I couldn't stop the overwhelming ache of hunger boiling in my stomach, nor the irresistible urge to sink my teeth into her flesh. I bent low, no longer sure who was in control, and graced the tips of my teeth across Raven's skin. She shuddered at my touch, her hands going from her neck to my waist as she pulled me closer. I sank my teeth into her flesh, and she moaned softly, her warm voice tickling my ear as she cried out, Ruby red life burst like a dam and poured down my throat in a rush. Her blood was indeed sweet. It filled me with a warmth and I greedily drank it in. The aspect made its approval known and greedily slaked its thirst. For a single moment, I was in the room with her as she grew ever more heated as I drank her blood. Then my vision swam and my mind fell into darkness. It was less jarring this time around as I entered the Nemesini. I was suddenly standing in a small town with a great expanse of forest in the distance. I recognized the variety of trees. They were the towering trees that filled the Emerald Ocean, which housed the Elven Kingdom of Ilsaria. There were only a few human towns on the edge of Elven territory, which made the village either Rodale or Siltfall. It was a modest town, brightly lit by the light of the sun. No house or building was over a single story. Most of the houses were well-built log cabins, but a few of them were worn and falling apart. A young girl stood before me, carrying a heavy basket filled with carrots and potatoes. Her thin white shirt and brown canvas pants were strewn with dirt, but she held a smile on her face as she walked. Her skin was darker, her midnight hair a little lighter in the bright sunshine, and her gray eyes had yet to be blooded, but it was still raven. She was younger here, not quite a woman yet. 
She walked carefree, her lips whistling a tune I couldn't hear. She reached a dirt crossroad and turned left, heading to one of the older and worn houses beside the street. A man was on the porch, sitting in a chair with a piece of straw sticking out of his mouth. He was older, deeply tanned skin from years of working outside, but he had a kind face, and there was a hint of raven in his eyes. He smiled widely when he saw Raven walking up the street. The straw slipped from his mouth as he stood and met her halfway. When he reached her, he took the basket and knelt, smiling down at his daughter. Joy radiated from her eyes as her father praised her. An arrow fired from somewhere beyond my sight pierced her father's neck. Blood splattered across Raven's face, and her look of joy fell to horror and panic. She turned toward the direction of the arrow, and her mouth gaped. A group of bandits rose from the trees and fell upon the town like a plague. Raven had no time to mourn her father as he crumpled to the ground and soaked the earth with his blood. She ran, ran as fast as her legs would carry her. She ran to a well in the center of town and clung to the rope as she slid down it. Raven stopped just before she touched the water, leaning heavily on a small rocky outcropping. Water licked at the hem of her dress, and her hands bled, soaking into the rope she clung so desperately to. Time sped up as she hid in the well. Minutes flowed to hours, which flowed into days. She stayed down there for two days, making as little noise as possible, until the bandit's topside had ransacked the entire village and fled. After the two days, she weakly hauled herself back up the well, ripping open the scabs in her hands in the process. As she climbed out of the well, we both got a good look at the carnage that had been wrought by the bandits. Bodies lined the streets, left to rot where they died while most of the buildings were broken, doors and windows splintered while a few were set ablaze, and now were nothing but smoldering blackened wrecks. Tears slid down her cheeks as she stared blankly at the destruction. The scene faded out as I stared at Raven crying. Her face gave way to darkness as I waited for the next memory to play. Must have been the Rodale raid that happened eight years ago. Whole village was wiped out by Hal's clan though from what I heard, he got what was coming to him. Light faded in out of nowhere and brought me to the next memory. Raven appeared in a grove surrounded by lush grass and flowers that bloomed every shade of the rainbow. Raven was a few years older here, leaner. There was a hard set to her chin, and some of the light had dimmed in her eyes. She had the stare that only came with great loss, when I saw every day in the mirror. She stood in the center of a perfect circle of death-capped mushrooms, the white-capped fungus forming a fairy circle. The mushrooms glowed with a soft blue light, and suddenly, Raven wasn't standing in forest anymore. She was in a rooftop garden atop a white stone castle. Sunlight bathed the garden in brilliance, and Raven stepped out of the center of the fairy circle to a smooth stone walkway that led to an archway, which held two soft rosewood doors. Raven stepped through them and into an expansive throne room. Raven followed the path, and in under a minute, she stood before a throne made of white marble and brilliant red cushions. On the throne was a girl, no more than eight years old by appearance. She still wore the softness of childhood in her thin features. Her burgundy hair spilled fine wine down her back and over her translucent dragonfly wings, which cast rainbows over the stone. Her ocean water eyes threatened to drown Raven as she knelt before the queen of the fairies. The Alice wore a slender, white strapless dress and leaned heavily on the armrest as boredom played across her face. She gave Raven a once-over and motioned for her to speak. Raven looked up and spoke with pleading eyes. She continued for a few minutes before she stopped. The Alice sat up straight and spoke a few words before Raven nodded once more. With that nod, a deal was struck, and one never bargained lightly with the Alice. The Alice rose from her throne and stood over Raven. She raised her hands to Raven's face. Her fingers crawled over Raven's cheeks and toward her eyes. The Alice rested her thumbs just above Raven's cheekbones as her fingernails elongated, forming wicked, pale claws. The Alice dipped her fingers into Raven's sockets ever so slightly, puncturing through the cornea and bringing crimson pain to drip down her face. Raven screamed in pain as her body twisted and contorted bones snapping and shifting under her skin. Wings black as sin sprouted from her back as her body stopped convulsing. Raven lay on the floor panting as sweat dripped from every pore. Her fingers wiped the long red streaks from her cheeks, and Raven stood. 
With a smug grin, the Alice left Raven and returned to her throne as darkness once more came for me. The last scene started with Raven walking through the forest alone. She was wearing a version of the leather armor she'd worn around me, and she carried no weapons. She stepped through the forest like a ghost as light from ahead of her cast dancing shadows over her face. Raven strolled out of the woods and into a campground, a dirt clearing that had over a dozen tents hammered into the ground and fires going. Men and women sat around the largest fire eating and drinking while a massive boar roasted on a spit over the coals. They were too busy enjoying themselves to notice Raven, who'd slunk behind them. She stopped and pursed her lips in what had to have been a whistle, as everyone turned at the sound. A large, barrel-chested man with brown, unkempt hair and tattoos over his arms rose from the log he was sitting on to walk over to Raven. I knew the man. Hal had never been the brightest of the bandit kings, but he made up for it in savagery. He didn't care who he killed as long as he got paid. And he stood over Raven, staring at her like a woman to bed, rather than the threat she was. Raven thrust out her hips, throwing a lazy smile on her face. And as Hal reached a hand to grope her chest, Raven shot out her clawed hand and ripped his throat out. Hal tumbled to the ground, his windpipe and bloody spine showing through the torn, ragged flesh as blood gushed over his chest. When he hit the ground, the other stared in shock, but none immediately went for their weapons, not that it would have saved them, regardless. Her midnight wings sprouted from her back as she flew into the mass of bodies, her claws raised as she tore into the bandits with gleeful murder in her eyes. Her jagged black talons shredded through the bandits with ease, and even the few who'd managed to bring their weapons to bear against her were no match. She flew into the air and peppered them with her razor-sharp flechettes. In minutes, the dozen or more bandits were dead or dying from blood loss. Raven took her time going to each body, and dead or not, she pulled a dagger and thrust it into each bandit again and again. As the last of them died, she dropped to her knees, crying and screaming at the top of her lungs. She'd gotten her revenge, but it had cost her everything. The scene faded out, and as I returned once more to the darkness, I filled in the rest. The Alice wasn't known for her kindness or mercy, Raven had willingly sold herself, body and soul, to the Alice for power, and she in turn had sold Raven's contract to Magnus. That was the end for her. Raven would never taste freedom again. I came back to myself, blood stained on my lips with Raven still holding me, my face buried in her chest as she got her breathing under control. I pulled back, and she looked up at me with glassy eyes. That was, it was, it wasn't unpleasant. It was good for me, the Aspect said, speaking through me. Her memories were so sweet in their bitterness. Did you like the ones I showed you? She had many more, but none were as sweet as those. Raven pulled back, her eyes wide. What? My memories? What are you talking about? I sighed, wiping the blood from my lips. When I drink blood. I get a glimpse into the person's life whose blood I'm drinking. You saw my life? She asked, her voice quivering. I nodded. The aspect was right. Though it didn't leave me much choice, I still made the same choice she did. I judged her without knowing anything about her. I'd have made the same choice. I have made that choice. Who am I to judge anyone? My sins are greater than hers will ever be. I stepped away from her, my heart heavy, and started up the stairs. I'm sorry. For what? She asked at my back. I'm just sorry, I whispered. Chapter 13 Sylvanus Darkwoods Eris it seemed like I was the only one who was shocked by the sudden revelation. I didn't really understand the implications of what was going on, but I knew Empress was a title that demanded respect. The others were very nonchalant about the whole thing. After the threat to our lives had disappeared, the remaining bandits went to loot the houses and the dead, while Casimir stood with a few of his men and talked to Adam and Evelyn. What are they talking about? I asked, sliding over to McKenna and Gill. No clue, 
but it's not my business, so I'm staying away. I really don't understand what's going on. Can someone please fill me in? Gil sighed and wound his hand over my shoulder, leading me back inside the inn, which had suffered the least amount of damage. Once inside, Gil picked up one of the knocked-over tables and chairs while McKenna went and got a round of drinks. I just sat back and stared through the broken door frame at the twins while they conversed with the bandits. Gil thumped down heavily in his seat and propped his chin under his hands. Where to start, he mused, running his fingers in staccato rhythm over his thick chin. The best place to start would be the beginning, I guess. I already told you how Dernan I met, he said. He tried to rob you, right? He nodded and smiled, turning his head when McKenna came back with our drinks. Thanks, Kenna, Gil said and kissed her on the lips. She blushed and returned the kiss with abandon. It was both heartwarming and incredibly depressing to see. It hurt to see such love and not think about Sam. I hope he's okay right now. I still couldn't feel him since he'd closed off our connection, and I didn't think he needed the distraction right now, not with everything going on. I took a few sips of my mead to try and calm myself, and it helped. By the time McKenna sat down next to Gil a few seconds later, I was much calmer and composed. So where did I leave off at? Oh, right. Dern was in the middle of robbing us. We'd fought the bandits tooth and nail with heavy casualties on both sides. It had gotten bloody, and over half of the guards we'd signed on were lying in bloody chunks next to the pay wagon we'd been sent to guard. Most of my guild perished during the initial attack, and for the most part, it was just me and Duran left. One of the best finders I'd ever crossed, though, given his teacher, I'd never stood a chance. I fought till my fatigue was maxed. The other bandits had already surrounded us and were just watching the spectacle. Duran was just toying with me at this point, goading me to max out. I winced, listening to Gil tell his story was hard, only because I knew how Sam fought and imagining him going against his best friend like that twisted my stomach. I pushed away the mead. Its sweetness no longer held any appeal for me. Gil looked over at me, took one look at my face, and grinned sheepishly. Sorry, Eris. The worst part is already over with. Well, once I'd maxed my fatigue and seized up, the rest of their group were calling for my blood. But something changed in him, and he refused. To this day, I don't know why he spared me. Never worked up the courage to ask. Scared of the answer, I guess. But Durin did. Even when his king ordered him to end me, he refused. What happened after that? Gil paused, taking a drink and continued his story. D fought his clan to the last. Slaughtered them all. Bandit king included. After that, he let me go. Of course, he took the entire pay wagon for himself, but I wasn't in a position to argue. With my guild wiped, I had nothing to go back to, so I stuck with him. Something about him just made me want to follow him. We rode together for a few months, but of course word got back to Evelyn about what he'd done, and she and Adam came after us personally. McKenna let out an involuntary shiver, despite the heat in the air, and Gil laughed. You have no idea, Kenna. As scary as she is now, it's nothing compared to back then. Evelyn's actually mellowed out quite a bit since those days. McKenna laughed, snorting as she tried to take a drink and splashing it over the table. She slammed the mug down, flushed with embarrassment, and tried to wipe her dripping face. I don't buy that for a second. Don't buy what? Evelyn asked, startling all three of us. She walked through the door as calm as could be, with a look of mild curiosity as she joined our conversation. Oh, nothing. We were just talking about how we met, Gil said hastily shooting me and McKenna a pleading look. Evelyn smiled a predatory smile. Oh, you're talking about the time I nearly killed you and the guild leader? I wouldn't put it quite like that. How would you put it then, hmm? That we fought with honor and dignity and gave you hell doing it. Evelyn threw back her head and laughed, her golden eyes practically alight with flames as she shook with laughter. Sure, you can think that all you want. Doesn't make it true. So what actually happened? I asked, raising my hand. What? What she said. Evelyn eventually caught up to us and beat us black and blue. But the stars aligned and she felt merciful that day. She didn't kill us when she could have and instead decided to ride with us for a while. We'd gotten bored at the top of the pyramid, Evelyn said, stealing my mug of mead and tipping it back. 
A line of purple trailed from her chin down her pale throat as she gulped down the drink. She tossed the empty glass on the table and leaned over. Fast forward a decade, and here we are. Now, that's enough of story time. I've convinced the bandits to escort us the rest of the way to Slaughter Woods, so I suggest we all get some sleep. We ran it first, lad. After her words, her and Adam headed upstairs, leaving us downstairs with a gang of ruthless killers just outside. Who's up for bunking together? Gil asked, craning his neck to peek outside the inn. I rubbed my eyes and yawned, trying to breathe some life into my tired bones. I hadn't slept much. The hollering and looting of the bandits had gone on till the early hours of the morning. Tegan and Kira had huddled close to me, scared to sleep with all the new humans around. It'll be okay, I whispered into their hair as they nodded off to sleep in the saddle in front of me. Lacuna huffed and snorted as we left Odelpha, wary of the new additions to our little group. The bandits had stolen all the surrounding horses and joined around us, herding us as we left town and skirted along the marsh. I don't think any of us, other than Evelyn and Adam, liked having the scruffy men and women close by. They talked too loudly and about the crudest of things. I developed an instant distaste for them, but there was nothing I could do or say to get rid of them. It was Evelyn's show now. So I kept close to McKenna and Gill. They were nearly as unhappy as I was about the situation and kept talking in hushed whispers, so I trotted Lacuna close to them. I don't like this. We were fine by ourselves, McKenna hissed. Yeah, I know, but fuck else we can do about it. Gil eyed me as I approached, but relaxed when he noticed it was just me. Morning, Eris. How are you and the kids? Tired, and more than a little concerned, if I'm being honest, I replied. He nodded and swept his eyes over the dozen or so bandits. Bad luck on our part, but they won't dare defy Evelyn. And hell, they'll take a few arrows for us, so I'm not going to complain too heavily if it means we get to keep ourselves safe. I pondered his words as we rode past endless gray trees and long stretches of muddy road. Gil's right about that, as callous as it sounds. But am I okay with people I dislike dying in the place of my friends and family? Does it make me a bad person if I am? His words had brought up a question I wasn't sure I wanted the answer to, and I shied away from it, focusing on Lacuna and the road and making sure the bandits weren't about to lead us into an ambush. A few drops of magic pooled out of my fingers as I took control of the scant few insects in the trees and burrows by the road. I tried to expand my reach as far as it could go, pushing my consciousness a few miles in every direction, but there was nothing but more miserable swamp and a few shades too far away to notice us. There's nothing in the woods but a few monsters, and those are too far away to be threats, I told Gil, leaning over the saddle to whisper to him. Thanks for keeping an eye out, but the bandits won't dare and try and go against Evelyn. She'd tear them apart if they tried. Yeah, I'm beginning to see how dangerous she actually is. We rode in mostly uncomfortable silence for a few hours, passing out of the last of the marshlands and back to stable ground. The stench of salt fled from the air as a cool breeze blew through the grassy plains we rode onto. I breathed in deep, and couldn't help the smile that broke upon my face as the wind swept my hair back. Our time spent in the brackish swamp had reminded me that even after centuries in the void, I had taken fresh air and sunshine for granted. We continued for a few more hours until we were well and truly away from the salted mire. By the time the sun was highest overhead, I think we were all ready for a break. Luckily, I wasn't the one who complained first. All right, I've had enough of this goddamn saddle, Gil bemoaned, twisting side to side and stretching. Hey, almighty oh empress, let's break for lunch. Before any of us could react, a sheathed dagger flew like an arrow and struck Gil in the center of his forehead. Gil's head rocked back from the blow, and he nearly careened off his horse. Ow, oh, fuck, he shouted, rubbing his forehead where a welt was already forming. Evelyn didn't react further, and we pressed on for another hour before she deigned to allow us to stop and rest. We stopped in a glade of tall trees, and with a single whistle from Evelyn, the bandits got to work setting up a fire and getting lunch going. There were a few dead trees that had been knocked over in a storm, their roots pulled up from the ground like veins. I walked over and sat down with the children. McKenna came over and sat beside me. Tegan and Kira had gotten used to our group, and Kira crawled into McKenna's lap while she laughed. Seems they don't mind us so much anymore. Shame it's only when we're about to arrive at their home. 
my heart fell at hearing that. I hadn't realized we were so close. How much further? I asked. Maybe a day, maybe less if we keep pushing like we have. We'll be there tomorrow at any rate, she said, letting Tegan hang off her arm like a monkey. I see. McKenna looked over to me and smiled, rubbing my shoulder. Cheer up. It's not like you'll never get to see them again. I bet once we take them home, you'll be allowed to visit them whenever you want. Despite her obvious attempts, her words did make me feel better, and as I watched them play together, I smiled. This isn't the end. It's the beginning of something great. The Arachne still live, and that means that the other hive could still be out there. Maybe they're even with the Arachne. The Apocritans and Manitarians were the weakest of the hive, and would have likely taken refuge with either the Arachne or the Scorpius clans. Maybe more of the hive will be waiting for me. I hope so, at least. I was so consumed with my thoughts that I nearly failed to pay attention to the object sailing through the air towards my head. I caught it on reflex and sighed when I looked down at my hands. Do we have to? I asked, standing up. Of course. I can't whip you into shape if you don't practice, and babysitting isn't my strong suit, Evelyn said, sauntering towards me, practice sword raised. Before she could take another step, I launched myself at her and swung with all my strength. My wooden sword connected with hers just before I had slammed it into her neck. She stepped back, absorbing the impact and counterattacked. The tip of her blade jammed into my stomach, taking the breath from me. I doubled over, fighting to stay on my feet, but a swift kick from Evelyn and I was on my back, wondering where I'd gone wrong. Evelyn frowned when I got back on my feet. Her furrowed brow and downturned lips cast doubt towards me. What? I asked, my voice cracking. She shook her head, still holding her soured look. Again. I brought my sword up like she taught me and tried to play cautious instead of aggressive this time. I stepped toward her slowly, watching for any sign to predict her movements. Her body poised perfectly, she gave me no hint as I crept closer. Each inch brought my heart rate skyrocketing, because I knew I could never beat her. But I had to try. Evelyn shifted, her hips tilted to the left, and her foot slid forward half an inch. It was just enough to let me know which way she was attacking, and I stepped to her right, thrusting my sword toward her exposed ribs. My practice sword fell from my numb hands as Evelyn wrapped me hard across the wrist with the flat of her blade. It tumbled to the dirt and kicked up a small cloud of dust. I flexed my fingers, trying to work out why they weren't responding. I picked up my sword and stood, settling back into my stance, but Evelyn shook her head. Hand me the sword, she commanded. I did as she asked, but had to ask. Why? Because the sword isn't your weapon, she said, her voice terse. I can make you a half-decent swordsman, but you'll never excel at it. You're strong and have decent reflexes and coordination, but the sword isn't for you. He crept up my cheeks, and my heart beat fast as I fought to keep her cold gaze. She laid out the facts in a mechanical fashion, and I appreciated her blunt demeanor, but I couldn't lie that it didn't sting to hear. I kicked at a pebble near my foot, tearing it from its home in the ground and sending it on a short journey to rest by a patch of grass. So what weapon is for me, then, if not the sword? Evelyn finally lost her frown. A slow smile spread from the corners of her mouth, and she bared her blindingly white teeth to me. That's what we're going to find out. A half dozen weapons later, and after a half dozen new cuts and bruises marred my pale skin, we'd finally found a weapon that suited me, according to Evelyn. Nice shot, she said, after I fired my third arrow at the target stuck to the tree. Thank you, I replied, blushing crimson. Evelyn's praise was just as off as her cold contempt, and like it, I didn't know exactly what to make of it, but I was happy that she was pleased. After three hours of disappointing her, it was nice to succeed in her eyes. She walked over, took the arrows out of the tree, and brought them back to me, holding them aloft. That bow is the only one I had on hand. I'm surprised you can draw it back. It's got a sixty-pound string on it. That's not light for someone of your size. Thank you, I mumbled. Just be careful with it. It's made from the horn of a storm dragon, so it's damn near priceless. Her brilliant eyes swept over my body and rested on my arms and shoulders. She walked behind me and placed her hands on the nape of my neck. Your form is off a tad, but that can be easily fixed. Her hands traveled down my skin, pushing or pulling my arms and shoulder blades. She lingered over my hips, 
and her warm fingers dug into my thighs as she twisted them into the proper position. I trembled under her touch, wishing in the back of my heart for her to keep lingering, to explore my flesh further. A stiff breeze blew through the trees, chilling the beating sweat of my skin and causing me to shiver. It snapped me out of my reverie and back into the present. Focus. I'm just wasting her time if I don't pay attention to her lessons. Thankfully, she didn't notice my lapse in concentration, as she was focused entirely on correcting my poor posture. When she finally stood, she stepped back and looked me over. She smiled, just a tad at the corner of her mouth, but it was unmistakable. Do you feel how your hips and feet are positioned? How precise your spine and shoulders are aligned? I focused on my body, trying to feel each individual muscle as I stood stock still and absorbed the difference in how I felt now versus my posture before. I was more grounded now. I had much better balance, and it felt good. I nodded just slightly, not moving too much in case I slipped and put myself off balance. I feel much more stable. It's night and day compared to before. Good. Now draw back your bow. I did focusing on all my muscles. From my neck all the way down to my toes, dozens of muscles worked in tandem as I drew back the string and aimed an invisible arrow at the tree. It was easier than before, as easy as breathing. Okay, carefully release tension on the string, but do not let go. Never draw fire your bow, Evelyn commanded. I released the string and let out a breath. Tension flooded out of my muscles as I lowered the bow. Good. Now staying in position, knock an arrow, and draw it back. I did exactly as she ordered, never faltering as I plucked an arrow from my quiver at my back and drew it back. Don't release it just yet. Hold it, and just breathe. Listen to the world around you. My hearing was better than most, and I picked up the sounds from a hundred different sources. The horses grazing in the plains, and the dozen men and women milling about, cooking, talking, and drinking. Gil and McKenna, off by themselves, whispering sweet nothings to each other away from most everyone's prying ears. Adam was in the field, playing with his shades, trying to better control them. And Evelyn was next to my ear. Her sweet breath tickled my nose, her heartbeat loud in her chest. There's too much noise. I can't concentrate. She nodded. Of course there is, but you have to focus. Eliminate the unnecessary noise and focus on the one sound that truly matters. Which is, I asked, straining from holding the arrow back for so long. Your heartbeat. It's the most important sound to an archer. Listen to its rhythm. Feel it pulse in your breast, down your veins and in your fingertips. Feel it pulse through the bow, and in the space between heartbeats. Release your arrow. I focused ignored my screaming muscles to listen to the beat of my heart. It was just as she'd said. It pumped loud in my ears, flowing through my chest toward my hands, and it thumped against my bow again and again. I waited until I knew exactly when the beat would end, and I loosed the arrow. It sailed through the air, uttering a soft whistle as its war cry, and slammed home in the center of the paper target fifty feet away. A cheer rose from a group of bandits who'd stopped to watch Evelyn train me. And despite them being bandits, scum of the earth, I couldn't help the little bit of pride that welled up inside from their cheers. Evelyn clicked her tongue. Not bad, not bad. I wanted to keep practicing, keep the momentum going, but my aching muscles and screaming stomach said otherwise. We'd been training for so long, and we'd neglected to eat anything, so I was ravenous beyond compare. Gill and McKenna made room for me on the log next to them and offered me a bowl of charred meat and vegetables. It was bland, the chef not having half the cooking skill of Sam or the others, but food was food and I was starving. I scarfed it down while watching Tegan and Kira as they scampered around the woods. We'd spent hours training and wasted most of the light we'd had left, so we set up camp here for the night. I helped where I could carrying huge armloads of firewood and helping to set up our tents, but we had more than enough manpower, so there wasn't much for us to do. Evelyn ran the bandits ragged, and they were too scared of her to argue. I was weary from the training, and called it a night early and headed to my tent to get some rest. As I lay down, though, my mind began to wander. My body was bruised and aching, 
but my thoughts raced like birds through my mind. Calm down and get some sleep, I told myself, rolling over and shutting my eyes tight. But it was to no avail. I was awake despite my protests. All right, well, if I can't sleep, then I guess I'll keep practicing with my magic. I sat up, crossed my legs and closed my eyes, feeling for the magic in my soul. It came at my call, spilling from within my chest to crawl its way toward my mind. It submerged me in a pool of verdant mist, and I was no longer in a tent in the woods. I was home. A tidal wave of thoughts, emotions, and spirits flooded around me, drowning me in their need to be answered, but they weren't what I needed, not tonight at least. There was a specific spell that my mother used often, her chitin sword, but I knew there was more than that lurking below the surface. I just had to find it. How may I assist you, my queen? The warm voice asked next to my ear. I need spells, aspect, weapons. With a subtle tone of acceptance, the presence of the aspect faded away. I floated in a sea of warmth for a time until a tug pulled my soul deeper in the mist. I was pulled further and further in when suddenly I slowed and a dozen thoughts floated past my face. Each one was a spell, but I needed to find the correct one and pull it out with me. It took some time, but I found the one I needed and reached out my hand. It dissolved into nothingness when I closed my hand and filled me with insight. I had what I'd come for, and I'd stayed too long. I couldn't linger in the hive mind, or I risked not being able to find my way out again. When I came back to myself, I was weak. My body shook with fatigue, and sweat poured in rivers down my face and neck. But resting in my hands was a glossy black bow comprised of chitin, gleaming even in the darkness. Beautiful, I said, smiling down at it. I let the spell fade back under my skin and downed a mana potion from my pack. With my shaking limbs calmed, I turned in and got some sleep. In the morning, we packed up camp after a light breakfast and set out at a steady pace to try and make up for lost time. The bandits rode in front, and the five of us brought up the rear on Evelyn's orders as we approached the Sylvanus Darkwoods. They came upon us quickly, and tall, wide trees rose up in an ocean as we approached. Gil whistled appreciatively. Damn. Never been this close before, but those are some big-ass trees. McKenna snorted, and the others burst into laughter. You're not wrong. For a place called Slaughter Woods, it's really rather quaint, isn't it? Evelyn asked to herself. Casimir and a few of his men circled around and went to speak to Evelyn as we reached the edge of the woods. What do you want us to do? He asked, his speech faltering as he kept casting glances over his shoulder at the tree line. Send a few men in, see what happens, she replied instantly. He sighed, looked over at his men, and shouted, Ricky, Jones, go check it out. Two burly men with tanned skin and unwashed hair shouted in response, but broke from the main group and edged their horses closer. As they reached the edge of the trees, they stopped, turned back around, and just glared hatred at Casimir before heading into the woods and out of sight. Nothing happened for a long moment and everyone held their breath, just waiting for something to happen. An ear-splitting shriek pierced the air, followed immediately by another one. And then there was silence once again. Well, Gil said, turning around to stare at us. At least we know we're in the right place. Chapter 14 The Widow when the two bandits never came back out from the forest, it was clear we would have to go in next. I volunteered, because with the children, I had the best chance of getting through without harm. The others, Gil especially, were vehemently against the idea. It doesn't make sense for us all to go in when that risks everyone, I said, raising my voice. What also doesn't make sense is letting you and the kids run off by yourself and you winding up dead. Durin would kill me if I let anything happen to you. Not going to happen, Missy. I wanted to argue more, but when McKenna and even Adam rallied against me, I knew I was fighting a losing battle. All right, fine, you win. If you're all done arguing, we're going in. Evelyn called from the center of the bandits. With nothing else to do, we headed in. The four of us brought our horses towards Evelyn so we'd all be together. 
I didn't like the idea of us being separated when something inevitably went wrong. We pushed into the forest, and I was surprised. For a place that was touted as evil, with a nickname like Slaughter Woods, it was actually remarkably lovely. The trees were tall and luscious. Dense foliage and thick winding branches gave the appearance of a web crisscrossing multiple trees in a random yet beautiful pattern. The forest was beautiful, yet still, as if nature had sensed a predator and hidden itself away. There were no birds chirping or animals scurrying. It was a quiet place, and that set my teeth on edge. I didn't like the quiet. It meant something was wrong, and I quickly told the others what I was feeling. Well, why don't you use your magic and see what's up with the place? Adam suggested, leaning toward me to whisper. Whispering is pointless, Adam. The Arachne have nearly as good hearing as I do, and I'm sure they're already well aware of us. He replied, but I didn't hear what he said. I was busy concentrating on my flow of magic, letting it pour from me as I scanned the surroundings. I quickly took hold of the nearest insects and found exactly what our problem was. I broke out of the spell and raised my hands sharply. Everyone stop, I hissed, waving at them frantically to quit moving. McKenna and the others listened instantly, stopping their horses in seconds. But a number of the bandits either didn't hear me or didn't care enough to stop. They continued to ride forward across the pristine jungle floor, unaware of what loomed just overhead. As they crossed some imaginary line, death descended from the treetops. Dozens of Arachne warriors dropped right onto the foolish bandits, slaughtering them with practiced ease. Most of the bandits died in seconds, torn to pieces right in front of us. A few escaped the initial massacre and ran for their lives, screaming at the top of their lungs. They didn't get very far. The Arachne hadn't changed much in a thousand years. They still looked the same as I remembered. Each of the warriors were lean and agile, rippling muscles and no hint of fat on their frames. Each one was tan, though the shades varied, and they all wore fibrous clothing woven from nature. It clung to their skin as if part of their bodies, as they stared us down with calm dispassion. Their faces were the most striking part of them. Long, angular, and regal features that only accented their eyes. They pierced through us, small and slanted as every color of the rainbow stared back at us. One of them, a tall, broad-shouldered male with red and yellow-spotted eyes, spoke in a harsh voice. Get the stragglers, he commanded in Rocknarin. He bore a rough puckered scar on his shoulder in the shape of a triangular hourglass. It denoted him as the commander of the widow's guard, which made him the best fighter of the Arachne. He would be strong and fast beyond measure, and even with my considerable strength, I didn't have the skills to beat him, let alone match him. Be careful, he's dangerous, I said. The others nodded, but Evelyn stared him down and smiled. Oh, she's not thinking. Oh, yes, that's exactly what she's thinking. Evelyn was sizing him up as a challenge, and that wouldn't end well for anyone. Peace, I shouted in Ragnarin. Peace. The warriors stopped when I spoke, confusion abounding on their faces until Tegan and Kira bounded from Lacuna to them. Both of them spoke in hushed whispers that even my hearing couldn't pick up from that distance. Before a minute passed, the Arachne stood down and motioned me forward. I climbed off Lacuna and threw my hood down, letting them get a good look at me. A few raised their eyebrows and a few gasped. They stared at me as I walked toward the commander, who was taller than I'd originally thought. He nearly matched Gil in height alone. An entomancer, he asked, flicking his eyes up and down. I nodded, trying to keep the fear off my face. It was difficult when I was staring up at a warrior bred for combat who could probably kill me without blinking. You rescued our brood from slavery? Yes, though not without the help of my bonded. I understand, but this is not my decision to make. You will come with me, and the widow will decide your fate. He spoke with such conviction and finality that if we questioned him or tried to argue, I knew we'd be dead before we could get the words out. Of course, I said, and turned back to my friends, walking to get back on Lacuna. We do as they say and follow them. If we don't, we die. I can take them, Evelyn said, scoffing. No, you can't. They're strong, well-coordinated, and will swarm us before we could even draw our weapons. Trust me on this, I pleaded. She looked like she wanted to argue, but Adam rode beside and smacked the back of her head. None of that now, sister of mine, 
Let's listen to Eris and not start a war with the spider people, shall we? Fine, she grumbled, easing into a more passive stance. Our exchange did not go unnoticed by the warriors, who stood a dozen yards in front of us in a large pool of blood from the bandits. With a jerk of his head, the commander ordered us to follow him. We rode through the bloody remains as the stench of blood filled the air. Ugh, it'll take forever for the smell to leave my clothes. This is why I like killing with poison. It's less messy, McKenna said, pinching her nose as her horse's hooves squelched underneath the dead flesh. I just wonder what they're going to do with the bodies, Gil asked. You don't want to know, I replied. Now I'm more curious. I didn't really want to answer. It was a barbaric custom, but he wanted to know, and it wasn't my decision to keep the information from them. They eat them, I said, sighing. Lovely. You asked. Gil and the others thankfully quieted down as we rode through endlessly thick forests. The only thing that made traversing through it possible was the small and worn trails we crossed as the arachne led us deeper into the woods. After a few hours, the trees began to thin slightly, and there was more space to move around as the trail widened and entered what could only be a city. We broke through the trees, and dozens of buildings rose up from the forest floor. They were all wooden, but it wasn't the mechanical, perfectly designed homes of the humans. These buildings had been carved and shaped like sculptures. They were all smooth and circular, with wide open windows and door frames with no doors. They reminded me of the buildings we'd lived in so long ago. They weren't nearly as well crafted and were smaller in comparison, but it was incredibly reminiscent of home. The rest of the warriors scattered, vanishing into the city like ghosts, and we were left with just the commander. He turned, speaking slowly to me. We are alerting the guards to your presence, but if you wander off, you will be treated as hostile and killed without mercy. He spoke the language of humans, but it was slow and with a strange inflection. The others jerked in surprise at his words, but I just nodded for them. We understand and will obey. Good. The widow has been made aware of you and will see you. He led us through the city as we passed a number of Arachne, each of them staring at us like we'd grown three heads. I guess it is strange to see humans in a forest that forbids entrance to the other races. I just wish they wouldn't look at me like that, though. I guess I must be the first Entomancer they've ever seen, and that has to come as a shock to them. As we rode deeper into the city, we reached our destination. It was a large dwelling that dwarfed the much smaller surroundings by at least double. Though it was larger, it wasn't designed with any more elegance than the other buildings, but it bore numerous windows as it rose towards the treetops. The queen's palace, eh? Most likely, but please, let me do the talking when we meet the widow. The widow? Evelyn asked. Yes, it's what the monarch of the Arachne is called. You'll see why when we get inside. Without further discussion, the commander hissed at us and opened the double doors. It was the only building that actually had doors, and as we went inside, I found out why. Half a dozen guards stood on the other side of the door. Weapons of all types raised menacingly close to our faces. I tried my best to ignore the guards and focus on the room. It was tall and winding. Staircases rose on either side of the room to spiral off higher and higher to the many other floors. The walls were smooth and glossy as if they'd been waxed. As we walked toward the throne, we passed a library. Books written on mashed leaves and bound in tree bark lined the walls on either side of me, rising to the other floors. I wonder what they say. There's so much history that's been lost. I wonder if those books hold the answers. The throne room was small and thin. It was basically a walkway wide enough to let supplicants come and speak to their queen. Wooden stairs at the end rose up to a dais, and on an elegantly carved wooden throne sat the queen of the Arachne. She was stunning. So stunning that my breath caught in my chest for a split second before I remembered how to breathe. She wore a similar style of dress as her warriors, a slim-fitting black shirt that left most of her upper chest and neck exposed, and pants that hugged her slender body. Her pure white hair draped like silk over her tawny neck and collarbone. Her skin was rich enough that it looked like it should melt in the sunlight cascading through the windows, and her face was gorgeous, yet softer than I was expecting. 
Her ears, like the rest of the arachne race, were long, but not as long as mine and slightly curved as the tips pulled back towards the base of her head. She had a thin, kind face that should have been laughing with joy, but instead stared us down with cool, detached eyes that sent shivers up my spine. Eyes that marked her as the widow of the arachne, their queen. They were pitch black, almost like mine. But where mine were compounded, hers were smooth. In the center of each eye was a small red hourglass that formed her iris. She leaned back in her chair, a slender hand under her chin and thought as her unblinking gaze welcomed us to her castle. Her sight flicked over each of us until she finally landed on me. An entomancer, she said, forgoing her native tongue for our benefit. Her voice was husky and rich as she spoke, holding both bitterness and a subtle sweetness as it slithered into my ears. She had an intoxicating voice. She clicked her tongue sharply against her teeth. Just my luck to have to deal with another one in my lifetime. Her words shocked me, and whatever else had been running through my mind at the time was blown away as a single thought shattered my world. Another one? Another one? Without thinking, I broke free from the group and ran the distance between me and the queen. I hit the steps at a jog and only managed to slow myself as I reached the throne. There's another Entomancer? Where are they? When did you see them? Please tell me, I shouted, getting right in her face. In my excitement and lapse in sanity, I didn't realize the overwhelming error I'd made, and a dozen Arachne warriors appeared from the shadows and were next to us in an instant. The commander held a thin-bladed dagger to my throat, and if I so much as turned my head, I'd likely lose it. The queen held up her hand. It's fine. Thank you, Elra, but I am perfectly capable of taking care of myself. Elra removed the dagger from my neck and bowed low. Immediately, all the warriors vanished as swiftly as they'd arrived. She smiled at my eagerness and shifted in her chair, crossing her legs and leaning on the armrest. My name is Rhaenyra, but I prefer Reyna. Now tell me who you are, Entomancer. I gulped, suddenly nervous as I stared back at Reyna. My name is Eris. I'm the Hive Queen, and up until a few seconds ago, I thought I was the last Entomancer left alive on Tilly, or Nexus, rather. At that, Raina tilted her head back and laughed, a throaty laugh that filled the room with music. She came back up still chuckling and smiled at me. You almost had me there. Eris, was it? But you are not the Hive Queen. I've met the Queen. What? I asked aghast, taking a step back. The other Entomancer is a girl? I shook my head. Doesn't matter right now. Stop fixating on that. That's impossible. My mother was the last queen of the hive, and when she died, the mantle transferred to me. I am the queen. Reyna stopped smirking and tapped her finger on her chin. Your words ring of conviction, but I've met Illyria, the true queen, so you must be deluding yourself. Illyria? I asked. Yes. You don't look all that different to me, but she is the queen, not you. I shrugged my shoulders. I've never heard of her, but I'm not lying. That's no concern of mine, Raina said, rising from the throne. Her attached spider limbs uncoiled themselves from around her waist where they'd been blending in with the dark fabric. Four thin black limbs protruded from Raina's spine, each of them five and a half feet long, ending in a tapered point which concealed two sharp pinchers. Raina used them to push off from the chair as she stood her spider legs suspended in the air by her waist. The others recoiled and gasped when they noticed, and I didn't blame them. They hadn't seen them before because most of the arachne kept them concealed or covered. Reyna was disregarding tradition by leaving hers out in the open. She came to stand before me. Reyna was taller than me by half a head, and that, coupled with her standing on the wooden steps, put her collarbone at just above eye level. Her revealing shirt gave me a peek at her moderate chest. I shouldn't be focusing on that right now. There are too many other, more important things to worry about right now than how nice her breasts are. Eris, control yourself. I flicked my eyes away from the view and back to Reyna, whose own widowed eyes seemed to be taking in me as well. She smiled sweetly at me and leaned in closer. 
what to do with you, hmm? I think there's a lot for us to talk about, and I want you to tell me everything, she said, her smile not leaving me any room to negotiate as her face crept closer to mine. I nodded, sweat beating on my forehead. Let's start at the beginning. And so, I told her everything. I retold my story from the very start, my life a thousand years ago till that day, and through it all, Rena didn't say a word until I'd finished my story and she sat back up in her throne. She smirked and turned toward me. How far the once mighty Entomancers have fallen. Your entire species has been eradicated, just like the rest of the hive. Really? There's none left. Rena shook her head. The Apocritans and Manitarians have been gone for centuries, since long before we settled these woods. What about the Scorpius? I asked, my hand shaking. Gone to, like us, some survived, but peace couldn't be had, and they left. When? Surely some must have survived all this time? I don't know. There isn't anyone left alive from those times, and our records were destroyed in a fire. We have nothing left of our history, but stories passed from parents to child. It wasn't what I wanted to hear. In fact, it was the exact opposite. The worst thing I could have been told was that the history of the hive was scattered to the wind. Why don't you consult the hive mind, queen? I admittedly don't know much about your kind, but the old stories told of your abilities. Surely the history is stored somewhere in that head of yours. I sighed, resting my palms on my thighs while resisting the urge to drum my fingers. It's not that simple. The hive mind is complex, mesmerizing in its vastness. If I linger or drift too deep, it becomes harder to pull myself out. That and my limited magic makes trying incredibly dangerous. Throughout our conversation, the others had been very patient, letting me do the talking while they stood and listened. But Gil kept fidgeting, shifting balance from foot to foot, and McKenna had pulled out a book to read and sat cross-legged on the ground. Evelyn and Adam were barely listening. Instead, they were absorbed in their own conversation. I was trying to not leave them out of the conversation, but Raina had no interest in them, and I had so many questions to ask that I forgot that they were with us in the room. Hey, Raina. Why do you insist on picking on her? You've been taking stabs at her this entire time, Gil said, his deep voice only amplified by the echo in the room. Raina scowled, her eyes shooting over to glare at Gil. Human? While I'm thankful for your part in returning Kira and Tegan to us, it is not enough to allow such insolence. Speak to me like that again, and I will devour you alive. The atmosphere in the room changed in an instant. The gloom night shifted from abject boredom to defensive in a heartbeat, and Reyna unfolded her limbs and revealed her sharp claws. The tension in the room was palpable, and I had to do something. Whoa, we didn't come here to fight, I blurted out, standing in a panic. I came here to return the children and to meet you and the other Arachne. We're friends. Friends? Reyna asked skeptically. Hardly. You're a nuisance who dropped herself on my doorstep and complicated my life more than it already was. We've governed ourselves just fine for centuries, and all of a sudden you entomancers come to fuck everything up. What's she like? I asked when we'd all settled down. Illyria? She's strong, capable. She waltzed in and overpowered my best fighters like it was nothing. She and her human lover were both unbelievably powerful. Human lover? Raina nodded, grimacing at the thought. You're not the only one who's taking a liking to the humans, but Magnus was something else. I honestly don't know which was stronger. Her words hit me like a lightning bolt, and a collective gasp echoed from our side of the table. Magnus? Again? Who is he? And how does he tie into Illyria? What's going on? Raina furrowed her brow and pursed her lips slightly. I take it you've heard of him? He's made our fucking lives hell for the last few weeks. What do you know about him? Gil asked abruptly. Interesting, she replied, her eyes lighting up with something I couldn't place. She smirked and rose from her chair. Let's take this conversation outside, 
Shall we? Without a word, Rena rose once more and walked past us as she headed toward the door. I gave the others a look. Gil shrugged and nodded, and so we all followed after Rena. She pushed open the doors and turned back to us as warm sunlight lit up her skin and eyes. They came here around eight years ago now, offering an alliance of sorts. The way Magnus spoke led me to believe he thinks something is coming, a war or gods know what, but I refused. I didn't trust him. Why? What's coming? I asked as we shuffled outside. She didn't answer at first. Instead, she sauntered over to the well-trodden dirt and went around the side of the palace to where a large stable was located. It was just as detailed and elegant as the palace itself. Our horses were hitched inside, and several Arachne men and women tended to them with care. Rena went over to the first stall and led her horse out, a beautiful brown colt with a chocolate mane. As she mounted her horse, she spoke with a shake of her head. I don't know, Magnus wouldn't say, but he felt off to me. Something about him nagged at me, though he was talkative and charming for a human. But he never answered my question, and I wasn't about to drag the last of my race into a war when I didn't even know who'd we be fighting. She motioned for us to do the same and follow her. We all climbed onto our horses, and Raina led us out of the stable and down a long stretch of dirt road that led through the center of the city. Before we'd gotten a dozen feet, the commander of the guard sidled up to us. My widow, please allow me to accompany you. She shook her head and craned her neck. I'm in no danger from these humans, and is that Foard I see? I'm glad he's back from the farms. Go spend time with your bonded, Elra, and please give him my best. Elra bowed. Thank you, widow. I shall. I processed what Raina had told us over the last few minutes. Who are Magnus and Illyria? How did she survive the eradication of our species? It was a thousand years ago, so she couldn't have been alive back then, so where are her parents? There could be more than just us left. I have to find her. The commander left, and we continued on, past a number of shops and wooden buildings. Dozens of Arachne went about their day. Most wore green cotton tunics, though more and more had their arachnid limbs bare or visible, wrapped around their waists like belts. Why do you leave your limbs uncovered? That was always considered taboo. Raina laughed. That may have been so during the time of the hive, but the times have changed. It's far more convenient to leave them uncovered. How strange, I said, scratching my cheek. Raina let us take in the sights as we rode. We slipped through the city as so many of the Arachne went about their day. Most manned shops in the city, but the city was small, only a few square miles. And as we got to the outskirts, more and more farms cropped up. There were so many different kinds that it was a little impressive. Chicken, cattle, and even a few pig ranches, mixed in between grain and vegetable farms. Dozens of them. The Arachne didn't want for anything that I'd seen. I don't imagine you're using human currency, so how do you pay for things? Raina shook her head and slowed her horse so we could ride side by side. That's true, we don't. We barter for things we need, trade favors or services in exchange for things we need. Everyone has something that someone else wants or needs, so it works well for us. Though we only number in the low thousands, I have no idea how it would work if there were more of us. I nodded. It's the same as the hive of old. Though, do you also barter people? Raina's eyes went wide. Morrigan's feathers, no. We would never treat our people in such a way. I smiled as relief washed over me. Good. The old ways were abhorrent. I'm glad to see the hive can progress unburdened by the past. I don't mean to interrupt your conversation, Eris, but back on topic, where can we find Magnus and this Illyria? There's a lot we need to ask them, Gil said. Magnus is owed some retribution from us, and I aim to see it done, Evelyn said, a grin on her lips. I'm afraid it isn't that simple, Raina replied. You and yours did us a favor by returning our spiderlings, but that doesn't mean we owe you anything. And as I said before, I'm not getting in the middle of whatever Magnus and Illyria are planning. 
So you're just going to hide away in your woods like cowards? Evelyn asked suddenly. Raina looked over to her and paused for a second or two. You know, for a human, you're quite striking. Evelyn chuckled. You threatened to devour my friend earlier. Now you want a bite of me? Any other time I might have let you eat me, but business before pleasure. Oh, well, Raina said with a sigh, speeding up as we took a turn down a wide stretch of dirt, the trees growing thicker as we left the city behind. You call it cowardice. I call it protecting my species. You want to get involved? Fine. But that information isn't going to come without a price. That's fine. We've got plenty of gold, Gil said, taking a large bag out of his inventory, and shook it, the coins inside clinking as they shifted. Raina didn't even glance at it. Weren't you listening? Keep your worthless human money. I have no need of it. No, what I need are assurances. Gil stowed his gold away, his face scrunched in confusion, unsure of where Raina was going. All right, what do you want then? McKenna asked, glancing over at us. Raina smiled a wicked grin, her four spider limbs curling around her waist. If I tell you what I know about those two, that would be the same as betraying them in their eyes if they found out, and I won't go against them without knowing I'm on the right side of things. You want my help? Then you'll first prove yourselves to me. We just won't let them find out. Not until we have Sam back, at least. I turned to the others, who were already nodding their heads. Guess we're doing this. All right. Then let's not waste any more time. We still have a few miles to go, so let's pick up the pace. We followed Raina as she led us through the winding roads of the forest into a large clearing surrounded by worn and moss-grown stones that resembled an arena. Raina dismounted her horse in a flash and disappeared into the treetops. Welcome to the trial of visitation, Raina shouted from somewhere among the trees. Step into the circle and the trial will begin. The five of us dismounted and walked over to the stones, squeezing through the thin gap available between the sporadic rocks and entered the field. It was a once grassy plain that had been worn through to reveal rough brown dirt underneath. Some grass still grew at the edges, clinging to the tall rocks that surrounded us in fear of being trampled away as well. We walked to the center, waiting for whatever it was that we agreed to participate in to begin. Slowly, a number of arachne began to appear at the edges of my vision, creeping in from the tree line like spectators to an execution. They surrounded us, never speaking or uttering a sound, just staring down at us silently. The whole thing set my teeth on edge, and I dug my fingers into my palm to keep my nerves from getting the better of me. I didn't like this. I was afraid because I didn't know what was going to happen, and the silence only magnified my fear. Then Raina appeared walking along a branch that hung high above the arena. You have accepted the trial. Now let me lay down the rules. You are not confined to the arena if you so choose, but Ragnara and the surrounding farms are off limits. Going to the city will forfeit the trial. Also, you may use whatever tools you have at your disposal, but there will be absolutely no use of potions during the trial, no health or mana. Is that understood? We all nodded though we had yet to be told what we were actually going to be doing. The five of us stood and stared up at Raina, waiting. She smiled down at us. And now you will face the guardian spirit of the Arachne, the protector of the hive. Oh no. Everyone draw your weapons quickly, I shouted, already calling upon my magic to pull my chitin into weapons and armor. It crawled black up my skin and encased me in a second. Next came my bow, which formed slowly in my hand, slithering to its shape and solidifying. Next came my arrows, which coalesced on my back in a quiver. I need to be careful. The arrows are made from chitin, and each one takes away from my armor. I can't be reckless with my shots. In four seconds, the five of us were ready to face one of the strongest beings the Hive Kingdom possessed, an entity once worshipped as a god by the Arachne. It rose from the shadows cast by the leaves as the sunlight scattered through the trees. Earth rumbled and shifted as it clawed its way from the ground. The others took one look and backed away, tensing and getting ready for combat as the monstrosity clawed its way from the earth and stood, moving its hulking bulbous body to face us. A giant spider, 
twenty feet long, stood before us, its pearly white skin nearly transparent as it opened its chelicery and bared its dagger-like fangs at us. They dripped deadly venom as its yellow eyes stared unblinking at us. Its bloated abdomen hung behind as its palps dragged along the ground by its head. Fuck, what is that thing? Gil asked, panicked. That is Misumina, the voracious guardian. Chapter 15 Planning to Plan Samson After a quick bath, I changed into a plain black tunic with cotton pants and found my bedroom. It was small with only a stone desk, a bed, and a nightstand with an oil lamp. The bed was a stone frame with thick straw wrapped in cloth that was sewn shut. I let my sword rest on the nightstand and slid the knife the rail had given me under the mattress. It was too dark in the room without any windows, so I lit the oil lamp. As the room filled with soft light, I curled up and tried to fall asleep. My interface crashed into my vision, and I cursed at the name. By the nine kings of hell, Miguel, what now? What is it? Just quoting about the job? I'm already on a job, I growled. Look, if I'm not dead or in prison by this time next week, we can talk. Okay. Sounds... I hung up and tried to get some sleep which, after an hour, seemed like an impossibility. No matter how much I willed it and shut my eyes tight, all I was doing was tossing and turning. My thoughts were consumed by what the Nemesini had shown me. I couldn't unsee it. My stomach twisted in knots, and my chest grew tight with guilt. I've been a right bastard to her, and she didn't deserve it. I shook my head and forced myself to stop thinking about it. It was in the past. God damn it. What I would give for one night of peaceful sleep? One more failed attempt to sleep later, and I groaned and flopped out of bed. Maybe a nightcap will settle my nerves. I walked downstairs, and it was hard to see. As my eyes adjusted, one of the windows let in some soft light from the monocrystal outside, bathing the living room and kitchen in a radiant blue light that shone like the moon. Can't sleep, huh? Raven asked from the couch. She was curled up wearing a soft white chemise made of silk that clung to her skin like it was painted on. Something like that. Want a drink? I asked. Sure. After what had happened between us earlier, I expected heavy tension between us, but there wasn't any. She was rather calm and composed. I went to the fridge and brought back two bottles of beer. Raven shifted over on the couch, making room for me. I leaned back and handed her one of the beers. Huh, this couch is kind of comfy. For stone, at least. Yeah, but it's a bitch to sleep on, she replied, taking a sip of beer. I leaned back and stared at my beer, willing myself to take a drink. After a few seconds, I sighed and set it down, trying to find the right words. Look, I'm sorry. Raven held up a finger to my lips, silencing me. It's okay. I do understand, you know. Even if you were an ass at times. I nodded and held up my hand to her. Fresh start? Raven let out a small laugh and finished her drink before pointing at mine. Only if you share. Have at it, I said with a chuckle. She leaned over me, her arm brushing against mine as she grabbed the bottle. She leaned back with a smile and took a drink. When she put the bottle down, Raven took my offered hand, her slender fingers cold and wet from the condensation on the glass. Clean slate, she smiled wildly at me and took another drink. I will say, the dwarves know how to make good drinks. After taking a drink, she set the bottle on the table in front of us and tugged her tie out of her ponytail, letting her black hair fall over her prominent collarbone and down her back. She ran her fingers through it, strands of hair drifting away from her to fall lazily to the ground. Much better, she said and looked at the window. What time is it, though? Almost three. Damn, we're going to be exhausted in the morning. Why don't you take the bed? I doubt I'm going to get much sleep tonight. Why's that? I shrugged. I haven't had a decent night's sleep since this whole fiasco started. At least some things are consistent. She laughed and finished her drink, setting her empty glass next to the first on the table. Well, since you don't hate me anymore, what say you and I act like adults and share the bed? It's plenty big enough for both of us. We slept in the same tent last night, what's the difference? I didn't answer right away, instead getting up to grab another drink, trying to find a good reason to say no, but only coming up with the fact that she was a shifter. My prejudices were not fading so quickly. I popped the top and took a long pull before sitting back down. 
Raven smiled at me, fanning her eyelashes and drawing my eyes to hers while she deftly stole my drink from my hand. She took a sip and laughed. Oh, come on, coward. I don't bite. A hysterical fit of giggles threatened to burst from my lips. I held my laughter and chuckled. I do. She snickered. Yeah, tell me about it, she said, her pale fingers rubbing her neck as she stood and handed me back my drink. Offer still open, though. Raven headed up the stairs. The silk of her chemise clung to her hips as she took the steps slowly. I turned away from her and picked up my beer, staring at the brown bottle. Damn it, I sighed, rubbing my stinging eyes. I'm exhausted, have been for days now, and tomorrow is planning for the heist. I need to be on top of my game. Fuck it, I need sleep, I said, downing the rest of the beer and following Raven upstairs. Raven was curled up next to the wall as I walked in. She scooted over and sat up on the lip of the bed. Which side do you want? Don't care, I said, and climbed out of my shirt and flopped on the bed. I took the side by the wall, turned over on my side, and slid my hands under the pillow. Raven lay on her side next to me and shifted closer to me. Her back brushed my back, and she shivered. Gods, you're warm. It's like sleeping next to a furnace. I snorted with laughter. I couldn't help it. Eris runs just shy of boiling, so I understand how you feel. I won't complain, though. It's nice when it's this cold, she said, snuggling closer to me. Just don't get any funny ideas. I would never. After that, I settled in and tried to get some sleep for the second time. It was admittedly easier with Raven leaning against me. I had no special feelings for her, but the mere presence of her skin so close to mine helped, and before I knew it, I was fast asleep. Raven woke me in the morning, and my eyes jolted open. Her hand was on my chest, and I grabbed it on reflex. Oh, sorry, I said, yawning. Don't be. Seems like you needed the rest, she said, fixing the shoulder strap on her chemise, which had slipped down her bicep. I sat up and swung my legs over the edge of the bed and stood. I stretched when I was on my feet and sighed. The exhaustion that had crept up on me was mitigated, if not gone altogether. I feel pretty good this morning. I knew for a fact that Eris wouldn't care in the least that I had simply slept in the bed with another woman, but it still wasn't appropriate. First Jasmine and now Raven. I'm sleeping next to a lot of women who aren't my wife. I miss Eris. It was the first thought in my head every day, and the last thought before I went to sleep. I missed my wife, and the fact that I couldn't see her really pissed me off. All right, let's get dressed. We've got a big day ahead of us. I headed down the stairs to find a slew of items waiting for us on the table by the kitchen. A few packs lay bulging on their backs, just waiting to be opened. Raven patted down the stairs softly behind me. She wore a gray shirt and pants, and she tied her long onyx locks out of her face into a ponytail. Raven followed my eyes to the table. Guess Orin dropped by early this morning. Yeah, I replied, rubbing the back of my head. Damn it, if he'd been an assassin, we'd be dead. I shouldn't have slept so hard. I was slipping. The slightest noise should have woken me, and it hadn't. I've gotten too comfortable around other people. The years of solitude trained my senses, but they've dulled since Eris came into my life. I need to retrain them. Just another thing to add to my to-do list. Durin, come and check over everything. Magnus is thorough, but even he has blind spots sometimes. I grabbed everything I thought I might have needed back in the war room, but more supplies could only help, and maybe there was something I was missing. I picked up one of the packs at random and dumped its contents out. They spilled and clanked out across the table. Several vials of potions, wraith sight, invisibility, fleet foot, light step, and a few agility and stealth enhancers. It covered every angle of what I might need, but there was no way I could take them all. Potion sickness would begin to kick in after the third potion, and system overload would follow a potion after. Nice to have, but too much. At least I'll have them if I need them. I turned my attention to the other items on the table, which were much more mundane in comparison. A tightly coiled length of rope, torches and matches, a lockpick and burglar's kit so exquisite they put the one I carried to shame, and a few teleportation scrolls. Seems like everything we need for something like this, Raven said as she looked over the items. Yeah, but too many people have already failed attempting this. Magnus sent thieves with far more experience than me, which tells me there is something that we haven't accounted for. This isn't going to be easy. We might die. Maybe. 
but at least I can come back, I said with a slight grin. Raven smirked and smacked me lightly on the arm. Ass. I quickly packed up the bag before stowing it in my inventory. All right, let's get a move on. It'll take us a while to get to Gold Hightown, and then we have to scout the area, I said and headed for the door. Raven sighed deeply behind me. At least my life isn't boring, she said softly before following me. Gold High Town hadn't changed much since I'd last been there. While Low Town festered in destitution, High Town thrived in opulence. The air was even sweeter, less polluted with heat and the stale scent of poverty. There were still plenty of stone buildings, just more refined and well designed. But it was in High Town where we started seeing wooden houses and manors as well. It was the only place in Aldrust where the dwarves built their buildings with wood. It wasn't that expensive to buy, but to have it transported, constructed, and maintained in the cool underground cost some serious coin. Only the wealthiest dwarves had the coin or were vain enough to attempt building a house out of wood. Most of the buildings were still stone, but it wasn't just stone. Most had marble or wooden accents to their houses, especially around the roof and windows. It was a less expensive method of showing off wealth, but status was status, no matter where. The streets were smooth and had been freshly replaced, not a single crack or chip in the flagstones. It's gorgeous here, and the air is sweeter. Warmer, too, Raven said, glancing around. We're closer to the surface, so more fresh air gets let in from the vents that run from the rock to the surface. As we found out last night, Lowtown doesn't get the luxury of fresh air, so it stagnates and rots in the lower levels. The walk to the Iron Cathedral was a long one, and I was already nervous. Why did I agree to this again? Oh, right, I didn't really have much of a choice. Raven shifted her eyes to mine, and I knew she could tell I was feeling the pressure, so she tried to keep me distracted. It's like night and day, Raven said as we passed a rather large three-story manor constructed of dark rosewood. Nobility is the same no matter what race you are. If someone can have something, then there must always be someone who doesn't. It's the way the world works. She picked up her step and walked alongside of me, nudging me with her elbow. Waxing philosophical, are we? Still, the wealth of this place is staggering compared to Lowtown, says the girl working for the richest man in existence. She snickered. Touché. As we stepped along the smooth cobblestone streets, I kept my eyes open. Humans were welcome to go mostly wherever we pleased and all dressed, but there still wasn't a huge number of us in the city. Raven and I would stand out to any casual observer, and that was the last thing we needed before we cased the Iron Cathedral. We passed numerous dwarven nobles going about their day. The style of dress had changed slightly, and tailored button-ups and colorful mantling around their shoulders seemed to be in fashion for the dwarven males, while the ladies wore flowing dresses that stopped mid-calf. The dwarven nobles have always had their eyes on the latest trends, but I can't see how mantling has caught on. I ignored most of the looks we got as we passed by, none of them hostile, merely curious. But eyes were eyes, and the less on us the better. So, with a groan that slipped from my throat and gritted teeth, I slid my arm through Raven's and wound my fingers through hers. She jumped with mild surprise at my touch and stopped walking. She stared up at me in confusion. We need to give everyone a reason why we're here. A couple on a stroll is much less suspicious than two humans walking with a purpose. Raven smiled, showing me her pearlescent teeth. Told you so, husband, she replied cheekily before getting closer to me. I tried to ignore her smile as we walked. Tried to ignore how smooth and soft her fingers were around mine. The way her shoulders rose and fell with each languid breath. She was damned annoying when I paid attention to her. She wasn't who I'd made her out to be in my head, and I couldn't even fall back on the fact that she was a shifter anymore, not when I knew why she'd made the deal. Just don't forget why we're here. This isn't a date. I'm well aware, but that doesn't mean we can't enjoy ourselves at least a little, right? Guess not, I shrugged. Good, she said, pulling me along with a smile. Then let's get going. The path up to the Iron Cathedral was sequestered away from the main road that led to the shopping and residential districts. We went through a gate that opened to a singular path that led to the cathedral. It was a bit of a hike as we climbed about a thousand steps, but at the top stood the Iron Cathedral. It was the single most elegantly designed building I'd ever seen. It put both mine and Magnus's castles to shame in the quality of the stonework and design. 
pristine white stone rose to two towering spires on either side of the basilica. Heavy buttresses ran from the spires to the main body of the church like fingers of a god digging into the stone blocks. High above us, stained glass sparkled from the radiant light of the monocrystal. Emerald green motes of light danced across the facade. It's breathtaking, Raven said. I could only nod. Without a doubt, it's a gorgeous place, disconnected from mortality. Almost a shame what we have to do. She placed a hand on my shoulder, squeezing gently. I agree, but neither of us have a choice here. We always have a choice. With those words, we stopped staring at the beauty of the architecture and went inside. The door was comprised of solid stone, only a hair shade off color from the rest of the stone. Nearly a hundred polished emeralds were embedded around the door. It opened at our approach, and our footsteps on the stone lip of the frame echoed for a second, before our feet hit the plush carpeted green rug that ran the length of the entryway. Ribbed vaulting ran the entirety of the hall ceiling until it widened at the center of the cathedral, where Lachmurl's heart resided. Even from the entrance, the lingering foreboding that slithered over my shoulders was amplified by the mere presence of the heart. Its insidious whispering and high-pitched tone were barely audible from where we stood, but they were still present, sending shivers up my spine. Gods, what's that feeling? I don't like it, Raven said, crossing her arms and rubbing them. That's what divinity feels like. Just ignore it for now. The more you think about it, the worse it gets. Why? We're in the presence of something not meant for mortals, and especially not meant for human mortals. The dwarves have an innate tolerance. We're not so lucky. I said, lowering my voice. We weren't alone here. There were several priests tending the church and the parishioners, and that wasn't counting Lachmurl's chosen. The stoic-faced guards were all clad in shadow steel armor, with a single large emerald in the center of their chests right over their hearts. Each carried their own preference of weapons, swords, axe, and even a few maces. Each would be a master of their weapon, having fought for dozens of years, maybe even a full century, before they were allowed the honor of serving Lachmurl. I started walking through the nave that led to the Vault of Tears, the resting place of Lachmurl's heart. Raven stopped glancing around and caught up to me a few steps later. I don't like this place. We shouldn't be here, she said, her hand going to mine for comfort. I gave her fingers a squeeze. You're right, but we have to. I told you, don't think about it too much. You're letting it get to you. She jerked hard, breathing in and out deeply, but her heartbeat pressed through her fingers and beat fast against my own rising drum. Take your own advice, get out of your head about this. As thanks. Before I could ask the aspect what it meant, a chill seeped from my heart to my head. It wasn't like before when it took control of my body, but it was a soft breeze that settled my turbulent emotions and brought rationality to my thoughts. My heart settled, and I wasn't concerned by the tonal screeching that had been steadily rising as we got closer to the vault. The cold, logical side of the aspect bled through my mind, and I picked up the pace, nearly dragging Raven along behind me. But we had to stop as we reached the vault. The door was similar to the entrance of the cathedral, but the emeralds formed a teardrop in the center. Flanked on either side of the door were two of Lachmurl's chosen. Standing at four foot nothing, they still radiated the calm grace of a lifetime warrior. Their eyes flicked over us mechanically. They found us both in either a threat or non-threat category, and I knew exactly what category I was shuffled to, the same one I put them in. But the Iron Cathedral was a public place, even for humans, and they couldn't outright deny us entrance. But the one on the right shot me a warning look that said in no uncertain terms that they would be more than happy to bring heavy violence upon my person if I stepped out of line. With a nod and a swift chant in script, the door thudded and slid below the floor to reveal the vault of tears. As we stepped from the plush carpet and back onto stone, the thuds of our boots resounded through the mostly empty chamber and melded with the subtle wine that permeated the room. White stone faded to gray as the slabs led to the center of the room where the object of our heist lay situated on top of a small rocky obelisk that rose from the earth itself to cradle the gemstone at the zenith. Lachmurl's heart was huge for a gem. It was roughly circular, shaped like an egg about the size of my head, and weighed at least twenty-five pounds. It was smooth around the center with precise lines cut along the edge which refracted light in the geometric patterns as we approached. Raven tugged on my hand which stopped me in place. 
I turned back, confused. What? I don't want to be here. It hurts. I realized then that I hadn't heard the insidious infrasound that the gem emitted since the aspect had lent me its chill. Raven didn't have such luxury and was feeling the full impact of the oppressive weight of the weeping god. I pulled her close and held her hand tighter. Feel that. Just focus on the tactile feeling of my hand and tune out everything else. She nodded, unsteady, and wound her fingers through mine before gripping my hand with both of hers. I let her have the hand while I focused on my surroundings to do what we'd come here for. The room was large, full of mostly unused space, especially around the obelisk itself. A couple dozen pews were arranged around the room in a circle for when church was in service, but beside that, the ground floor was mostly barren. Getting in from the ground floor wouldn't be an option. There was too much open space and nowhere to hide or run to if I fucked up. Above was my best bet. The ceiling was high overhead, at least twenty feet, which would hurt like hell if I fell, but there wasn't anything I could do about it. Arched support beams just below the ceiling stretched across the entirety of the room. A few more jutted out and crisscrossed here and there, but were for decoration rather than holding the weight of the building. All right, that'll be their downfall. It'll be cramped, but like I assumed, those beams are going to be my best bet. The stone beams were high enough and the light low enough that unless anyone looked directly at us, we could potentially hide for a while and scout out the area. There were also a few stained glass windows that were close enough to the beams that I could leap and grab onto. Cut through the glass and jumped to one of the beams. It'll be a broken leg if I miss, but at that point I'm pretty much dead anyway. All right, we'll scout more when we come back, but there aren't any guards in the vault itself. So I've got my entrance. That's what we came here for. Mika's team will have info on who comes and goes and at what hours to give us our window. Let's get out of here. I let go of Raven's hand and approached the obelisk before sinking to my knee and bowing my head. Let the guards at the door see I'm just a worshipper of Lackmoral and get them off my case. I rose, and the two of us left. Raven practically clung to me as we left the vault but regained some of her composure the further we got from the heart. When we exited the cathedral, she let go of me and stood on her own. Thanks, she muttered, her cheeks red. Yeah, don't get used to it, though. What, the kind and endearing side of you? Being a decent person for more than a few minutes at a time? How awful would that be? She started snickering to herself, letting her blushed cheeks fade away as we meandered down the path back to Hightown. I could be kind for more than a few minutes, I protested. Just not to me? Raven asked, tilting her head toward me. I don't like you that much, I said teasing her with a smile. She laughed, picking up her pace as she stepped over a loose rock and nearly lost her balance. Her legs wobbled a bit, but she recovered and turned around while walking backwards down the steps, a devious smile lifting to her lips. You say you don't like me now, but that wasn't the case last night. The hell are you talking about? You move in your sleep? You held me against your chest for most of the night. Guess you unconsciously wanted to be closer to me, she said her voice dripping saccharine. Bullshit, I shouted, my face growing hot. She just kept up her smile and turned back around as we reached the last step. Guess you'll never know. I sighed as a dull pain radiated from behind my eyes and my mouth went dry. Her flippant attitude irked me to no end, but I didn't think she was the kind of person to outright lie. I could make you tell me, you know. How's that? By force? You gonna take your knife to my skin to spill my blood and secrets? She asked, her voice lifting ever so subtly. Her tone was light, but there was a dark undertone to it when she spoke. I ignored the tone and focused on the question as we passed out of the gate and back onto the main street of Hightown. I was quiet for a few seconds as we passed a crowd of wealthy dwarven nobles on a shopping spree. The dwarven butler was breaking his back to carry about a hundred pounds of parcels behind the group. When they were well out of earshot and the street was mostly clear again, I spoke. Through our bond, I could order you to tell the truth. Raven paused as her teasing eyes dropped. Didn't think of that, did you? She shook her head slightly and smiled again, drawing closer to me. There's no need for that, master. I'm yours to do with as you please. Watch the M word. Raven chuckled, her crimson eyes sparking a fire as she covered her mouth to keep from laughing. Then don't threaten me with commands unless you actually intend to follow through with them. 
I snorted. We both knew I wouldn't ever make good on my threat. Fair point. By the time we reached the low road, I was dying for an ale, and I still had to plot the heist before we went later that night. It was far too early for the bar to be open, but Orin told us we had access any time. I unfurled one of the earth scrolls he'd given us, and with a flash of sandy brown light, the script circle flared to life and disintegrated in my palms as it activated, and my slight monobar took a hit. The door opened as if on hydraulics and slid seamlessly into the wall, and we walked in. The bar was desolate. The stone tables were clean and the chairs were empty. No one there. Tell wasn't behind the bar, and she couldn't stop me from slinking behind it and grabbing two bottles of beer. Raven sat down at a table in the center of the room. I handed her one of the bottles and pulled out the chair opposite her. I popped the top and drained half of it before leaning back with a satisfied sigh. All right, I said, pulling out our bag of supplies for the heist. There is a map of the cathedral in the bag. Let's compare it to what we just witnessed. If we had a map the whole time, why do we need to go up and see the place for ourselves? I opened the bag and pulled out the thick rolled canvas. With a flick of my wrist, it unfurled, and I used our beer bottles to weigh down the sides. Never rely on what someone or something says. Always verify for yourself. This map could be outdated, and if we based everything solely on what we thought we knew, we'd be screwed when we got there and found things different. It's the same principle I'm taking with the plan. There's no sense concocting a complex plan because it will all go to shit the moment a complication arises. Raven stood and bent over the table and looked the blueprints over. It was simple, drawn by hand, but by an expert's hand, and it matched what I remembered from the Iron Cathedral to a T. It looks the same to me, she said, tracing her finger along the rough fabric as she stared at the entrance until she got to the Vault of Tears. And why do you think there's going to be a complication? Because Magnus has already sent men after the heart before, professional thieves that were probably incredibly skilled in their fields. They all failed, which tells me there is something none of them considered, the same thing I'm not considering, that got them killed. Any idea what it could be? Could be any number of things, but I'm betting a trap, something the thieves couldn't see, and they tripped in an accident. She nodded, sitting back down. Makes sense, but what do we do about it? Nothing we can do but have each other's backs. A lot is riding on this. Can I trust you? With your life. That's exactly what I'm doing. You've got skill, and you've maintained your composure well so far. But when our backs are to the wall and all hope is lost, I need to know you're in my corner. She nodded, holding my gaze as she dipped her head. I am yours. An uncomfortable weight settled in my chest, but faded as she broke eye contact and started pulling out the items in the bag and cataloging them once more. There isn't anything we need that we don't already have, she said as the table filled with our gear. I'm assuming we're going in from above? Of course, it offers the best avenue for infiltration. So we have the gear, the map, and a semblance of a plan. What are we waiting for? The others. We need to go over the plan with them. I don't know about the others, but I've trusted Mika with my life before. I know I can count on him. Raven rubbed at her chin, puffing as she leaned her elbows on the table. Well, he needs to hurry the hell up. Antsy? A little? I don't like sitting still. My bones start to ache if I don't move around every now and again. Footsteps sounded on the stone outside, and I turned to my chair as Orin walked through the door, followed by Tell. Ah, good, you're here already, he said tersely. Good to see you again, Durin, Tell said, smiling as her wings appeared in a shimmer of rainbow light and she flew over the bar top. And I see you've helped yourself to some of my stock, have you? I'll pay for it, I replied, taking a swig and trying not to laugh. She shrugged, a short laugh building in her throat before she looked at Orin and clammed up. I'll be in the other room if you need me. Mika and the hired muscle swept in behind Orin, geared up with hungry glints in their eyes. As soon as everyone settled around the table, I looked at each one in turn and smiled. All right, let's go over the plan. This has been Hive Queen, Trinity of the Hive Book Two, written by Grayson Sinclair, narrated by Neil Helligers, a member of SAG-AFTRA, copyright 2020 by Starlit Publishing, production copyright 2020 by Starlit Publishing.